Section 1 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katja Buju. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul, The Last Pearl. We are in a rich, happy house, where the master, the servants, the friends of the family are full of joy and felicity. For on this day a son and heir has been born, and mother and child are doing well. The lamp in the bedchamber had been partly shaded, and the windows were covered with heavy curtains of some costly silken material. The carpet was thick and soft, like a covering of moss. Everything invited to slumber. Everything had a charming look of repose. And so the nurse had discovered, for she slept, and well she might sleep, while everything around her told of happiness and blessing. The guardian angel of the house leaned against the head of the bed, while over the child was spread, as it were, a net of shining stars, and each star was a pearl of happiness. All the good stars of life had brought their gifts to the newly born. Here sparkled health, wealth, fortune, and love. In short, there seemed to be everything for which man could wish on earth. Everything has been bestowed here, said the guardian angel. No, not everything, said a voice near him, the voice of the good angel of the child. One fairy has not yet brought her gift, but she will. Even if years should elapse, she will bring her gift. It is the last spell that is wanting. Wanting, cried the guardian angel. Nothing must be wanting here, and if it is so, let us fetch it, let us seek the powerful fairy, let us go to her. She will come, she will come some day and sort. Her pearl must not be missing, it must be there, that the crown, when worn, may be complete. Where is she to be found? Where does she dwell? said the guardian angel. Tell me. And I will procure the pearl. Will you do that? replied the good angel of the child. Then I will lead you to her directly, wherever she may be. She has no abiding place. She rules in the palace of the emperor. Sometimes she enters the peasant's humble cot. She passes no one without leaving a trace of her presence. She brings her gift with her, whether it is a world or a bauble. To this child she must come. You think that to wait for this time would be long and useless. Well then, let us go for this bell, the only one lacking amidst all this wealth. Then hand in hand they floated away to the spot where the fairy was now lingering. It was in a large house with dark windows and empty rooms in which a peculiar stillness reigned. A whole row of windows stood open so that the rude wind could enter at its pleasure, and the long white curtains waved to and fro in the current of air. In the centre of one of the rooms stood an open coffin, in which lay the body of a woman, still in the bloom of youth, and very beautiful. Fresh roses were scattered over her. The delicate folded hands and a noble face glorified in death by the solemn, earnest look which spoke of an entrance into a better world were alone visible. Around the coffin stood the husband and children, a whole troop, the youngest in the father's arms. They were come to take a last farewell look of their mother. The husband kissed her hand, which now lay like a withered leaf, but which a short time before had been diligently employed in deeds of love for them all. Tears of sorrow rolled down their cheeks, and fell in heavy drops on the floor, but not a word was spoken. The silence which reigned here 
expressed a world of grief. With silent steps, still sobbing, they left the room. A burning light remained in the room, and a long red wick rose far above the flame which fluttered in the draught of air. Strange men came in and placed the lid of the coffin over the dead, and drove the nails firmly in, while the blows of the hammer resounded through the house and echoed in the hearts that were bleeding. "'Whither art thou leading me?' asked the guardian angel. "'Here dwells no fairy whose pearl could be counted among the best gifts of life.' "'Yes, she is here, here in this sacred hour,' replied the angel, pointing to a corner of the room. "'And there, where in her lifetime the mother had taken her seat amidst flowers and pictures, in that spot where she, like the blessed fairy of the house, had welcomed husband, children, and friends, and, like a sunbeam, had spread joy and cheerfulness around her, the centre and heart of them all, there, in that very spot, sat a strange woman, clothed in long, flowing garments, and occupying the place of the dead wife and mother. It was the fairy, and her name was sorrow. A hot tear rolled into her lap, and formed itself into a pearl, glowing with all the colours of the rainbow. The angel seized it. The pearl glittered like a star with sevenfold radiance. The pearl of sorrow, the last, which must not be wanting, increases the lustre and explains the meaning of all the other pearls. Do you see the shimmer of the rainbow, which unites earth to heaven? So has there been a bridge built between this world and the next. Through the night of the grave we gaze upwards beyond the stars to the end of all things. Then we glance at the pearl of sorrow, in which are concealed the wings which shall carry us away to eternal happiness. End of the Last Pearl Recording by Katya Budyu. Section 2 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859 by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. P. Paul Two Maidens by Hans Christian Andersen, 1854 have you ever seen a maiden? I mean what our pavers call a maiden, a thing with which they ram down the paving stones in the roads. A maiden of this kind is made altogether of wood, broad below and girt round with iron rings. At the top she is narrow and has a stick passed across through her waist, and this stick forms the arms of the maiden. In the shed stood two maidens of this kind. They had their place among shovels, hand carts, wheelbarrows, and measuring tapes, and to all this company the news had come that the maidens were no longer to be called maidens, but hand rammers, which word was the newest and the only correct designation among the pavers for the thing we all know from the old times by the name of the maiden. Now there are among us human creatures, certain individuals who are known as emancipated women, as, for instance, principals of institutions, dancers who stand professionally on one leg, milliners, and sick nurses. And with this class of emancipated women, the two maidens in the shed associated themselves. They were maidens among the paver folk, and determined not to give up this honorable appellation, and let themselves be miscalled rammers. Maiden is a human name, 
but hanrammer is a thing and we won't be called things that's insulting us my lover will be ready to give up his engagement said the youngest who is betrothed to a paver's hammer and the hammer is the thing which drives great piles into the earth like a machine and therefore does on a large scale what ten maidens effect in a similar way he wants to marry me as a maiden but whether he would have me were i a hand rammer is a question so i won't have my name changed and i said the elder one would rather have both my arms broken off but the wheelbarrow was of a different opinion and the wheelbarrow was looked upon as of some consequence for he considered himself a quarter of a coach because he went about upon one wheel i must submit to your notice he said that the name maiden is common enough and not nearly so refined as hanrammer or stamper which latter has also been proposed and through which you would be introduced into the category of seals and only think of the great stamp of state which impresses the royal seal that gives effect to the laws no in your case i would surrender my maiden name no certainly not exclaimed the elder i am too old for that i presume you have never heard of what is called european necessity observed the honest measuring tape one must be able to adapt one's self to time and circumstances and if there is a law that the maiden is to be called hand rammer why she must be called hand rammer and no pouting will avail for everything has its measure no if there must be a change said the younger i should prefer to be called missy for that reminds one a little of maidens but i would rather be chopped to bits said the elder at last they all went to work the maidens rode that is they were put in a wheelbarrow and that was a distinction but still they were called hand rammers may they said as they were bumped upon the pavement may and they were very nearly pronouncing the whole word maiden but they broke off short and swallowed the last syllable for after mature deliberation they considered it beneath their dignity to protest but they always called each other maiden and praised the good old days in which everything had been called by its right name and those who were maidens were called maidens and they remained as they were for the hammer really broke off his engagement with the younger one for nothing would suit him but he must have a maiden for his bride end of two maidens recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section three of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume four this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hans Christian Andersen. Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by h p paul in the uttermost parts of the sea by hans christian andersen eighteen fifty five some years ago large ships were sent towards the north pole to explore the distant coasts and to try how far men could penetrate into those unknown regions for more than a year one of these ships had been pushing its way northward amid snow and ice and the sailors had endured many hardships till at length winter set in and the sun entirely disappeared for many weeks there would be constant night all around as far as the eye could reach nothing could be seen but fields of ice in which the ship remained stuck fast the snow lay piled up in great heaps and one of these the sailors made huts in the form of beehives some of them as large and spacious as one of the hun's graves and others only containing room enough to hold three or four men it was not quite dark the northern lights shot forth red and blue flames like continuous fireworks and the snow glittered and reflected back the light so that the night here was one long twilight 
when the moon was brightest the natives came in crowds to see the sailors they had a very singular appearance in their rough hairy dresses of fur and riding in sledges over the ice they brought with them furs and skins in great abundance so that the snow houses were soon provided with warm carpets and the furs also served for the sailors to wrap themselves in when they slept under the roofs of snow while outside it was freezing with a cold far more severe than in the winter with us in our country it was still autumn though late in the season and they thought of that in their distant exile and often pictured to themselves the yellow leaves on the trees at home their watches pointed to the hours of evening and time to go to sleep although in these regions it was now always night in one of the huts two of the men laid themselves down to rest the younger of these men had brought with him from home his best his dearest treasure a bible which his grandmother had given him on his departure every night the sacred volume rested under his head and he had known from his childhood what was written in it every day he read in the book and while stretched on his cold couch the holy words he had learnt would come into his mind if i take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea even there thou art with me and thy right hand shall uphold me and under the influence of that faith which these holy words inspired sleep came upon him and dreams which are the manifestations of god to the spirit the soul lives and acts while the body is at rest he felt this life in him and it was as if he heard the sound of dear well-known melodies as if the breezes of summer floated round him and over his couch shone a ray of brightness as if it were shining through the covering of his snow roof he lifted his head and saw that the bright gleaming was not the reflection of the glittering snow but the dazzling brightness of the pinions of a mighty angel into whose beaming face he was gazing as from the cup of a lily the angel rose from amidst the leaves of the bible and stretching out his arm the walls of the hut sank down as though they had been formed of a light airy veil of mist and the green hills and meadows of home with its ruddy woods lay spread around him in the quiet sunshine of a lovely autumn day the nest of the stork was empty but ripe fruit still hung on the wild apple tree although the leaves had fallen the red hips gleamed on the hedges and the starling which hung in the green cage outside the window of the peasant's hut which was his home whistled the tune which she had taught him his grandmother hung green bird's food round the cage as he her grandson had been accustomed to the daughter of the village blacksmith who was young and fair stood at the well drawing water she nodded to the grandmother and the old woman nodded to her and pointed to a letter which had come from a long way off that very morning the letter had arrived from the cold regions of the north there where the absent one was sweetly sleeping under the protecting hand of god they laughed and wept over the letter and he far away amid ice and snow under the shadow of the angel's wings wept and smiled with them in spirit for he saw and heard it all in his dream from the letter they read aloud the words of holy writ in the uttermost parts of the sea thy right hand shall uphold me and as the angel spread his wings like a veil over the sleeper there was the sound of beautiful music and a hymn then the vision fled it was dark again in the snow hut but the bible still rested beneath his head and faith and hope dwelt in his heart god was with him and he carried home in his heart even in the uttermost parts of the sea end of in the uttermost parts of the sea recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 4 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Anastasia Saloha Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 4 1854 to 1859 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Powell. The Money Box. 
in a nursery where a number of toys were scattered about a money box stood on the top of a very high wardrobe it was made of clay in the shape of a pig and had been bought of the porter in the back of the pig was a slit and the slit had been enlarged with a knife so that doors or crown pieces might slip through and indeed there were two in the box besides a number of pens the money pig was stuffed so full that it could no longer rattle which is the highest state of perfection in which a money pig can attain there he stood upon the cupboard high and lofty looking down upon everything else in the room he knew very well that he had enough inside him to buy up all the other toys and this gave him a very good opinion of his own value the rest thought of this fact also although they did not express it for there were so many other things to talk about a large doll still handsome though rather old for her neck had been mended lay inside one of the drawers which was partly open she called out to the others let us have a game of being men and women that is something worth playing at upon this there was a great uproar even the engravings which hung in frames on the wall turned round in the excitement and showed that they had a wrong side to them although they had not the least intention to expose themselves in this way or to object to the game it was late at night but as the moon shone through the windows they had light at a cheap rate and as the game was now to begin all were invited to take part in it even the children's wagon which certainly belonged to the coarser playthings each has its own value said the wagon we cannot all be noblemen there must be some to do the work the money pig was the only one who received a written invitation he stood so high that they were afraid he would not accept a verbal message but in his reply he said if he had to take a part he must enjoy the sport from his own home they were to arrange for him to do so and so they did the little toy theatre was therefore put up in such a way that the money pig could look directly into it some wanted to begin with a comedy and afterwards to have a tea party and a discussion for mental improvement but they commenced with the latter first the rocking horse spoke of training and races the wagon of railways and steam power for these subjects belonged to each of their professions and it was right they should talk of them the clock talked politics tick tick he professed to know what was the time of day but there was a whisper that he did not go correctly the bamboo cane stood by looking stiff and proud he was vain of his brass pharaoh and silver top and on the sofa lay two worked cushions pretty but stupid when the play at the little theatre began the rest sat and looked on they were requested to applaud and stamp or crack when they felt gratified with what they saw but the riding whip said he never cracked for old people only for the young who were not yet married i crack for everybody said the cracker yes and a fine noise you make thought the audience as the play went on it was not worth much but it was very well played and all the characters turned their painted sides to the audience for they were only made to be seen on one side the acting was wonderful excepting that sometimes they came out beyond the lamps because the wires were a little too long the doll whose neck had been darned was so excited that the place in her neck burst and the money pig declared he must do something for one of the players as they had all pleased him so much so he made up his mind to remember one of them in his will as the one to be buried with him in the family vault whenever that event should happen they all enjoyed the comedy so much that they gave up all sorts of the tea party and only carried out the idea of intellectual amusement 
which they called playing at men and women and there was nothing wrong about it for it was only play all the while each one thought most of himself or of what the money pig could be thinking his thoughts were on as he supposed a very distant time of making his will and of his burial and of when it might all come to pass certainly sooner than he expected for all at once down he came from the top of the press fell on the ground and was broken to pieces then the pennies hopped and danced about in the most amusing manner the little ones twirled round like tops and the large ones rolled away as far as they could especially the one great silver crown piece who had often to go out into the world and now he had his wish as well as all the rest of the money the pieces of the money pig were thrown into the dustbin and the next day there stood a new money pig on the cupboard but it had not a farthing in its inside yet and therefore like the old one it could not rattle this was the beginning with him and we will make it the end of our story end of the money box Section 5 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. A Leaf from Heaven High up in the clear, pure air flew an angel with a flower plucked from the garden of heaven. As he was kissing the flower, a very little leaf fell from it and sunk down into the soft earth of the middle of a wood. It immediately took root, sprouted, and sent out shoots among the other plants. What a ridiculous little shoot! said one. No one will recognize it, not even the thistle nor the stinging nettle. It must be a kind of garden plant, said another, and so they snared and despised the plant as a thing from a garden. Where are you coming? said the tall thistles, whose leaves were all armed with thorns. It is stupid nonsense to allow yourself to shoot out in this way. We are not here to support you. Winter came and the plant was covered with snow, but the snow glittered over it, as if it had sunshine beneath as well as above. When spring came, the plant appeared in full bloom, a more beautiful object than any other plant in the forest. And now the professor of botany presented himself, one who could explain his knowledge in black and white. He examined and tested the plant, but it did not belong to his system of botany, nor could he possibly find out to what class it did belong. "'It must be some degenerate species,' said he. "'I do not know it, and it is not mentioned in any system.' "'Not known in any system,' repeated the thistles and the nettles. The large trees which grew round it saw the plant and heard the remarks, but they said not a word, either good or bad which is the wisest plan for those who are ignorant. There passed through the forest a poor innocent girl. Her heart was pure, and her understanding increased by her faith. Her chief inheritance had been an old Bible, which she read and valued. From its pages she heard the voice of God speaking to her, and telling her to remember what was said of Joseph's brethren when persons wished to injure her. They imagined evil in their hearts, but God turned it to good. If we suffer wrongfully, if we are misunderstood or despised, we must think of him who was pure and holy and who prayed for those who nailed him to the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The girl stood before the wonderful plant, for the green leaves exhaled a sweet and refreshing fragrance, and the flowers glittered and sparkled in the sunshine, like coloured flames, and the harmony of sweet sounds lingered round them, as if each concealed within itself a deep fount of melody, 
which thousands of years could not exhaust. With pious gratitude, the girl looked upon this glorious work of God, and bent down over one of the branches, that she might examine the flower and inhale the sweet perfume. Then a light broke in her mind, and her heart expanded. Gladly would she have plucked a flower, but she could not overcome her reluctance to break one off. She knew it would so soon fade. So she took only a single green leaf, carried it home, and laid it in her Bible, where it remained evergreen, fresh, and unfading. Between the pages of the Bible it still lay when, a few weeks afterwards, that Bible was laid under the young girl's head in her coffin. A holy calm rested over her face, as if the earthly remains bore the impress of the truth that she now stood in the presence of God. In the forest the wonderful plant still continued to bloom till it grew and became almost a tree, and all the birds of passage bowed themselves before it. "'That plant is a foreigner, no doubt,' said the thistles and the burdocks. "'We can never conduct ourselves like that in this country.' and the black forest nails actually spat at the flower. Then came the swineherd. He was collecting thistles and shrubs to burn them for the ashes. He pulled up the wonderful plant, root and all, and placed it in his bundle. "'This will be as useful as any,' he said. So the plant was carried away. Not long after, the king of the country suffered from the deepest melancholy. He was diligent and industrious, but employment did him no good. They read deep and learned books to him, and then the lightest and most trifling that could be found, but all to no purpose. Then they applied for advice to one of the wise men of the world, and he sent them a message to say that there was one remedy which would relieve and cure him, and that it was a plant of heavenly origin which grew in the forest in the king's own dominions. The messenger described the flower so that its appearance could not be mistaken. Then said the swineherd, I am afraid I carried this plant away from the forest in my bundle, and it has been burnt to ashes long ago. But I did not know any better. You did not know any better. Ignorance upon ignorance, indeed. The poor swineherd took these words to heart, for they were addressed to him. He knew not that there were others who were equally ignorant. Not even a leaf of the plant could be found. There was one, but it lay in the coffin of the dead. No one knew anything about it. Then the king, in his melancholy, wandered out to the spot in the wood. "'Here is where the plant stood,' he said. "'It is a sacred place.' Then he ordered that the place should be surrounded with a golden railing and a sentry stationed near it. The botanical professor wrote a long treatise about the heavenly plant, and for this he was loaded with gold which improved the position of himself and his family. And this part is really the most pleasant part of the story, for the plant had disappeared, and the king remained as melancholy and sad as ever, but the sentry said he had always been so. End of A Leaf from Heaven Section 6 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Jack the Dullard an old story told anew. Far in the interior of the country lay an old baronial hall, and in it lived an old proprietor, who had two sons, which two young men thought themselves too clever by half. They wanted to go out and woo the king's daughter, for the maiden in question had publicly announced that she would choose for her husband that youth who could arrange his words best. So these two geniuses prepared themselves a full week for the wooing. This was the longest time that could be granted them. But it was enough, for they had had much preparatory information, and everybody knows how useful that is. One of them knew the whole Latin dictionary by heart, and three whole years of the daily paper of the little town into the bargain, and so well indeed that he could repeat it all either backwards or forwards, just as he chose. The other was deeply read in the corporation laws, 
and knew by heart what every corporation ought to know. And accordingly he thought he could talk of affairs of state, and put his spoke in the wheel in the council. And he knew one thing more. He could embroider suspenders with roses and other flowers, and with arabesques, for he was a tasty, light-fingered fellow. I shall win the princess, so cried both of them. Therefore their old papa gave to each of them a handsome horse. The youth who knew the dictionary and newspaper by heart had a black horse, and he who knew all about the corporation laws received a milk-white steed. Then they rubbed the corners of their mouths with fish oil, so that they might become very smooth and glib. All the servants stood below in the courtyard and looked on while they mounted their horses, and just by chance the third son came up, for the proprietor had really three sons, though nobody counted the third with his brothers, because he was not so learned as they, and indeed he was generally known as Jack the Dullard. Hello, said Jack the Dullard, where are you going? I declare you have put on your Sunday clothes. We're going to the king's court, as suitors to the king's daughter. Don't you know the announcement that has been made all through the country? And they told him all about it. My word, I'll be in it too, cried Jack the Dullard and his two brothers burst out laughing at him and rode away. "'Father, dear,' said Jack, "'I must have a horse, too. I do feel so desperately inclined to marry. If she accepts me, she accepts me. And if she won't have me, I'll have her. But she shall be mine.' "'Don't talk nonsense,' replied the old gentleman. "'You shall have no horse for me. You don't know how to speak. You can't arrange your words. Your brothers are very different fellows from you.' "'Well,' quoth Jack the dullard, if I can't have a horse, I'll take the billy goat, who belongs to me, and he can carry me very well. And so said, so done. He mounted the billy goat, pressed his heels into its sides, and galloped down the high street like a hurricane. hi oop That was a ride! Here I come! shouted Jack the dullard, and he sang till his voice echoed far and wide. But his brothers rode slowly on in advance of him. They spoke not a word, for they were thinking about the fine extempore speeches they would have to bring out and these had to be cleverly prepared beforehand. Hello, shouted Jack the dullard. Here am I. Look what I have found in the high road. And he showed them what it was, and it was a dead crow. Dullard, exclaimed the brothers, what are you going to do with that? With the crow? Why, I'm going to give it to the princess. Yes, do so, said they, and they laughed and rode on. Hello, here I am again. Just see what I have found now. You don't find that on the high road every day. And the brothers turned round to see what he could have found now. Dullard, they cried, that is only an old wooden shoe, and the upper part is missing into the bargain. Are you going to give that also to the princess? Most certainly I shall, replied Jack the Dullard. And again the brothers laughed and rode on, and thus they got far in advance of him. But, hello, hop bra, and there was Jack the Dullard again. It is getting better and better, he cried. Hurrah, it is quite famous. Why, what have you found this time, inquired the brothers. Oh, said Jack the dullard, I can hardly tell you how glad the princess will be. Bah, said the brothers, that is nothing but clay out of the ditch. Yes, certainly it is, said Jack the dullard, and clay of the finest sort. See, it is so wet it runs through one's fingers, and he filled his pocket with the clay. But his brothers galloped on till the sparks flew, and consequently they arrived a full hour earlier at the town gate than could Jack. Now at the gate each suitor was provided with a number, and all were placed in rows immediately on their arrival, six in each row, and so closely packed together that they could not move their arms, and that was a prudent arrangement, for they would certainly have come to blows had they been able merely because one of them stood before the other. All the inhabitants of the country round about stood in great crowds around the castle, almost under the very windows, to see the princess receive the suitors, and as each stepped into the hall his power of speech seemed to desert him, like the light of a candle that is blown out. Then the princess would say, He is of no use, away with him out of the hall. At last turn came for that brother who knew the dictionary by heart, but he did not know it now. He had absolutely forgotten it altogether, and the board seemed to re-echo with his footsteps, and the ceiling of the hall was made of looking-glass, so that he saw himself standing on his head. And at the window stood three clerks, and a head clerk, and every one of them was writing down every single word that was uttered, so that it might be printed in the newspapers, and sold for a penny at the street corners. It was a terrible ordeal, and they had, moreover, made such a fire in the stove that the room seemed quite red-hot. 
"'It is dreadfully hot here,' observed the first brother. "'Yes,' replied the princess. "'My father is going to roast young pullets today.' "'Bah!' There he stood, like a ba lamb. He had not been prepared for speech of this kind, and had not a word to say, though he intended to say something witty. "'Bah! He is of no use,' said the princess. "'Away with him!' and he was obliged to go accordingly. And now the second brother came in. "'It is terribly warm here,' he observed. "'Yes, we're roasting pullets today,' replied the princess. "'What, what were you, were you pleased to a?" stammered he. And all the clerks wrote down, "'Pleased to a." "'He is of no use,' said the princess. "'Away with him!' Now came the turn of Jack the Dullard. He rode into the hall on his goat. "'Well, it's most abominably hot here.' "'Yes, because I'm roasting young pullets,' replied the princess. "'Ah, that's lucky,' exclaimed Jack the Dullard, "'for I suppose you'll let me roast my crow at the same time?' "'With the greatest pleasure,' said the princess. "'But have you anything you can roast it in? "'For I have neither pot nor pan.' "'Certainly I have,' said Jack. "'Here's a cooking utensil with a tin handle.' And he brought out the old wooden shoe and put the crow into it. "'Well, that is a famous dish,' said the princess. "'But what shall we do for sauce?' "'Oh, I have that in my pocket,' said Jack. "'I have so much of it that I can afford to throw some away.' And he poured some of the clay out of his pocket. "'I like that,' said the princess. "'You can give an answer, and you have something to say for yourself, and so you shall be my husband. But are you aware that every word we speak is being taken down and will be published in the paper tomorrow? Look yonder, and you will see in every window three clerks and a head clerk, and the old head clerk is the worst of all, for he can't understand anything.' But she only said this to frighten Jack the Dullard, and the clerks gave a great crow of delight, and each one spurted a blot out of his pen on to the floor. "'Oh, those are the gentlemen, are they?' said Jack. "'Then I will give the best I have to the head clerk.' And he turned out his pockets and flung the wet clay full in the head clerk's face. "'That was very cleverly done,' observed the princess. "'I could not have done that, but I shall learn in time.' And accordingly Jack the Dullard was made a king, and received a crown and a wife and sat upon a throne. And this report we have wet from the press of the head clerk and the corporation of printers, but they are not to be depended upon in the least. End of Jack the Dullard, an old story told anew. Section 7 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Ib and Little Christina. In the forest that extends from the banks of the Goodnow in North Jutland, a long way into the country, and not far from the clear stream, rises a great ridge of land, which stretches through the wood like a wall. Westward of this ridge, and not far from the river, stands a farmhouse, surrounded by such poor people that the sandy soil shows itself between scanty ears of rye and wheat which grow in it. Some years have passed since the people who lived here cultivated these fields. They kept three sheep, a pig, and two oxen. In fact, they maintained themselves very well. They had quite enough to live upon, as people generally have, who are content with their lot. They could even have afforded to keep two horses, but it was a saying among the farmers in those parts, the horse eats himself up. That is to say, he eats as much as he earns. Yepi Jans cultivated his fields in summer, and in the winter he made wooden shoes. He also had an assistant, a lad who understood as well as he himself did how to make wooden shoes strong but light and in the fashion. They carved shoes and spoons, which paid well, therefore no one could justly call Yepi Jans and his family poor people. Little Ib, a boy of seven years old and the only child, would sit by, watching the workman or cutting a stick, and sometimes his finger instead of a stick. But one day Ib succeeded so well in his carving that he made two pieces of wood really look like two little wooden shoes, and he determined to give them as a present to little Christina. And who was little Christina? She was the boatman's daughter, graceful and delicate as the child of a gentleman. Had she been dressed differently, no one would have believed that she lived in a hut on the neighboring heath with her father. He was a widower, and earned his living by carrying firewood in his large boat from the forest to the eel-pond and the eel-weir, on the estate of Silkborg, and sometimes even to the distant town of Randers. There was no one under whose care he could leave little Christina, so she was almost always with him in his boat, or playing in the wood among the blossoming heath, or picking the ripe wild berries. 
Sometimes, when her father had to go as far as the town, he would take little Christina, who was a year younger than Ibbe, across the heath to the cottage of Yep Jans and leave her there. Ibbe and Christina agreed together in everything. They divided their bread and berries when they were hungry, they were partners in digging their little gardens, they ran and crept and played about everywhere. Once they wandered a long way into the forest, and even ventured together to climb the high ridge. Another time they found a few snipes' eggs in the wood, which was a great event. Ibbe had never been on the heath where Christina's father lived, nor on the river, but at last came an opportunity. Christina's father invited him to go for a sail in his boat, and the evening before he accompanied the boatman across the heath to his house. The next morning the two children were placed on top of a high pile of firewood in the boat, and sat eating bread and wild strawberries while Christina's father and his man drove the boat forward with poles. They floated on swiftly, for the tide was in their favor, passing over lakes formed by the stream in its course. Sometimes they seemed quite enclosed by reeds and water plants, yet there was always room for them to pass out, although the old trees overhung the water and the old oaks stretched out their bare branches, as if they had turned up their sleeves and wished to show their knotty naked arms. Old alder trees, whose roots were loosened from the banks, clung with their fibers to the bottom of the stream, and the tops of the branches above the water looked like little woody islands. The water lilies waved themselves to and fro on the river. Everything made the excursion beautiful, and at last they came to the great eel weir, where the water rushed through the floodgates, and the children thought this a beautiful sight. In those days there was no factory nor any town-house, nothing but the great farm with its scanty bearing fields, in which could be seen a few herd of cattle and one or two farm laborers. The rushing of the water through the sluices, the scream of the wild ducks, were almost the only signs of active life at Silkborg. After the firewood had been unloaded, Christina's father bought a whole bundle of eels and a sucking pig, which were all placed in a basket in the stern of the boat. Then they returned again up the stream, and as the wind was favorable, two sails were hoisted, which carried the boat on as well as if two horses had been harnessed to it. As they sailed on, they came by chance to the place where the boatman's assistant lived, at a little distance from the bank of the river. The boat was moored, and the two men, after desiring the children to sit still, both went on shore. They obeyed this order for a short time, and then forgot it altogether. First they peeped into the basket containing the eels and the sucking pig. Then they must needs pull out the pig, and take it in their hands, and feel it, and touch it. And as they both wanted to hold it at the same time, the consequence was that they let it fall into the water, and the pig sailed away with the stream. Here was a terrible disaster. Ibe jumped ashore and ran a little distance from the boat. "'Oh, take me with you!' cried Christina, and she sprang after him. In a few minutes they found themselves deep in a thicket and could no longer see the boat or the shore. They ran on a little farther, and then Christina fell down and began to cry. Ibe helped her up and said, "'Never mind. Follow me. Yonder is the house.' But the house was not yonder and they wandered still farther over the dry rustling leaves of the last year and, and treading on fallen branches that crackled under their little feet then they heard a loud piercing cry and they stood still to listen presently the scream of an eagle sounded through the wood it was ugly and it frightened the children but before them in the thickest part of the forest grew the most beautiful blackberries in wonderful quantities they looked so inviting that the children could not help stopping and they remained there so long eating that their mouths and cheeks became quite black with juice presently they heard the frightful scream again and christina said we shall get into trouble about that pig oh never mind said ib we will go home to my father's house it is here in the wood so they went on, but the road led them out of the way. No house could be seen. It grew dark, and the children were afraid. The solemn stillness that reigned around them was now and then broken by the shrill cries of the great horned owl and the other birds that they knew nothing of. At last they both lost themselves in the thicket. Christina began to cry, and then Ibe cried too, and after weeping and lamenting for some time, they stretched themselves down on the dry leaves and fell asleep. The sun was high in the heavens when the two children woke. They felt cold, but not far from their resting place on a hill, the sun was shining through the trees. They thought if they went there they should be warm, and it fancied he should be able to see his father's house from such a high spot. But they were far away from home now, in quite another part of the forest. They clambered to the top of the rising ground, and found themselves on the edge of a declivity, which sloped down to a clear, transparent lake. Great quantities of fish could be seen through the clear water, sparkling in the sun's rays. They were quite surprised when they came so suddenly upon such an unexpected sight. Close to where they stood grew a hazel bush, covered with beautiful nets. They soon gathered some, cracked them, and ate the fine young kernels, which were only just ripe. But there was another surprise and fright in store for them. Out of the thicket stepped a tall old woman, her face quite brown, and her hair of a deep shining black. The whites of her eyes glittered like a moor's, on her back she carried a bundle, and in her hand a knotted stick. She was a gypsy. 
the children at first did not understand what she said she drew out of her pocket three large nuts in which she told them were hidden the most beautiful and lovely things in the world for they were wishing nuts Eve looked at her and as she spoke so kindly he took courage and asked her if she would give him the nuts and the old woman gave them to him and then gathered some more from the bushes for herself quite a pocketful Eve and christina looked at the wishing nuts with wide open eyes is there in this nut a carriage with a pair of horses asked Eve yes there is a golden carriage with two golden horses replied the woman then give me that nut said christina so ib gave it to her and the strange woman tied up the nut for her in the handkerchief ib held up another nut is there in this nut a pretty little neckerchief like the one christina has on her neck asked ib there are ten neckerchiefs in it she replied as well as beautiful dresses stockings and a hat and veil then i will have that one also said christina and it is a pretty one too and ib gave her the second nut the third was a little black thing you may keep that one said christina it is quite as pretty what is in it asked ib the best of all things for you replied the gypsy so ib held the nut very tight then the woman promised to lead the children down to the right path that they might find their way home and they went forward certainly in quite another direction than the one they meant to take therefore no one ought to speak against the woman and say that she wanted to steal the children in the wild wood path they met a forester who knew Eve, and by his help even christina reached home where they found every one had been very anxious about them they were pardoned and forgiven although they had both really done wrong and deserved to get in trouble first because they had let the sucking pig fall into the water and secondly because they had run away christina was taken back to her father's house on the heath and Eve remained in the farmhouse on the borders of the wood near the great land ridge the first thing Eve did that evening was to take out of his pocket the little black nut in which the best of all was said to be enclosed he laid it carefully between the door and the doorpost and then shut the door so the nut cracked directly but there was not much kernel to be seen it was what we should call hollow or worm-eaten and looked as though it had been filled with tobacco or rich black earth it is just what i expected exclaimed eb how should there be room in a little nut like this for the best thing of all christina will find her two nuts just the same there will be neither fine clothes or a golden carriage in them winter came and the new year and indeed many years passed away until Eve was old enough to be confirmed and therefore he went during a whole winter to the clergyman of the nearest village to be prepared one day about this time the boatman paid a visit to Eve's parents and told them that christina was going to service and that she had been remarkably fortunate in obtaining a good place with most respectable people only think he said she is going to the rich innkeepers at the hotel in herning many miles west from here she is to assist the landlady in housekeeping and if afterwards she behaves well and remains to be confirmed the people will treat her as their own daughter so Eve and christina took leave of each other people already called them the betrothed and at parting the girl showed Eve the two nuts which she had taken care of ever since the time they had lost themselves in the wood and she told him also that the little wooden shoes he once carved for her when he was a boy and gave her as a present had been carefully kept in a drawer ever since and so they parted after ib's confirmation he remained home with his mother for he had become a clever shoemaker and in the summer managed the farm for her quite alone his father had been dead some time and his mother kept no farm servants sometimes but very seldom he heard of christina through a postilion or eel seller who was passing but she was well off with the rich innkeeper and after being confirmed she wrote a letter to her father in which was a kind message to Eve and his mother in this letter she mentioned that her master and mistress had made her a present of a beautiful new dress and some nice underclothes this of course was pleasant news one day in the following spring there came a knock at the door of the house where ib's old mother lived and when they opened it lo and behold in stepped the boatman and christina she had come to pay them a visit and to spend the day a carriage had to come from herning hotel to the next village and she had taken the opportunity to see her friends once more she looked as elegant as a real lady and wore a pretty dress beautifully made on purpose for her there she stood in full dress while ib wore only his working clothes he could not utter a word he could only seize her hand and hold it fast in his own but he felt too happy and glad to open his lips christina however was quite at her ease she talked and talked and kissed him in the most friendly manner even afterwards when they were left alone and she asked did you know me again if he still stood holding her hand and said at last you are become quite a grand lady christina and i am only a rough working man but i have often thought of you and of old times then they wandered up the great ridge and looked across the stream to the heath where the little hills were covered with a flowering bloom Ib said nothing, but before the time came for them to part, it became quite clear to him that Christina must be his wife. Had they not even in childhood been called the betrothed? 
to him it seemed as if they were really engaged to each other although not a word had been spoken on the subject they had only a few more hours to remain together for christina was obliged to return that evening to the neighbouring village to be ready for the carriage which was to start the next morning early for herning even her father accompanied her to the village it was a fine moonlit evening and when they arrived Ibe stood holding christina's hand in his as if he could not let her go his eyes brightened and the words he uttered came with a hesitation from his lips but from the deepest recesses of his heart christina if you have not become too grand and if you can be contented to live in my mother's house as my wife we will be married some day but we can wait for a while oh, yes she replied let us wait a little longer Ibe. i can trust you for i believe that i do love you but let me think it over then he kissed her lips and so they parted on the way home Ib told the boatman that he and christina were as good as engaged to each other and the boatman found out that he had always expected it would be so and went home with Ib that evening and remained the night at the farmhouse but nothing further was said of the engagement during the next year two letters passed between Ib and christina they were signed faithful till death but at the end of that time one day the boatman came over to see Ib with a kind greeting from christina he had something else to say which made him hesitate in a strange manner at last it came out that christina who had grown a very pretty girl was more lucky than ever she was courted and admired by every one but her master's son who had been home on a visit was so much pleased with christina that he wished to marry her he had a very good situation in an office at copenhagen and as she had also taken a liking for him his parents were not unwilling to consent but christina in her heart often thought of Eve and knew how much he thought of her so she felt inclined to refuse this good fortune added the boatman at first Ib said not a word but he became as white as the wall and shook his head gently and then spoke christina must not refuse this good fortune then will you write a few words to her said the boatman Ib sat down to write but he could not get on at all the words were not what he wished to say so he tore up the page the following morning however a letter lay ready to be sent to christina and the following is what he wrote the letter written by you to your father i have read and see from it that you are prosperous in everything and that still better fortune is in store for you ask your own heart christina and think over carefully what awaits you if you take me for your husband for i possess very little in the world do not think of me or my position think only of your own welfare you are bound to be by no promises and if in your heart you have given me one i release you from it may every blessing and happiness be poured out upon you christina heaven will give me the heart's consolation ever your sincere friend Eep. the letter was sent and christina received it in due time in the course of the following november her bands were published in the church and on the heath and also in copenhagen where the bridegroom lived she was taken to copenhagen under the protection of her future mother-in-law because the bridegroom could not spare time from his numerous occupations for a journey so far into jutland on the journey christina met her father at one of the villages through which they passed and here he took leave of her very little was said about the matter to Ibe, and he did not refer to it. His mother, however, noticed that he had grown very silent and pensive. Thinking as he did of old times, no wonder the three nuts came into his mind which the gypsy woman had given him when a child, and of the two which he had given to Christina. These wishing nuts, after all, had proved true fortune-tellers. One had contained a gilded carriage and noble horses, and the other beautiful clothes. All of these Christina would now have in her new home at Copenhagen. Her part had come true and for him the nut contained only black earth the gypsy woman had said it was the best for him perhaps it was and this also would be fulfilled he understood the gypsy woman's meaning now the black earth the dark grave was the best thing for him now again years passed away not many but they seemed long years to ib the old innkeeper and his wife died one after the other and the whole of their property many thousand dollars was inherited by their son Christina could have the golden carriage now and plenty of fine clothes. During the two long years which followed, no letter came from Christina to her father, and when at last her father received one from her, it did not speak of prosperity or happiness. Poor Christina! Neither she nor her husband understood how to economize or save, and the riches brought no blessing with them, because they had not asked for it. Years passed, and for many summers the heath was covered in bloom, and in winter the snow rested upon it, and the rough winds blew across the ridge under which stood Eve's sheltered home. One spring day, the sun shone brightly, and he was guiding the plough across his field. The ploughshare struck against something which he fancied was a firestone, and then he saw glittering in the earth a splinter of shining metal which the plough had cut from something which gleamed brightly in the furrow he searched and found a large golden armlet of superior workmanship and it was evident that the plough had disturbed a hun's grave he searched further and found more valuable treasures which ib showed to the clergyman who explained their value to him 
then he went to the magistrate who informed the president of the museum of the discovery and advised eve to take the treasures himself to the president you have found in the earth the best thing you could find said the magistrate the best thing thought eve the very best thing for me and found in the earth well if it really is so then the gypsy woman was right in her prophecy so eve went in the ferry-boat from our house to copenhagen to him who had only sailed once or twice on the river near his own home this seemed like a voyage on the ocean and at length he arrived at copenhagen the value of the gold he had found was paid to him it was a large sum six hundred dollars then eve of the heath went out and wandered about in the great city on the evening before the day he had settled to return with the captain of the passage boat eve lost himself in the streets and took quite a different turning than the one he wished to follow he wandered on till he found himself in a poor street of the suburb called christian's haven not a creature could be seen at last a very little girl came out of one of the wretched-looking houses and eve asked her to tell him the way to the street he wanted she looked up timidly at him and began to cry bitterly he asked her what was the matter but what she said he could not understand so he went along the street with her and as they passed under a lamp the light fell on the little girl's face a strange sensation came over eve as he caught sight of it the living breathing embodiment of little christina stood before him just as he remembered her in the days of her childhood he followed the child to the wretched house and ascended the narrow crazy staircase which led him to the little garret in the roof the air in the room was heavy and stifling no light was burning and from one corner came sounds of moaning and sighing it was the mother of the child who lay there on the miserable bed with the help of a match ib struck a light and approached her can i be of any service to you he asked this little girl brought me up here but i am a stranger in this city are there no other neighbors or any one whom i can call then he raised the head of the sick woman and smoothed her pillow he started as he did so it was christina of the heath no one had mentioned her name to Ib for years. It would have disturbed his peace of mind, especially as the reports respecting her were not good. The wealth which her husband had inherited from his parents had made him proud and arrogant. He had given up his certain appointment, and travelled for six months in foreign lands, and, on his return, had lived in great style and got into terrible debt. For a time he had trembled on the high pedestal on which he had placed himself, till at last he toppled over, and ruin came. His numerous merry companions and the visitors at his table said it served him right, for he'd kept house like a madman. One morning his corpse was found in the canal. The cold hand of death had already touched the heart of Christina. Her youngest child, looked for in the midst of prosperity, had sunk into the grave when only a few weeks old, and at last Christina herself became sick unto death, and lay, forsaken and dying, in a miserable room, amid poverty she might have borne in her younger days, but which was now more painful to her from the luxuries from which she had lately been accustomed. It was her eldest child, also a little Christina, whom Eve had followed to her home, where she suffered hunger and poverty with her mother. "'It makes me unhappy to think that I shall die and leave this poor child,' sighed she. "'Oh, what will become of her?' She could say no more. Then Eve brought out another match, and lighted a piece of candle which he had found in the room, and it threw a glimmering light over the wretched dwelling. Eve looked at the little girl and thought of Christina in her young days. For her sake, could he not love this child who was a stranger to him? As he thus reflected, the dying woman opened her eyes and gazed at him. Did she recognize him? He never knew, for not another word escaped her lips. In the forest by the river Gudnau, not far from the heath and beneath the ridge of land, stood the little farm, newly painted and whitewashed. The air was heavy and dark. There were no blossoms on the heath. The autumn winds whirled the yellow leaves towards the boatman's hut, in which strangers dwelt. But the little farm stood safely sheltered beneath the tall trees and high ridge, the turf blazed brightly on the hearth, and within was sunlight, the sparkling light from the sunny eyes of a child, the bird-like tones from the rosy lips singing like the song of a lark in spring. All was life and joy. Little Christina sat on Eve's knee. Eve was to her both father and mother. Her own parents had vanished from her memory, as dream picture vanishes alike from childhood and age. Eve's house was well and prettily furnished, for he was a prosperous man now, while the mother of the little girl rested in the churchyard at Copenhagen, where she had died in poverty. Eve had money now, money which had come to him out of the black earth, and he had Christina for his own, after all. End of Eve and Little Christina Section number 8 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Carolin Kleberg. Hans Christian Andersen. Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Thorny Road of Honor. An old story yet lives of the thorny road of honor, of a marksman who indeed attained to rank and office, but only after a lifelong and very strife against difficulties. Who has not, in reading this story, thought of his own strife, and of his own numerous difficulties? The story is very closely akin to reality, but still, it has its harmonious explanation here on earth, while reality often points beyond the confines of life to the regions of eternity. The history of the world is like a magic lantern that displays to us in light pictures upon the dark ground of the present, how the benefactors of mankind, the martyrs of genius, wandered along the thorny road of honor. From all periods, and from every country, these shining pictures display themselves to us. Each only appears for a few moments, but each represents a whole life, sometimes a whole age, with its conflicts and victories. Let us contemplate here and there one of the company of martyrs, the company which will receive new members unto the world itself shall pass away. We look down upon a crowded amphitheatre. Out of the clouds of Aristophanes, satyr and humour are pouring down in streams upon the audience. On the stage Socrates, the most remarkable man in Athens, he who had been the shield and defence of the people against the thirty tyrants, is held up mentally and bodily to ridicule. Socrates, who is saved, Alcibiades and Xenophon in the turmoil of battle, and whose genius soared far above the gods of the Asians. He himself is present. He has risen from the spectator's bench, and has stepped forward that the laughing Athenians may well appreciate the likeness between himself and the caricature on the stage. There he stands before them, towering high above them all. Thou juicy cream poisonous hemlock, throw thy shadow over Athens, not thou olive tree of fame. Seven cities contended of the honour of giving birth to Homer, that is to say, they contended after his death. Let us look at him as he was in his lifetime. He wanders on foot through the cities, and recites his verses for a livelihood. The thought for the morrow turns his hair grey. He, the greatest seer, is blind and painfully pursues his way. The sharp thorn tears the mantle of the king of poets. His song yet lives, and through that alone live all the heroes and gods of antiquity. One picture after another springs up from the east, from the west, far removed from each other in time and place, yet each one forming a portion of the thorny road of honour, on which the thistle indeed displays a flower, but only to adorn the grave. The camels pass along under the palm trees. They are richly laden with indigo and other treasures of value, sent by the ruler of the land to him whose songs are the delight of the people, the fame of the country. He whom envy and falsehood have driven into exile has been found, and the caravan approaches the little town in which he has taken refuge. A poor corpse is carried out of the town gate, and the funeral procession causes the caravan to halt. The dead man is he whom they have been sent to seek. Firdusi. He was wandered the thorny road of honour even to the end. The African, with blond features, thick lips and woolly hair, sits on the marble steps of the palace in the capital of Portugal and begs. He is the submissive slave of 
Camoens, and but for him, and for the copper coins thrown to him by the passers-by, his master, the poet of the Lusiette, would die of hunger. Now a costly monument marks the grave of Camoens. There is a new picture. Behind the iron grating a man appears, pale as death, with long, unkempt beard. I have made a discovery, he says, the greatest that has been made for centuries, and they have kept me locked up here for more than twenty years. Who is the man? A madman, replies the keeper of the madhouse. What whimsical ideas these lunatics have! He imagines that one can propel things by means of steam. It is Solomon de Cares, the discoverer of the power of steam, whose theory, expressed in dark words, is not understood by Richelieu, and he dies in the madhouse. Here stands Columbus, whom the street boys used once to follow and jeer, because he wanted to discover a new world, and he has discovered it. Shouts of joy greet him from the breast of all, and the clash of bells sounds to celebrate his triumphant return. But the clash of bells of envy soon drowns the others. The discoverer of a world, he who lifted the American gold land from the sea, and gave it to his king, he is rewarded with iron chains. He wishes that these chains may be placed in his coffin, for they witness to the world of the way in which a man's contemporaries reward good service. One picture after another comes crowding on, the thorny path of honor, and a fame is overfilled. Here in dark night sits the man who measured the mountains in the moon, he who forced his way out into the endless space among stars and planets, he the mighty man who understood the spirit of nature and felt the earth moving beneath his feet, Galileo. Blind and deaf he sits, an old man thrust through with a spear of suffering, and amid the torments of neglect, scarcely able to lift his foot, that foot with which, in the anguish of his soul, when men denied the truth, he stamped upon the ground with the exclamation, Yet it moves! Here stands a woman of childlike mind, yet full of faith and inspiration. She carries the banner in front of the combating army, and brings victory and salvation to her fatherland. The sound of shouting arises, and the pyre flames up. They are burning the witch, John of Arc. Yes, and the future century jeers at the white lily. Voltaire, the satyr of human intellect, writes, La Pucelle. At the thing or assembly of Vibor, the Danish nobles burn the laws of the king. They flame up high, illuminating the period and the lawgiver, and throw a glory into the dark prison tower, where an old man is growing grey and bent. With his finger he marks out a grove in the stone table. It is the popular king who sits there, once the ruler of three kingdoms, the friend of the citizen and the peasant. It is Christian the second. Enemies wrote his history. Let us remember his improvements of seven and twenty years, if we cannot forget his crime. A ship sails away. Quitting the Danish shores, a man leans against the mast, casting a last glance toward the island Huen. It is too Cobra. He raised the name of Denmark to the stars, and was rewarded with injury, loss, and sorrow. He is going to a strange country. The vault of heavens is above me everywhere, he says, and what do I want more? And away sails the famous Dane, the astronomer, to live honoured and free in a strange land. I free! if only from the unbearable sufferings of the body, comes in a sigh through time, and strikes upon our ear. What a picture! Griffenfeld, a Danish Prometheus, 
bound to the rocky islands of Munkholm. We are in America, on the margin of one of the largest rivers. An innumerable crowd has gathered, for it is said that a ship is to sail against the wind and weather, bidding defiance to the elements. The man who thinks he can solve the problem is named Robert Fulton. The ship begins its passage, but suddenly it stops. The crowd begins to laugh and whistle and hiss. The very father of the man whistles with the rest. Conceit! Foolery! is the cry. It has happened just as he deserved. Put the crack brain under lock and key. Then suddenly a little nail breaks, which had stopped the machine for a few moments, and now the wheels turn again, the floats break the force of the waters, and the ship continues its course. And the beam of the steam engine shortens the distance between four lands from hours into minutes. O oh, human race, canst thou grasp the happiness of such a minute of consciousness? This penetration of the soul by its mission, the moment in which all dejection and every wound, even those caused by one's own fault, is changed into health and strength and clearness, when discord is converted to harmony. The minute in which men seem to recognize the manifestation of the heavenly grace in one man, and feel how this one imparts it to all. Thus the thorny part of honour shows itself as a glory surrounding the earth with its beams. Thrice happy he who is chosen to be a wanderer there, and without merit of his own, to be placed between the builder of the bridge and the earth, between providence and the human race. On mighty wings the spirit of history floats through the ages, and shows, giving courage and comfort, and awakening gentle thoughts, on the dark nightly background, but in gleaming pictures, the thorny path of honour, which does not, like in fairy tale, end in brilliancy and joy here on earth, but stretches out beyond all time, even into eternity. End of the Thorny Road of Honor Recording by Caroline Kleberg, Berlin Section 9 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sławek Księżycki. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul, The Jewish Maiden. In a charity school among the children sat a little Jewish girl. She was a good, intelligent child and very quick at her lessons. But the scripture lesson class she was not allowed to join, for this was a Christian school. During the hour of this lesson, the Jewish girl was allowed to learn her geography or to work her sum for the next day. And when her geography lesson was perfect, the book remained open before her, but she read not another word for she sat silently listening to the words of the Christian teacher. He soon became aware that the little one was paying more attention to what he said than most of the other children. Read your book, Sarah, he said to her gently, but again and again he saw her dark beaming eyes fixed upon him, and once, when he asked her a question, she could answer him even better than the other children. She had not only heard, but understood his words, and pondered them in her heart. Her father, a poor but honest man, had placed his daughter at the school on the conditions that she should not be instructed in the Christian faith. But it might have caused confusion or raised discontent in the minds of the other children if she had been sent out of the room 
so she remained. And now it was evident this could not go on. The teacher went to her father and advised him to remove his daughter from the school or to allow her to become a Christian. I cannot any longer be an idle spectator of those beaming eyes which express such a deep and earnest longing for the words of the gospel, said he. Then the father burst into tears. I know very little of the law of my fathers, said he, but Sarah's mother was firm in her belief as a daughter of Israel, and I vowed to her on her deathbed that our child should never be baptized. I must keep my vow. It is to me even as a covenant with God himself. And so the little Jewish girl left the Christian school. Years rolled by. In one of the smallest provincial towns in a humble household lived a poor maiden of the Jewish faith as a servant. Her hair was black as ebony, her eye dark as night, yet full of light and brilliancy, so peculiar to the daughters of the East. It was Sarah. The expression in the face of the grown-up maiden was still the same as when, a child, she sat on the schoolroom form, listening with thoughtful eyes to the words of the Christian teacher. Every Sunday there sounded forth from a church close by the tones of an organ and the singing of the congregation. The Jewish girl heard them in the house where, industrious and faithful in all things, she performed her household duties. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy, said the voice of the law in her heart, but her Sabbath was a working day among the Christians, which was a great trouble to her. And then, as the thought arose in her mind, does God reckon by days and hours? Her conscience felt satisfied on this question, and she found it a comfort to her that on the Christian Sabbath she could have an hour for her own prayers undisturbed. The music and singing of the congregation sounded in her ears while at work in the kitchen, till the place itself became sacred to her. Then she would read in the Old Testament that treasure and comfort to her people, and it was indeed the only scriptures she could read. Faithfully in her inmost thoughts had she kept the words of her father to her teacher when she left the school, and the vow he had made to her dying mother that she should never receive Christian baptism. The New Testament must remain to her a sealed book, and yet she knew a great deal of its teaching, and the sound of the gospel truths still lingered among the recollections of her childhood. One evening she was sitting in the corner of the dining room while her master read aloud. It was not the gospel he read, but an old story book, therefore she might stay and listen to him. The story related that the Hungarian knight, who had been taken prisoner by a Turkish pasha, was most cruelly treated by him. He caused him to be yoked with his oxen to the plough, and driven with blows from the whip till blood flowed, and he almost sank with exhaustion and pain. The faithful wife of the knight at home gave up all her jewels, mortgaged her castle and land, and his friends raised large sums to make up the ransom demanded for his release, which was most enormously high. It was collected at last, and the knight released from slavery and misery. Sick and exhausted, he reached home. Ere long came another summons to a struggle with the foes of Christianity. The still living knight heard the sound. He could endure no more. He had neither peace nor rest. He caused himself to be lifted on his war horse. The color came into his cheeks, and his strength returned to him again as he went forth to battle and to victory. The very same Pasha who had yoked him to the plough became his prisoner and was dragged to a dungeon in the castle. But an hour had scarcely passed 
when the knight stood before the captive pasha and inquired what do you suppose awaiteth thee i know replied the pasha retribution yes the retribution of a christian replied the knight the teaching of christ the teacher commands us to forgive our enemies to love our neighbors for god is love depart in peace return to thy home i give thee back to thy loved ones but in future be mild and humane to all who are in trouble then the prisoner burst into tears and exclaimed oh how could i imagine such mercy and forgiveness i expected pain and torment it seemed to me so sure that i took poison which i secretly carried about me and in a few hours its effects will destroy me i must die nothing can save me but before i die explain to me the teaching which is so full of love and mercy so great and godlike oh that i may hear this teaching and die a christian and his prayer was granted this was the legend which the master read out of the old story-book everyone in the house who was present listened and shared the pleasure but sarah the jewish girl sitting so still in a corner felt her heart burn with excitement great tears came into her shining dark eyes and with the same gentle piety with which she had once listened to the gospel while sitting on the former school she felt its grandeur now and the tears rolled down her cheeks then the last words of her dying mother rose before her let not my child become a christian and with them sounded in her heart the words of the law honor thy father and thy mother i am not admitted among the christians she said they mock me as a jewish girl the neighbors boys did so last sunday when i stood looking in through the open church door at the candles burning on the altar and listening to the singing ever since i sat on the school bench i have felt the power of christianity a power which like a sunbeam streams into my heart however closely i may close my eyes against it but i will not grieve thee my mother in thy grave i will not be unfaithful to my father's vow i will not read the bible of the christian i have the god of my fathers and in him i will trust and again years passed by sarah's master died and his widow found herself in such reduced circumstances that she wished to dismiss her servant maid but sarah refused to leave the house and she became a true support in time of trouble and kept the household together by working till late at night with her busy hands to earn their daily bread not a relative came forward to assist them and the widow was confined to a sick bed for months and grew weaker from day to day sarah worked hard but contrived to spare time to amuse her and watch by the sick bed she was gentle and pious an angel of blessing in that house of poverty my bible lies on the table yonder said the sick woman one day to sarah read me something from it the night appears so long and my spirit thirsts to hear the word of god and sarah bowed her head she took the book and folded her hand over the bible of the christians and at last opened it and read to the sick woman tears stood in her eyes as she read and they shone with brightness for in her heart it was light mother she murmured thy child may not receive christian baptism nor be admitted into the congregation of christian people thou hast so willed it and i will respect thy command we are therefore still united here on earth but in the next world there will be a higher union even with god himself who leads and guides his people till death he came down heaven to earth to suffer for us that we should bring forth the fruit of repentance i understand it now i know not how i learned this truth unless it is through the name of christ
yet she trembled as she pronounced the holy name she struggled against these convictions of the truth of christianity for some days till one evening while watching her mistress she was suddenly taken very ill her limbs tottered under her and she sank fainting by the bedside of the sick woman poor sarah said the neighbors she's overcome with hard work and night watching and then they carried her to the hospital for the sick poor there she died and they bore her to her resting place in the earth but not to the churchyard for the christians there was no place for the jewish girl but they dug a grave for her outside the wall and god's sun which shines upon the graves of the churchyard of the christians also thrones its beam on the grave of the jewish maiden beyond the wall and when the psalms of the christians sound across the churchyard their echo reaches her lonely resting place and she who sleeps there will be counted worthy at the resurrection through the name of christ the lord who said to his disciples john baptized you with water i will baptize you with the holy ghost End of the Jewish Maiden Recording by Sławek Księżycki Section 10 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Aaron Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 1854 to 1859 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Bell Deep. Ding dong, ding dong. It sounds up from the Bell Deep in the Owens O. Every child in the old town of Owens, on the island of Funen, knows the O, which washes the gardens round about the town and flows on under the wooden bridges from the dam to the watermill. In the O grow the yellow water lilies and brown feathery reeds. The dark velvety flag grows there, high and thick. Old and decayed willows, slanting and tottering, hang far out over the stream besides the monk's meadow and by the bleaching ground. But opposite there are gardens upon gardens, each different from the rest, some with pretty flowers and bowers like little dolls' pleasure grounds, often displaying cabbage and other kitchen plants. And here and there the gardens cannot be seen at all, for the great elder trees that spread themselves out by the bank and hang out far over the streaming waters, which are deeper here and there than an oar can fathom opposite the old nunnery is the deepest place which is called the bell deep and there dwells the old water spirit the o man this spirit sleeps through the day while the sun shines down upon the water but in starry and moonlit nights he shows himself he is very old grandmother says she had heard her own grandmother tell of him he is said to lead a solitary life and to have nobody whom he can converse with save the great old church bell once the bell hung in the church tower, but now there is no trace left of the tower or of the church, which was called St. Albans. Ding, dong, ding, dong, sounded the bell when the tower still stood there. And one evening, while the sun was setting and the bell was swinging away bravely, it broke loose and came flying down through the air and the brilliant metal shining in the ruddy beam. Ding, dong, ding, dong, now I'll retire to rest, sang the bell, and flew down into the Uenso, where it is deepest, and that is why the place is called the Bell Deep. But the bell got neither rest nor sleep. Down in the old man's haunt it sounds and rings, so that the tones sometimes pierce upward through the waters, and many people maintain that its strains forebode the death of someone, but that is not true, for the bell is only talking with the old man, who is now no longer alone. And what is the bell telling? It is old, very old, as we have already observed. It was there long before grandmother's grandmother was born, and yet it is but a child in comparison with the old man, who is quite an old personage, an oddity, with his hose of eel skin, and his scaly jacket with the yellow lilies for buttons, and a wreath of reed in his hair, and seaweed in his beard. But he looks very pretty for all that. What the bell tells? To repeat it all would require years and days. For year by year it is telling the old stories, sometimes short ones, sometimes long ones, according to its whim. It tells of old times, of the dark hard times. Thus, in the church of the St. Alban the monk had mounted up into the tower. He was young and handsome, but thoughtful exceedingly. He looked through the loophole, out upon the Uenso, where the bed of water was yet broad, and the monk's meadow was still a lake. 
he looked out over it and over the rampart and over the nun's hill opposite where the convent lay and the light gleamed forth from the nun's cell he had known the nun right well and he thought of her and his heart beat quicker as he thought ding dong ding dong yes this was the story the bell told into the tower came also the dapper manservant of the bishop and when i the bell who am made of metal rang hard and loud and swung to and fro i might have beaten out his brains he sat down close under me and played with two little sticks as if they had been a stringed instrument and he sang to it now i may sing aloud though at other times i may not whisper it i may sing of everything that is kept concealed behind lock and bars yonder it is cold and wet the rats are eating her up alive no one knows of it nobody hears of it not even now for the bell is ringing and singing its loud ding dong ding dong there was a king in those days they called him canute he bowed himself before the bishop and monk but when he offended the free peasants with heavy taxes and hard words they seized their weapons and put him to flight like a wild beast he sought shelter in the church and shut gate and door behind him the violent bands surrounded the church i heard tell of it the crows ravens and magpies started up in terror at the yelling and shouting that sounded around they flew into the tower and out again they looked down upon the throng below and they also looked into the windows of the church and screamed out aloud at what they saw there king canute knelt before the altar in prayer his brothers eric and benedict stood beside him as guards with drawn swords but the king's servant the treacherous blake betrayed his master the throng in front of the church knew where they could hit the king, and one of them flung a stone through a pane of glass, and the king lay there dead. The cries and screams of the savage horde and of the birds sounded through the air, and I joined in it also, for I sang, Ding dong, ding dong. The church bell hangs high, and looks far around, and sees the birds around it, and understands their language. The wind roars in upon it through windows and loopholes, and the wind knows everything, for he gets it from the air, which encircles all things, and the church bell understands his tongue and rings it into the world, ding dong, ding dong. But it was too much for me to hear and to know. I was not able any longer to ring it out. I became so tired, so heavy, that the beam broke, and I flew out into the gleaming O, where the water is deepest, and where the O man lives, solitary and alone and year by year i tell him what i have heard and what i know ding dong ding dong thus it sounds complainingly out of the bell deep in the uen show that is what grandmother told us but the schoolmaster says that there was not any bell that rung down there for that it could not do so and that no o man dwelt yonder for there is no o man at all and when all the other church bells are sounding sweetly he says that it is not really the bells that are sounding but that it is the air itself which sends forth the notes and grandmother said to us that the bell itself said it was the heir who told him consequently they are agreed on that point and this much is sure be cautious cautious and take good heed to thyself they both say the air knows everything it is around us it is in us it talks of our thoughts and of our deeds it speaks longer of them than does the bell down in the depths of the uenzo where the o man dwells it rings it out in the vault of heaven far far out forever and ever till the heaven bells sound ding dong ding dong end of the bell deep recording by aaron section eleven of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, to by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Bottleneck Close to the corner of a street, among other abodes of poverty, stood an exceedingly tall, narrow house, which had been so knocked about by time that it seemed out of joint in every direction. This house was inhabited by poor people, but the deepest poverty was apparent in the garret lodging in the gable. In front of the little window, an old bent birdcage hung in the sunshine, which had not even a proper water-glass, but instead of it the broken neck of a bottle turned upside down, and a cork stuck in to make it hold the water with which it was filled. An old maid stood at the window, 
she had hung chickweed over the cage, and the little linnet which it contained hopped from perch to perch and sang and twittered merrily. "'Yes, it's all very well for you to sing,' said the bottleneck. That is, he did not really speak the words as we do, for the neck of a bottle cannot speak, but he thought them to himself in his own mind, just as people sometimes talk quietly to themselves. "'Yes, you may sing very well. You have all your limbs uninjured. You should feel what it is like to lose your body and only have a neck and a mouth left with a cork stuck in it, as I have. You wouldn't sing then, I know. After all, it is just as well that there are some who can be happy. I have no reason to sing, nor could I sing now if I were ever so happy. But when I was a whole bottle, and they rubbed me with a cork, didn't I sing then? I used to be called a complete lark. I remember when I went out to a picnic with the furrier's family, on the day his daughter was betrothed. It seems as if it only happened yesterday. I've gone through a great deal in my time, when I come to recollect. I've been in the fire and in the water, I've been deep in the earth, and have mounted higher in the air than most other people. And now I'm swinging here, outside a bird cage, in the air and the sunshine. Oh, indeed, it would be worth while to hear my history. But I do not speak it aloud, for a good reason, because I cannot. Then the bottleneck related his history, which was really rather remarkable. He, in fact, related it to himself, or at least thought it in his own mind. The little bird sang his own song merrily. In the street below there was driving and running to and fro. Everyone thought of his own affairs, or perhaps of nothing at all. But the bottleneck thought deeply. He thought of the blazing furnace in the factory, where he had been blown into life. He remembered how hot it felt when he was placed in the heated oven, the home from which he sprang, and that he had a strong inclination to leap out again directly. But after a while it became cooler, and he found himself very comfortable. He had been placed in a row, with a whole regiment of his brothers and sisters all brought out of the same furnace. Some of them had certainly been blown into champagne bottles, and others into beer bottles, which made a little difference between them. In the world it often happens that a beer bottle may contain the most precious wine, and the champagne bottle be filled with blacking, but even in decay it may always be seen whether a man has been well born. Nobility remains noble, as a champagne bottle remains the same, even with blacking in its interior." When the bottles were packed, our bottle was packed amongst them. It little expected, then, to finish its career as a bottleneck, or to be used as a water-glass to a bird's cage, which is, after all, a place of honour, for it is to be of some use in the world. The bottle did not behold the light of day again until it was unpacked with the rest in the wine merchant's cellar, and for the first time rinsed with water, which caused some very curious sensations. There it lay empty, and without a cork, and had a peculiar feeling, as if it wanted something it knew not what. At last it was filled with rich and costly wine, a cork was placed in it, and sealed down. Then it was labelled first quality, as if it had carried off the first prize at an examination. Besides, the wine and the bottle were both good, and while we are young is the time for poetry." There were sounds of song within the bottle, of things it could not understand, of green sunny mountains where the vines grow, and where the merry vine-dressers laugh, sing, and are merry. Ah, how beautiful is life! All these tones of joy and song in the bottle were like the working of a young poet's brain, who often knows not the meaning of the tones which are sounding within him. One morning the bottle found a purchaser in the furrier's apprentice, who was told to bring one of the best bottles of wine. It was placed in the provision basket with ham and cheese and sausages. The sweetest fresh butter and the finest bread were put into the basket by the furrier's daughter herself, for she packed it. She was young and pretty, her brown eyes laughed, and a smile lingered round her mouth as sweet as that in her eyes. She had delicate hands, beautifully white, and her neck was whiter still. 
It could easily be seen that she was a very lovely girl, and as yet she was not engaged. The provision basket lay in the lap of the young girl as the family drove out to the forest, and the neck of the bottle peeped out from between the folds of the white napkin. There was the red wax on the cork, and the bottle looked straight at the young girl's face, and also at the face of the young sailor who sat near her. He was a young friend, the son of a portrait painter. He had lately passed his examination with honour, as mate, and the next morning he was to sail in his ship to a distant coast. There had been a great deal of talk on this subject while the basket was being packed, and during this conversation the eyes and the mouth of the fairy's daughter did not wear a very joyful expression. The young people wandered away into the green wood and talked together. What did they talk about? The bottle could not say, for he was in the provision basket. It remained there a long time, but when at last it was brought forth, it appeared as if something pleasant had happened, for everyone was laughing. The fairy's daughter laughed too, but she said very little, and her cheeks were like two roses. Then the father took the bottle and the corkscrew into his hands. What a strange sensation it was to have the cork drawn for the first time. The bottle could never after that forget the performance of that moment. Indeed, there was quite a convulsion within him as the cork flew out, and a gurgling sound as the wine was poured forth into the glasses. "'Long life to the betrothed!' cried the papa, and every glass was emptied to the dregs, while the young sailor kissed his beautiful bride. "'Happiness and blessing to you both!' said the old people, father and mother, and the young man filled the glasses again. "'Safe return, and a wedding this day next year!' he cried, and when the glasses were empty, he took the bottle, raised it on high, and said, "'Thou hast been present here on the happiest day of my life. Thou shalt never be used by others.' So saying, he hurled it high in the air. The furious daughter thought she should never see it again, but she was mistaken." It fell among the rushes on the borders of a little woodland lake. The bottleneck remembered well how long it lay there unseen. "'I gave them wine, and they gave me muddy water,' he had said to himself, but I suppose it was all well meant. He could no longer see the betrothed couple, nor the cheerful old people, but for a long time he could hear them rejoicing and singing. At length there came by two peasant boys, who peeped in among the reeds and spied out the bottle. Then they took it up and carried it home with them, so that once more it was provided for. At home in their wooden cottage these boys had an elder brother, a sailor, who was about to start on a long voyage. He had been there the day before to say farewell, and his mother was now very busy packing up various things for him to take with him on his voyage. In the evening, his father was going to carry the parcel to the town to see his son once more, and take him a farewell greeting from his mother. A small bottle had already been filled with herb tea, mixed with brandy, and wrapped in a parcel. But when the boys came in, they brought with them a larger and stronger bottle, which they had found. This bottle would hold so much more than the little one, and they all said the brandy would be so good for complaints of the stomach, especially as it was mixed with medical herbs. The liquid which they now poured into the bottle was not like the red wine with which it had once been filled. These were bitter drops, but they are of great use sometimes. For the stomach. The new large bottle was to go, not the little one. So the bottle once more started on its travels. It was taken on board, for Peter Jensen was one of the crew. The very same ship in which the young mate was to sail. But the mate did not see the bottle. Indeed, if he had... He would not have known it, or supposed it was the one out of which they had drunk to the felicity of the betrothed and to the prospect of a marriage on his own happy return. Certainly the bottle no longer poured forth wine, but it contained something quite as good. And so it happened that whenever Peter Jensen brought it out, his messmates gave it the name of the apothecary, for it contained the best medicine to cure the stomach, and he gave it out quite willingly as long as a drop remained. Those were happy days, and the bottle would sing when rubbed with a cork, and it was called a great lark, Peter Jensen's lark. Long days and months rolled by, during which the bottle stood empty in a corner, when a storm arose, whether on the passage out or home it could not tell, for it had never been ashore. It was a terrible storm, great waves arose, 
darkly heaving and tossing the vessel to and fro. The main mast was split asunder, the ship sprang a leak, and the pumps became useless, while all around was black as night. At the last moment, when the ship was sinking, the young mate wrote on a piece of paper, "'We are going down. God's will be done.' Then he wrote the name of his betrothed, his own name, and that of the ship. Then he put the leaf in an empty bottle that happened to be at hand, corked it down tightly, and threw it into the foaming sea. He knew not that it was the very same bottle from which the goblet of joy and hope had once been filled for him, and now it was tossing on the waves with his last greeting, and a message from the dead. The ship sank, and the crew sank with her, but the bottle flew on like a bird, for it bore within it a loving letter from a loving heart. And as the sun rose and set, the bottle felt as at the time of its first existence, when in the heated, glowing stove it had a longing to fly away. It outlived the storms and the calm, it struck against no rocks, was not devoured by sharks, but drifted on for more than a year, sometimes towards the north, sometimes towards the south, just as the current carried it. It was in all other ways its own master, but even of that one may get tired. The written leaf, the last farewell of the bridegroom to his bride, would only bring sorrow when once it reached her hands. But where were those hands, so soft and delicate, which had once spread the tablecloth on the fresh grass in the green wood on the day of her betrothal? Ah, yes, where was the fairy's daughter, and where was the land which might lie nearest to her home? The bottle knew not. It travelled onward and onward, and at last all this wandering about became wearisome. At all events, it was not its usual occupation. But it had to travel, till at length it reached land, a foreign country. Not a word spoken in this country could the bottle understand. It was a language it had never before heard, and it is a great loss not to be able to understand a language. The bottle was fished out of the water, and examined on all sides. The little letter contained within it was discovered, taken out, and turned and twisted in every direction, but the people could not understand what was written upon it. They could be quite sure that the bottle had been thrown overboard from a vessel, and that something about it was written on this paper. But what was written? That was the question. So the paper was put back into the bottle, and then both were put away in a large cupboard of one of the great houses of the town. Whenever any strangers arrived, the paper was taken out and turned over and over, so that the address, which was only written in pencil, became almost illegible, and at last no one could distinguish any letters on it at all. For a whole year the bottle remained standing in the cupboard, and then it was taken up to the loft, where it soon became covered with dust and cobwebs. Ah, how often then it thought of those better days, of the times when in the fresh green wood it had poured forth rich wine or, while rocked by the swelling waves, it had carried in its bosom a secret, a letter, a last parting sigh. For full twenty years it stood in a loft, and it might have stayed there longer but that the house was going to be rebuilt. The bottle was discovered when the roof was taken off. They talked about it, but the bottle did not understand what they said. A language is not to be learned by living in a loft, even for twenty years. If I had been downstairs in the room, thought the bottle, I might have learned it. It was now washed and rinsed, which process was really quite necessary, and afterwards it looked clean and transparent, and felt young again in its old age, but the paper which it had carried so faithfully was destroyed in the washing. They filled the bottle with seeds, though it scarcely knew what had been placed in it. Then they corked it down tightly and carefully wrapped it up. There not even the light of a torch or lantern could reach it, much less the brightness of the sun or moon. And yet, thought the bottle, men go on a journey that they may see as much as possible, and I can see nothing. However, it did something quite as important. It travelled to the place of its destination, and was unpacked. "'What trouble they have taken with that bottle over yonder,' said one, "'and very likely it is broken after all.' but the bottle was not broken, and better still, it understood every word that was said. This language it had heard at the furnaces and at the wine merchants, 
in the forest and on the ship. It was the only good old language it could understand. It had returned home, and the language was as a welcome greeting. For very joy, it felt ready to jump out of people's hands, and scarcely noticed that its cork had been drawn and its contents emptied out, till it found itself carried to a cellar, to be left there and forgotten. There's no place like home, even if it's a cellar. It never occurred to him to think that he might lie there for years, he felt so comfortable. For many long years he remained in the cellar, till at last some people came to carry away the bottles, and ours amongst the number. Out in the garden there was a great festival. Brilliant lamps hung in festoons from tree to tree, and paper lanterns through which the light shone till they looked like transparent tulips. It was a beautiful evening, and the weather mild and clear. The stars twinkled, and the new moon, in the form of a crescent, was surrounded by the shadowy disk of the whole moon, and looked like a grey globe with a golden rim. It was a beautiful sight for those who had good eyes. The illumination extended even to the most retired of the garden walks, at least not so retired that any one need lose himself there. In the borders were placed bottles, each containing a light, and among them the bottle with which we are acquainted and whose fate it was, one day, to be only a bottleneck, and to serve as a water-glass to a bird's cage. Everything here appeared lovely to our bottle, for it was again in the green wood, amid joy and feasting. Again it heard music and song, and the noise and murmur of a crowd, especially in that part of the garden where the lamps blazed, and the paper lanterns displayed their brilliant colours. It stood in a distant walk, certainly, but a place pleasant for contemplation, and it carried a light, and was at once useful and ornamental. In such an hour it is easy to forget that one has spent twenty years in a loft, and a good thing it is to be able to do so. Close before the bottle passed a single pair, like the bridal pair, the mate and the furry's daughter, who had so long ago wandered in the wood. It seemed to the bottle as if he were living that time over again, not only the guests, but other people were walking in the garden, who were allowed to witness the splendour and the festivities. Among the latter came an old maid, who seemed to be quite alone in the world. She was thinking, like the bottle, of the green wood, and of a young betrothed pair, who were closely connected with herself. She was thinking of that hour, the happiest of her life, in which she had taken part, when she had herself been one of that betrothed pair. Such hours are never to be forgotten." let a maiden be as old as she may. But she did not recognize the bottle, neither did the bottle notice the old maid. And so we often pass each other in the world when we meet, as did these two, even while together in the same town. The bottle was taken from the garden, and again sent to a wine merchant, where it was once more filled with wine, and sold to an aeronaut, who was to make an ascent in his balloon on the following Sunday. A great crowd assembled to witness the sight. Military music had been engaged, and many other preparations made. The bottle saw it all from the basket in which he lay close to a live rabbit. The rabbit was quite excited, because he knew that he was to be taken up and let down again in a parachute. The bottle, however, knew nothing of the up or the down. He saw only that the balloon was swelling larger and larger, till it could swell no more, and began to rise and be restless. Then the ropes which held it were cut through, and the aerial ship rose in the air with the aeronaut and the basket containing the bottle and the rabbit, while the music sounded, and all the people shouted, Hurrah! This is a wonderful journey up into the air, thought the bottle. It is a new way of sailing, and here, at least, there is no fear of striking against anything. Thousands of people gazed at the balloon, and the old maid who was in the garden saw it also, for she stood at the open window of the garret by which hung the cage containing the linnet, who then had no water-glass, but was obliged to be contented with an old cup. In the window-sill stood a myrtle in a pot, and this had been pushed a little on one side that it might not fall out, for the old maid was leaning out of the window that she might see. And she did see distinctly the aeronaut in the balloon, and how he let down the rabbit in the parachute, and then drank to the health of all the spectators in the wine from the bottle. After doing this, he hurled it high into the air. 
how little she thought that this was the very same bottle which her friend had thrown aloft in her honour on that happy day of rejoicing in the green wood in her youthful days the bottle had no time to think when raised so suddenly and before it was aware it reached the highest point it had ever attained in its life steeples and roofs lay far far beneath it and the people looked as tiny as possible then it began to descend much more rapidly than the rabbit had done made somersaults in the air and felt itself quite young and unfettered although it was half full of wine but this did not last long what a journey it was all the people could see the bottle for the sun shone upon it the balloon was already far away and very soon the bottle was far away also for it fell upon a roof and broke in pieces but the pieces had got such an impetus in them that they could not stop themselves they went jumping and rolling about till at last they fell into the courtyard and were broken into still smaller pieces only the neck of the bottle managed to keep whole and it was broken off as clean as if it had been cut with a diamond that would make a capital bird's glass said one of the cellar men but none of them had either a bird or a cage and it was not to be expected that they would provide one just because they had found a bottleneck that could be used as a glass but the old maid who lived in the garret had a bird and it really might be useful to her so the bottleneck was provided with a cork and taken up to her and as it often happens in life the part that had been uppermost was now turned downwards and it was filled with fresh water then they hung it in the cage of the little bird who sang and twittered more merrily than ever ah you have good reason to sing said the bottleneck which was looked upon as something very remarkable because it had been in a balloon nothing further was known of its history as it hung there in the bird's cage it could hear the noise and murmur of the people in the street below as well as the conversation of the old maid in the room within an old friend had just come to visit her and they talked not about the bottleneck but of the myrtle in the window no you must not spend a dollar for your daughter's bridal bouquet said the old maid you shall have a beautiful little bunch for a nosegay full of blossoms do you see how splendidly the tree has grown it has been raised from only a little sprig of myrtle that you gave me on the day after my betrothal and from which i was to make my own bridal bouquet when a year had passed but that day never came the eyes were closed which were to have been my light and joy through life in the depths of the sea my beloved sleeps sweetly the myrtle has become an old tree and i am a still older woman before the sprig you gave me faded i took a spray and planted it in the earth and now as you see it has become a large tree and a bunch of the blossoms shall at last appear at a wedding festival in the bouquet of your daughter there were tears in the eyes of the old maid as she spoke of the beloved of her youth and of their betrothal in the wood many thoughts came into her mind but the thought never came that quite close to her in that very window was a remembrance of those olden times the neck of the bottle which had as it were shouted for joy when the cork flew out with a bang on the betrothal day but the bottleneck did not recognize the old maid he had not been listening to what she had related perhaps because he was thinking so much about her End of the Bottleneck Section 12 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jennifer Dorr Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 1854 to 1859 by Hans Christian Andersen translated by H. P. Paul soup from a sausage skewer we had such an excellent dinner yesterday said an old mouse of the female sex to another who had been present at the feast I sat number 21 below the mouse king which was not a bad place shall I tell you what we had everything was first rate moldy bread tallow candle and sausage and then, when we had finished that course, the same came on all over again. It was as good as two feasts. We were very sociable, and there was as much joking and fun as if we'd all been all of one family circle. 
Nothing was left but the sausage skewers. And this formed a subject of conversation, till at last it turned to the proverb, soup from sausage skins, or as the people in the neighboring country call it, soup from a sausage skewer. Everyone had heard the proverb, but no one had ever tasted the soup, much less prepared it. A capital toast was drunk to the inventor of the soup, and someone said he ought to be made a relieving officer to the poor. Was not that witty? Then the old mouse king rose and promised that the young lady mouse, who should learn how best to prepare this much admired and savory soup, should be his queen, and a year and a day should be allowed for the purpose. That was not at all a bad proposal, said the other mouse. But how is the soup made? Ah, that is more than I can tell you. All the young lady mice were asking the same question. They wished very much to be queen, but they did not want to take the trouble of going out into the world to learn how to make soup, which was absolutely necessary to be done first. But it is not everyone who would care to leave her family or her happy corner by the fireside at home, even to be made queen. It is not always easy to find bacon and cheese rind in foreign lands every day, and it is not pleasant to have to endure hunger and be perhaps, after all, eaten up alive by the cat. Most probably, some such thoughts as these discouraged the majority from going out into the world to collect the required information. Only four mice gave notice that they were ready to set out on the journey. They were young and lively, but poor. Each of them wished to visit one of the four divisions of the world, so that it might be seen which was the most favored by fortune. Everyone took a sausage skewer as a traveler's staff, and to remind them of the object of their journey. They left home early in May, and none of them returned till the first of May in the following year, and then only three of them. Nothing was seen or heard of the fourth, although the day of decision was close at hand. Ah, yes, there was always some trouble mixed up with the greatest pleasure, said the Mouse King, but he gave orders that all the mice within a circle of many miles should be invited at once. They were to assemble in the kitchen, and the three traveled mice were to stand in a row before them, while a sausage skewer, covered with crepe, was to be stuck up instead of the missing mouse. No one dared to express an opinion until the king spoke and desired one of them to go on with her story. And now we shall hear what she said. What the first little mouse saw and heard on her travels. When I first went out into the world, said the little mouse, I fancied, as so many of my age do, that I already knew everything. But it was not so. It takes years to acquire great knowledge. I went at once to sea in a ship bound for the north. I had been told that the ship's cook must know how to prepare every dish at sea, and it is easy enough to do that, with plenty of sides of bacon, and large tubs of salt meat and moldy flour. There I found plenty of delicate food, but no opportunity for learning how to make soup from a sausage skewer. We sailed on for many days and nights. The ship rocked fearfully, and we did not escape without a wetting. As soon as we arrived at the port to which the ship was bound, I left it and went on shore at a place far towards the north. It is a wonderful thing to leave your own little corner at home, to hide yourself in a ship, where there are sure to be some nice snug corners for shelter, then suddenly to find yourself thousands of miles away in a foreign land. I saw large pathless forests of pine and birch trees, which smelt so strong that I sneezed and thought of sausage. There were great lakes also which looked as black as ink at a distance, but were quite clear when I came close to them, Large swans were floating upon them, and I thought at first they were only foam. They lay so still, but when I saw them walk and fly, I knew what they were directly. They belonged to the goose species. One can see that by their walk. No one can attempt to disguise family descent. I kept with my own kind, and associated with the forest and field mice, who, however, knew very little, especially about what I wanted to know, and which had actually made me travel abroad. The idea that soup could be made from a sausage skewer was to them such an out-of-the-way unlikely thought that it was repeated from one to another through the whole forest. They declared that the problem would never be solved, that the thing was an impossibility. How little I thought that in this place, on the very first night, I should be initiated into the manner of its preparation. It was the height of summer, which the mice told me was the reason that the forest smelt so strong, and that the herbs were so fragrant, and the lakes with the white swimming swans so dark, and yet so clear. On the margin of the wood, Near to three or four houses, a pole as large as the mainmast of a ship had been erected, and from the summit hung wreaths of flowers and fluttering ribbons. It was the maypole. Lads and lasses danced round the pole and tried to outdo the violins of the musicians with their singing. They were as merry as ever at sunset and in the moonlight, 
but I took no part in the merrymaking. What has a little mouse to do with the maypole dance? I sat in the soft moss and held my sausage skewer tight. The moon threw its beams particularly on the spot where stood a tree covered with exceedingly fine moss. I may also venture to say that it was as fine and soft as the fur of the mouse king, but it was green, which is a color very agreeable to the eye. All at once I saw the most charming little people marching towards me. They did not reach higher than my knee. They looked like human beings, but were better proportioned, and they called themselves elves. Their clothes were very delicate and fine, for they were made of the leaves of flowers trimmed with the wings of flies and gnats, which had not a bad effect. By their manner it appeared as if they were seeking for something. I knew not what, till at last one of them espied me and came towards me, and the foremost pointed to my sausage skewer and said, There, that is just what we want. See, it is pointed at the top. Is it not capital? And the longer he looked at my pilgrim staff, the more delighted he became. I will lend it to you, said I, but not to keep. Oh, no, we won't keep it, they all cried. And then they seized the skewer, which I gave up to them, and danced with it to the spot where the delicate moss grew, and set it up in the middle of the green. They wanted a maypole and the one they now had seemed cut out on purpose for them. Then they decorated it so beautifully that it was quite dazzling to look at. Little spiders spun golden threads around it, and then it was hung with fluttering veils and flags so delicately white that they glittered like snow in the moonshine. After that they took colors from the butterfly's wing and sprinkled them over the white drapery which gleamed as if covered with flowers and diamonds, so that I could not recognize my sausage skewer at all. Such a maypole had never been seen in all the world as this. Then came a great company of real elves. Nothing could be finer than their clothes. And they invited me to be present at the feast, but I was to keep at a certain distance, because I was too large for them. Then commenced such music that it sounded like a thousand glass bells, and was so full and strong that I thought it must be the song of the swans. I fancied also that I heard the voices of the cuckoo and the blackbird, and it seemed at last as if the whole forest sent forth glorious melodies. The voices of children, the tinkling of bells, and the songs of the birds, and all this wonderful melody came from the elfin maypole. My sausage peg was a complete peal of bells. I could scarcely believe that so much could have been produced from it, till I remembered into what hands it had fallen. I was so much affected that I wept tears such as little mouse can weep, but they were tears of joy. The night was far too short for me. There are no long nights there in summer, as we often have in this part of the world. When the morning dawned and the gentle breeze rippled the glassy mirror of the forest lake, all the delicate veils and flags fluttered away into thin air. The waving garlands of the spider's web, the hanging bridges and galleries, or whatever else they may be called, vanished away as if they had never been. Six elves brought me back my sausage skewer, and at the same time asked me to make any request, which they would grant, if in their power. So I begged them, if they could, to tell me how to make soup from a sausage skewer. "'How do we make it?' said the chief of the elves with a smile. "'Why, you have just seen it. "'You scarcely knew your sausage skewer again, I am sure. "'They think themselves very wise,' thought I to myself. "'Then I told them all about it, and why I had travelled so far, "'and also what promise had been made at home "'to the one who should discover the method of preparing this soup. "'What use will it be,' I asked, "'to the Mouse King, or to our whole mighty kingdom "'that I have seen all these beautiful things? "'I cannot shake the sausage peg and say, "'Look, here is the skewer, and now the soup will come. That would only produce a dish to be served when people were keeping a fast. Then the elf dipped his finger into the cup of a violet and said to me, Look here, I will anoint your pilgrim staff, so that when you return to your own home and enter the king's castle, you have only to touch the king with your staff, and violets will spring forth and cover the whole of it, even in the coldest winter time. So I think I have given you really something to carry home, and a little more than something. But before the little mouse explained what this something more was, she stretched her staff out to the king, and as it touched him the most beautiful bunch of violets sprang forth and filled the place with perfume. The smell was so powerful that the mouse king ordered the mice who stood nearest the chimney to thrust their tails into the fire, and there might be a smell of burning, for the perfume of the violets was overpowering and not the sort of scent that everyone liked. But what was the something more of which you spoke just now? asked the mouse king. Why, answered the little mouse, I think it's what they call effect, and thereupon she turned the staff round, and behold, not a single flower was to be seen upon it. She now only held the naked skewer, and lifted it up as a conductor lifts his baton at a concert. 
Violets, the elf told me, continued the mouse, are for the sight, the smell, and the touch, so we have only now to produce the effect of hearing and tasting. And then, as the little mouse beat time with her staff, there came sounds of music, not such music as was heard in the forest at the elfin feast, but such as is often heard in the kitchen, the sounds of boiling and roasting. It came quite suddenly, like wind rushing through the chimneys, and seemed as if every pot and kettle were boiling over. The fire shovel clattered down on the brass fender, and then quite as suddenly all was still. Nothing could be heard but the light vapory song of the tea kettle, which was quite wonderful to hear, for no one could rightly distinguish whether the kettle was just beginning to boil or going to stop. And the little pot steamed, and the great pot simmered, but without any regard for each. Indeed, there seemed no sense in the pots at all. And as the little mouse waved her baton still more wildly, the pots foamed and threw up bubbles and boiled over. Well, again the wind roared and whistled through the chimney, and at last there was such a terrible hubbub that the little mouse let her stick fall. That is a strange sort of soup, said the mouse king. Shall we not hear about the preparation? That is all, answered the little mouse with a bow. That all, said the mouse king, then we shall be glad to hear what information the next may have to give us. What the second mouse had to tell. I was born in the library at a castle, said the second mouse. Very few members of our family ever had the good fortune to get into the dining room, much less the storeroom. On my journey, and here today, are the only times I've ever seen a kitchen. We were often obliged to suffer hunger in the library. But then we gained a great deal of knowledge. The rumor reached us of the royal prize offered to those who should be able to make soup from a sausage skewer. Then my old grandmother sought out a manuscript, which, however, she could not read, but had heard it read, and in it was written, Those who are poets can make soup of sausage skewers. She then asked me if I was a poet. I felt myself quite innocent of any such pretensions. Then she said I must go out and make myself a poet. I asked again what I should be required to do, for it seemed to me quite as difficult as to find out how to make soup of a sausage skewer. My grandmother had heard a great deal of reading in her day, and she told me three principal qualifications were necessary. Understanding, imagination, and feeling. If you can manage to acquire these three, you will be a poet, and the sausage skewer soup will be quite easy to you. So I went forth into the world and turned my steps towards the west, that I might become a poet. Understanding is the most important matter in everything. I knew that, for the two other qualifications are not thought much of. So I went first to seek for understanding. Where was I to find it? Go to the ant and learn wisdom, said the great Jewish king. I knew that from living in a library. So I went straight on till I came to the first great ant hill, and then I set myself to watch, that I might become wise. The ants are a very respectable people. They are wisdom itself. All they do is like the working of a sum in arithmetic, which comes right. To work and to lay eggs, say they, and to provide for posterity is to live out your time properly. And that they truly do. They are divided into the clean and the dirty ants. Their rank is pointed out by a number, and the ant queen is number one. And her opinion is the only correct one on everything. She seems to have the whole wisdom of the world in her, which was just the important matter I wished to acquire. She said a great deal, which was no doubt very clever, yet to me it sounded like nonsense. She said the ant hill was the loftiest thing in the world, and yet close to the mound stood a tall tree, which no one could deny was loftier, much loftier. But no mention was made of the tree. One evening an ant lost herself on this tree. She had crept up the stem, not nearly to the top, but higher than the ant had ever ventured. And when at last she returned home, she said that she had found something in her travels much higher than the ant hill. The rest of the ants considered this an insult to the whole community. So she was condemned to wear a muzzle, and to live in perpetual solitude. A short time afterwards another ant got on the tree, and made the same journey and the same discovery. But she spoke of it cautiously and indefinitely, and she was one of the superior ants and very much respected. They believed her, and when she died they erected an eggshell as a monument to her memory, for they cultivated a great respect for science. I saw, said the little mouse, that the ants were always running to and fro with their burdens on their backs. Once I saw one of them drop her load. She gave herself a great deal of trouble in trying to raise it again, but she could not succeed. Then two others came up and tried with all their strength to help her, till they nearly dropped their own burdens in doing so. Then they were obliged to stop for a moment in their help, for everyone must think of himself first. 
and the Aunt Queen remarked that their conduct that day showed that they had possessed kind hearts and good understanding. These two qualities, she continued, place us ants in the highest degree above all other reasonable beings. Understanding must therefore be seen among us in the most prominent manner, and my wisdom is greater than all. And so saying, she raised herself on her two hind legs, that no one else might be mistaken for her. I could not therefore make an error, so I ate her up. We are to go to the ants to learn wisdom, and I had got the queen. I now turned and went nearer to the lofty tree already mentioned, which was an oak. It had a tall trunk with a wide-spreading top, and was very old. I knew that a living being dwelt here, a dryad as she is called, who is born with the tree and dies with it. I had heard this in the library, and here was just such a tree, and in it an oak maiden. She uttered a terrible scream when she caught sight of me so near to her. Like many women, she was very much afraid of mice. And she had more real cause for fear than they have, for I might have gnawed through the tree on which her life depended. I spoke to her in a kind and friendly manner and begged her to take courage. At last she took me up in her delicate hand, and then I told her what had brought me out into the world, and she promised me that perhaps on that very evening she should be able to obtain for me one of the two treasures for which I was seeking. She told me that Fantasius was her very dear friend, that he was as beautiful as the god of love, that he remained often for many hours with her under the leafy boughs of the tree which then rustled and waved more than ever over them both. He called her his dryad, she said, and the tree, his tree, for the grand old oak, with its gnarled trunk, was just to his taste. The root spreading deep into the earth, the top rising high in the fresh air, knew the value of the drifted snow, the keen wind and the warm sunshine, as it ought to be known. Yes, continued the dryad, the birds sing above in the branches and talk to each other about the beautiful fields they have visited in foreign lands. And on one of the withered boughs a stork has built his nest. It is beautifully arranged, and besides it is pleasant to hear a little about the land of the pyramids. All this pleases Fantasius, but it is not enough for him. I am obliged to relate to him of my life in the woods, and to go back to my childhood when I was little, and the tree so small and delicate that a stinging nettle could overshadow it, and I have to tell everything that has happened since then till now that the tree is so large and strong. Sit you down now under the green bindwood and pay attention. When Fantasius comes I will find an opportunity to lay hold of his wing and to pull out one of the little feathers. That feather you shall have. A better was never given to any poet. It will be quite enough for you. And when Fantasius came, the feather was plucked, and said the little mouse, I seized and put it in water, and kept it there till it was quite soft. It was very heavy and indigestible, but I managed to nibble it up at last. It is not so easy to nibble oneself into a poet. There are so many things to get through. Now, however, I had two of them, understanding and imagination, and through these I knew that the third was to be found in the library. A great man has said and written that there are novels whose sole and only use appeared to be that they might relieve mankind of overflowing tears, a kind of sponge, in fact, for sucking up feelings and emotions. I remembered a few of these books. They had always appeared tempting to the appetite. They had been much read, and were so greasy that they must have absorbed no end of emotions in themselves. I retraced my steps to the library and literally devoured a whole novel. That is, properly speaking, the interior or soft part of it, the crust or binding I left. When I had digested not only this, but a second, I felt a stirring within me. Then I ate a small piece of a third romance, and felt myself a poet. I said it to myself, and told others the same. I had headache and backache, and I cannot tell what aches besides. I thought over all the stories that may be said to be connected with sausage pegs, and all that has ever been written about skewers, and sticks, and staves, and splinters, came to my thoughts. The Ant Queen must have had a wonderfully clear understanding. I remembered the man who placed a white stick in his mouth by which he could make himself and the stick invisible. I thought of sticks as hobby horses, staves of music or rhyme, of breaking a stick over a man's back, and heaven knows how many more phrases of the same sort relating to sticks, staves, and skewers. All my thoughts rain on skewers, sticks of wood, and staves, and as I am at last a poet, and I have worked terribly hard to make myself one, I can, of course, make poetry on anything. I shall therefore be able to wait upon you every day in the week, with the poetical history of a skewer, and that is my soup. In that case, said the Mouse King, we will hear what the third mouse has to say. Squeak, squeak, cried a little mouse at the kitchen door. It was the fourth, and not the third, of the four who were contending for the prize, one whom the rest supposed to be dead. She shot in like an arrow, and overturned the sausage peg that had been covered with crepe. She had been running day and night. She had watched an opportunity to get into a goods train, and had traveled by the railway, and yet she had arrived almost too late. She pressed forward, looking very much ruffled, 
She had lost her sausage skewer, but not her voice, for she began to speak at once as if they only waited for her, and would hear her only, and as if nothing else in the world was of the least consequence. She spoke out so clearly and plainly, and as she had come in so suddenly, that no one had time to stop her, or to say a word while she was speaking. And now let us hear what she said. What the fourth mouse, who spoke before the third, had to tell. I started off at once to the largest town, said she, but the name of it has escaped me. I have a very bad memory for names. I was carried away from the railway with some forfeited goods to the jail, and on arriving I made my escape and ran into the house of the turnkey. The turnkey was speaking of his prisoners, especially of one who had uttered thoughtless words. These words had given rise to other words, and at length they were written down and registered. The whole affair is like making a soup of sausage skewers, said he, but the soup may cost him his neck. Now this raised in me an interest for the prisoner, continued the little mouse, and I watched my opportunity and slipped into his apartment, for there is a mouse hole to be found behind every closed door. The prisoner looked pale. He had a great beard and large sparkling eyes. There was a lamp burning, but the walls were so black that they only looked the blacker for it. The prisoner scratched pictures and verses with white chalk on the black walls, but I did not read the verses. I think he found his confinement wearisome, so that I was a welcome guest. He enticed me with breadcrumbs, with whistling, and with gentle words, and seemed so friendly towards me, that by degrees I gained confidence in him, and we became friends. He divided his bread and water with me, gave me cheese and sausage, and I really began to love him. Altogether I must own that it was a very pleasant intimacy. He let me run about on his hand and on his arm, and into his sleeve, and I even crept into his beard, and he called me his little friend. I forgot what I had come out into the world for, forgot my sausage skewer, which I had laid in a crack in the floor. It is lying there still. I wished to stay with him always where I was, for I knew that if I went away the poor prisoner would have no one to be his friend, which is a sad thing. I stayed, but he did not. He spoke to me so mournfully for the last time, gave me double as much bread and cheese as usual, and kissed his hand to me. Then he went away, and never came back. I know nothing more of his history. The jailer took possession of me now. He said something about soup from a sausage skewer, but I could not trust him. He took me in his hand, certainly, but it was to place me in a cage like a treadmill. Oh, how dreadful it was! I had to run round and round without getting any further in advance, and only to make everybody laugh. The jailer's granddaughter was a charming little thing. She had curly hair like the brightest gold, merry eyes, and such a smiling mouth. You poor little mouse, said she one day as she peeped into my cage. I will set you free. She then drew forth the iron fastening, and I sprang out on the window sill, and from thence to the roof. Free, free, that was all I could think of, not of the object of my journey. It grew dark, and as night was coming on, I found a lodging in an old tower, where dwelt a watchman and an owl. I had no confidence in either of them, least of all in the owl, which is like a cat and has a great failing, for she eats mice. One may, however, be mistaken sometimes, and so was I, for this was a respectable and well-educated old owl who knew more than the watchman, and even as much as I did myself. The young owls made a great fuss about everything, but the only rough words she would say to them were, You'd better go and make some soup for some sausage skewers. She was very indulgent and loving to her children. Her conduct gave me such confidence in her that from the crack where I sat I called out, Squeak! This confidence of mine pleased her so much that she assured me she would take me under her own protection and that not a creature should do me harm. The fact was, she wickedly meant to keep me in reserve for her own eating in winter, when food would be scarce. Yet she was a very clever lady owl. She explained to me that the watchman could only hoot with the horn that hung loose at his side. And then she said he is so terribly proud of it that he imagines himself an owl in the tower, wants to do great things, but only succeeds in small, all soup on a sausage skewer. Then I begged the owl to give me the recipe for the soup. Soup from a sausage skewer, said she, is only a proverb amongst mankind and may be understood in many ways. Each believes his own way the best, and after all the proverb signifies nothing. Nothing, I exclaimed. I was quite struck. Truth is not always agreeable, but truth is above everything else, as the old owl said. I thought over all this, and saw quite plainly that if truth was really so far above everything else, it must be much more valuable than soup from a sausage skewer. So I hastened to get away, that I might be home in time and bring what was highest and best, and above everything, namely, the truth. The mice are enlightened people, and the mouse king is above them all. He is therefore capable of making me queen for the sake of truth. 
"'Your truth is falsehood,' said the mouse who had not yet spoken. "'I can prepare the soup, and I mean to do so.' "'How it was prepared.' "'I did not travel,' said the third mouse. "'I stayed in this country. "'That was the right way. "'One gains nothing by traveling. "'Everything can be acquired here quite as easily. "'So I stayed at home. "'I have not obtained what I know from supernatural beings. "'I have neither swallowed it nor learnt it from conversing with owls. "'I've got it all from my reflections and thoughts. "'Will you now set the kettle on fire or so? "'Now pour the water in, quite full, up to the brim. "'Place it on the fire.' Make up a good blaze, keep it burning, that the water may boil. It must boil over and over. There, now I throw in the skewer. Will the Mouse King be pleased now to dip his tail into the boiling water and stir it round with the tail? The longer the King stirs it, the stronger the soup will become. Nothing more is necessary, only to stir it. Can no one else do this? asked the King. No, said the Mouse. Only in the tail of the Mouse King is this power contained and the water boiled and bubbled as the Mouse King stood close beside the kettle. It seemed rather a dangerous performance, but he turned round and put out his tail as mice do in a dairy when they wish to skim the cream from a pan of milk with their tails and afterwards lick it off. But the Mouse King's tail had only just touched the hot steam when he sprang away from the chimney in a great hurry, exclaiming, Oh, certainly, by all means, you must be my queen, and we will let the soup question rest till our golden wedding, fifty years hence, so that the poor in my kingdom, who are then to have plenty of food, will have something to look forward to for a long time with great joy. And very soon the wedding took place. But many of the mice, as they were returning home, said that the soup could not be properly called soup from a sausage skewer, but soup from a mouse's tail. They acknowledged also that some of the stories were very well told, but that the whole could have been managed differently. I should have told it so and so and so. These were the critics who were always so clever afterwards. When this story was circulated all over the world, the opinions upon it were divided. But the story remained the same. And after all, the best way in everything you undertake, great as well as small, is to expect no thanks for anything you may do, even when it refers to soup from a sausage skewer. End of Soup from a Sausage Skewer Section number 13 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Caroline Kleberg Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 1854-1859 to 1859, By Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. P. Paul The Old Bachelor's Nightcap There is a street in Copenhagen with a very strange name. It is called Hüsken Street. Where the name came from and what it means is very uncertain. It is said to be German, but that is unjust to the Germans, for it would then be called Häuschen, not Hüsken. Häuschen means a little house and for many years it consisted only of a few small houses, which were scarcely larger than the wooden booths we see in the market-places at fair time. They were perhaps a little higher, and had windows, but the panes consisted of horn or bladder skins, for glass was then too dear to have glazed windows in every house. This was a long time ago, so long indeed that our grandfathers, and even great-grandfathers would speak of those days as olden times. Indeed, many centuries have passed since then. The rich merchants in Bremen and Lübeck, who carried on trade in Copenhagen, did not recede in the towns themselves, but sent their clerks who dwelt in the wooden booths in the Häuschen Street, and sold beer and spices. The German beer was very good, and there were many sorts, from Bremen, Prussia, and Brunswick, and quantities of all sorts of spices, saffron, aniseed, ginger, and especially pepper. Indeed, pepper was almost the chief article sold there. So it happened at last that the German clerks in Denmark got their nickname of pepper gentry. It had been made a condition with these clerks 
that they should not marry, so that those who lived to be old to take care of themselves, to attend to their own comforts and even to light their own fires, when they had any to light. Many of them were very aged, lonely, old boys, with strange thoughts and eccentric habits. From this all unmarried men, who have attained a certain age, are called in Denmark pepper gentry, and this must be remembered by all those who wish to understand the story. These pepper gentlemen, or as they are called in England, old bachelors, are often made a butt of ridicule. They are told to put on their nightcaps, draw them over their eyes, and go to sleep. The boys in Denmark make a song of it, thus. Poor old bachelor, cut your wood, such a nightcap was never seen, who would think it was ever clean, go to sleep, it will do you good. So they sing about the pepper gentlemen. So do they make sport of the old poor bachelor and his nightcap and all because they really know nothing of either. It is a cap that no one need wish for, or laugh at. And why not? Well, we shall hear in the story. In olden times Hoysian Street was not paved, and passengers would stumble out of one hole into another, as they generally do in unfrequented highways. And the street was so narrow, and the booths leaning against each other were so close together, that in the summer time a sail would be stretched across the street from one booth to another opposite. At these times the order of the pepper, saffron, and ginger became more powerful than ever. Behind the counter, as a rule, there was no young men. The clerks were almost all old boys, but they did not dress as we are accustomed to see old men represented, wearing wigs, nightcaps, and knee breeches and with coat and waistcoat buttoned up to the chin. We have seen the portraits of our great-grandfathers dressed in this way. But the pepper gentlemen had no money to spare to have their portraits taken, though one of them would have made an interesting picture for us now, if taken as he appeared standing behind his counter, or going to church or on holidays. On these occasions they wore high-crowned, broad-brimmed hats, and sometimes a younger clerk would stick a feather in his. The wooden shirt was concealed by a broad linen collar, the close jacket was buttoned up to the chin, and the cloak hung loosely over it. The trousers were tucked into the broad-tipped shoes, for the clerks wore no stockings. They generally stuck a table knife and spoon in their girdles, as well as a larger knife as a protection to themselves and such a weapon was often very necessary. After this fashion was Antony dressed on holidays and festivals, excepting that instead of a high-crowned hat he wore a kind of bonnet and under it a knitted cap, a regular nightcap, to which he was so accustomed that it was always on his hat. He had two nightcaps, I mean, not hats. Antony was one of the oldest of the clerks, and just the subject for a painter. He was as thin as a lath, wrinkled round the mouth and eyes, had long bony fingers, bushy grey eyebrows, and over his left eye hung a thick tuft of hair, which did not look handsome, but made his appearance very remarkable. People knew that he came from Bremen. It was not exactly his home, although his master resided there. His ancestor were from Thuringia, and had lived in the town of Eisenach close by Wartburg. Old Antony seldom spoke of this place, but he thought of it all the more. The old clerks of Heusian Street very seldom met together, each one remained in his own booth, which was closed early enough in the evening, and then it looked dark and dismal out in the street. Only a faint glimmer of light struggled through the horn panes in the little window of the roof while within sat the old clerk generally on his bed singing his evening hymn in a low voice or he would be moving about in his booth till late in the night busily employed in many things it certainly was not a very lively existence to be a stranger in a strange land is a bitter lot 
no one notices you unless you happen to stand in their way. Often when it was dark night outside, with rain or snow falling, the place looked quite deserted and gloomy. There were no lamps in the street, excepting a very small one which hung at the end of the street before a picture of the Virgin, which had been painted on the wall. The dashing of the water against the bulwarks of a neighbouring castle could plainly be heard. Such evenings are long and dreary, unless people can find something to do, and so Anthony found it. There were not always things to be packed or unpacked, nor paper bags to be made, nor the scales to be polished. So Anthony invented employment. He mended his clothes and patches his boots. And when he at last went to bed, his nightcap, which he had worn from habit, still remained on his head. He had only to pull it down a little farther over his forehead. Very soon, however, it would be pushed up again to see if the light was properly put out. He would touch it, press the wick together, and at last pull his nightcap over his eyes and lie down again on the other side. But often there would arise in his mind a doubt as to whether every coal had been quite put out in the little fire-pan in the shop below. If even a tiny spark had remained it might set fire to something and cause great damage. Then he would rise from his bed, creep down the ladder, for it could scarcely be called a flight of stairs, and when he reached the fire-pan not a spark could be seen so he had just to go back again to bed. But often, when he had got half-way back, he would fancy the iron shutters of the door were not properly fastened, and his thin legs would carry him down again. And when at last he crept into bed, he would be so cold that the teeth clattered in his head. He would draw the coverlet close around him, pull his nightcap over his eyes and try to turn his thoughts from trade and from the labours of the day to olden times. But this was scarcely an agreeable entertainment, for thoughts of olden memories raised the curtains of the past, and sometimes pierce the heart with painful recollections till the agony brings tears to the waking eyes. And so it was with Antony. Often the scalding tears, like pearly drops, would fall from his eyes to the coverlet, and roll on the floor with a sound as if one of his heartstrings had broken. Sometimes, with a lurid flame, memory would light up a picture of life which had never faded from his heart. If he dried his eyes with his nightcap, then the tear and the picture would be crushed. But the source of the tears remained and welled up again in his heart. The pictures did not follow one another in order as the circumstances they represented had occurred. Very often the most painful would come together, and when those came which were most full of joy, they had always the deepest shadow thrown upon them. The beech woods of Denmark are acknowledged by every one to be very beautiful but more beautiful still in the eyes of old Antony were the beech woods in the neighbourhood of Wartburg. More grand and venerable to him seemed the old oaks around the proud Baronia castle, where the creeping plants hung over the stony summits of the rocks. Sweeter was the perfume there of the apple blossoms than in all the land of Denmark. How vividly were represented to him in a glittering tear that rolled down his cheek two children at play, a boy and a girl. The boy had rosy cheeks, golden ringlets, and clear blue eyes. He was the son of Antony, a rich merchant. It was himself. The little girl had brown eyes and black hair, and was clever and courageous. She was the mayor's daughter, Molly. The children were playing with an apple. They shook the apple and heard the pips rattling in it. Then they cut it in two, and each of them took half. They also divided the pips and ate all but one, which the little girl proposed should be placed in the ground. "'You will see what will come out,' she said. "'Something you don't expect. A whole apple tree will come out, but not directly.' 
Then they got a flower pot, filled it with earth, and were soon both very busy and eager about it. The boy made a hole in the earth with his finger, and the little girl placed the pip in the hole, and then they both covered it over with earth. Now you must not take it out tomorrow to see if it has taken root, said Molly. No one ever should do that. I did so with my flowers, but only twice. I wanted to see if they were growing. I didn't know any better then, and the flowers all died. Little Anthony kept the flower pot, and every morning during the whole winter he looked at it, but there was nothing to be seen but black earth. At last, however, the spring came and the sun shone warm again, and then two little green leaves sprouted forth in the pot. They are Molly and me, said the boy. How wonderful they are, and so beautiful! Very soon a third leaf made its appearance. What does that stand for? thought he, and then came another and another, day after day and week after week, till the plant became quite a tree. And all this about the two children was mirrored to old Antony in a single tear, which could soon be wiped away and disappear, but might come again from its source in the heart of the old man. In the neighborhood of Eisenach stretches a ridge of stony mountains, one of which has a rounded outline, and shows itself above the rest without tree, bush, or grass on its barren summits. It is called the Venus Mountain, and the story goes that the Lady Venus, one of the heathen goddess, keeps house there. She is also called Lady Halle, as every child round Eisenach well knows. She it was who enticed the noble knight Tannhäuser, the minstrel from the circle of singers at Wattburg, into her mountain. Little Molly and Antony often stood by this mountain, and one day Molly said, Do you dare to knock and say, Lady Halle, Lady Halle, open the door, Tannhäuser is here. But Antony did not dare. Molly, however, did, though she only said the words, Lady Halle, Lady Halle, loudly and distinctly. The rest she muttered so much under her breath that Antony felt certain she had really said nothing. And yet she looked quite bold and saucy, just as she did sometimes when she was in the garden with a number of little girls. They would all stand round him together and want to kiss him, because he did not like to be kissed and pushed them away. Then Molly was the only one who dared to resist him. "'I may kiss him,' she would say proudly, as she strew her arms round his neck. She was vain of her power over Antony, for he would submit quietly and think nothing of it. Molly was very charming, but rather bold. And how she did tease! They said, Lady Halley was beautiful, but her beauty was that of a tempting fiend. Saint Elizabeth, the Tudor saint of the land, the pious princess of Thuringia, whose good deeds have been immortalized in so many places through stories and legends, had greater beauty and more real grace. Her picture hung in the chapel, surrounded by silver lamps, but it did not in the least resemble Molly. The apple tree, which the two children had planted, grew year after year till it became so large that it had to be planted into the garden, where the dew fell and the sun shone warmly and there it increased in strength so much as to be able to withstand the cold of winter, and after passing through the severe weather it seemed to put forth its blossoms in spring for every joy that the cold season had gone. In autumn it produced two apples, one for Molly and one for Antony. It could not well do less. The tree after this grew very rapidly, and Molly grew with the tree. She was as fresh as an apple blossom, but Antony was not to behold this flower for long. All things change. Molly's father left his old home, and Molly went with him far away. In our time it would be only a journey of a few hours, but then it took more than a day and a night to travel so far eastward from Eisenach to the town still called Weimar, on the borders of Thuringia. 
and Molly and Anthony both wept, but these tears all flowed together into one tear which had the rosy shimmer of joy. Molly had told him that she loved him, loved him more than all the splendors of Weimar. One, two, three years went by, and during the whole time he received only two letters. One came by the carrier, and the other by a traveler brought. The way was very long and difficult, with many turnings and windings through towns and villages. How often had Antony and Molly heard the story of Tristan and Isolda, and Antony had thought the story applied to him, although Tristan means born in sorrow, which Antony certainly was not. Nor was it likely he would ever say of Molly as Tristan said of Isolda, She has forgotten me. But in truth Isolda had not forgotten him, her faithful friend. And when both were laid in their graves, one on each side of the church, the linden trees that grew by each grave spread over the roof, and bending downward each other, mingled their blossoms together. Anthony thought it a very beautiful but mournful story, yet he never feared anything so sad would happen to him and Molly, as he passed the spot whistling the air of a song composed by the minstrel water, called the Willow Bird, beginning, Under the linden trees, out on the heath. One stanza pleased him exceedingly. Through the forest in the vale, sweetly warbles the nightingale. This song was often in his mouth, and he sung or whistled it on a moonlight night, when he rode on horseback along the deep hollow way on his road to Weimar to visit Molly. He wished to arrive unexpectedly, and so indeed he did. He was received with a hearty welcome, and introduced to plenty of grand and pleasant company, where overflowing wine-cups were passed about. A pretty room and a good bed were provided for him, and yet his reception was not what he had expected and dreamed it would be. He could not comprehend his own feelings, nor the feelings of others. But it is easily understood how a person can be admitted into a house or a family without becoming one of them. We converse in company with those we meet, as we converse with our fellow travellers in a stagecoach on a journey. We know nothing of them, and perhaps all the while we are incommoding one another, and each is wishing himself or his neighbour away. Something of this kind Antony felt when Molly talked to him of olden times. "'I am a straightforward girl,' she said, "'and I will tell you myself how it is. There have been great changes since we were children together. Everything is different, both inwardly and outwardly. We cannot control our wills nor the feelings of our hearts by the force of custom. Antony, I would not for the world make an enemy of you when I am far away. Believe me, I entertain for you the kindest wishes in my heart, but to feel for you what I now know can be felt for another man can never be. You must try and reconcile yourself to this. Farewell, Antony. Antony also said, Farewell. Not a tear came into his eye. He felt he was no longer Molly's friend. Hot iron and cold iron alike take the skin from our lips, and we feel the same sensation if we kiss either. And Antony's kiss was now the kiss of hatred, as it had once been the kiss of love. Within four and twenty hours Antony was back again to Eisenach, though the horse that he rode was entirely ruined. "'What matters it?' said he. "'I am ruined also. I will destroy everything that can remind me of her, or of Lady Halley, or Lady Venus, the heathen woman. I will break down the apple tree and tear it up by the roots. Never more shall it blossom or bear fruit.' The apple tree was not broken down for Antony himself was struck with a fever which caused him to break down and confined him to his bed. But something occurred to raise him up again. What was it? A medicine was offered to him which he was obliged to take, a bitter remedy at which the sick body and the oppressed spirit alike shuddered. Antony's father lost all his property, and from being known as one of the richest merchants, he became very poor. 
dark days, heavy trials, where the poverty at the door came rolling into the house upon them like the waves of the sea. Sorrow and suffering deprived Antony's father of his strength, so that he had something else to think of besides nursing his love sorrows and his anger against Molly. He had to take his father's place, to give orders, to act with energy, to help, and at last to go out into the world and earn his bread. Antony went to Bremen, and there he learned what poverty and hard living really were. These things often harden the character, but sometimes soften the heart even too much. How different the world and the people in it appeared to Antony now to what he had thought in his childhood! What to him were the minstrel songs, an echo of the past, sounds long vanished. At times he would think in this way, yet again and again the songs would sound in his soul, and his heart become gentle and pious. God's will is the best, he would then say. It was well that I was not allowed to keep my power over Molly's heart, and that she did not remain true to me. How I should have felt it now when fortune has deserted me! She left me before she knew of the change in my circumstances, or had a thought of what was before me. That is a merciful providence for me. All that has happened for the best. She could not help it, and yet I have been so bitter and in such enmity against her. Years passed by. Antony's father died, and strangers lived in the old house. He had seen it once again since then. His rich master sent him journeys on business, and on one occasion his way led him to his native town of Eisenach. The old Wartburg castle stood unchanged on the rock where the monk and the nun were hewn out of the stone. The great oaks formed an outline to the scene which he has so well remembered in his childhood. The Venus mountains stood out grey and bare, overshadowing the valley beneath. He would have been glad to call out, Lady Halley, Lady Halley, unlock the mountain. I would fain remain here always in my native soil. That was a sinful thought, and he offered a prayer to drive it away. Then a little bird in the thicket sang out clearly, and old Anthony thought of the minstrel's song. How much came back to his remembrance as he looked through the tears once more on his native town. The old house was still standing as in olden times, but the garden had been greatly altered. A pathway led through a portion of the ground, and outside the garden and beyond the path stood the old apple tree, which he had not broken down, although he talked of doing so in his trouble. The sun still threw its rays upon the tree, and the refreshing dew fell upon it as of old, and he was so overloaded with fruit that the branches bent towards the earth with a weight. "'That flourishes still,' said he, as he gazed. One of the branches of the tree had, however, been broken. Mischievous hands must have done this in passing, for the tree now stood in a public thoroughfare. "'The blossoms are often plucked,' said Antony. The fruit is stolen and the branches broken without a thankful thought of their profusion and beauty. It might be said of a tree, as it has been said of some men. It was not predicted at his cradle that he should come to this. How brightly began the history of this tree! And what is it now? Forsaken and forgotten in a garden by a hedge in a field close to the public road. There it stands, unsheltered, plundered, and broken. It certainly has not yet withered, but in the course of years the number of blossoms from time to time will grow less, and at last it will cease altogether to bear fruit, and then its history will be over. Such were Antony's thoughts, as he stood under the tree, and during many a long night as he lay in his lonely chamber in the wooden house in Heusian Street, Copenhagen, in the foreign land to which the rich merchant of Bremen, his employer, had sent him on condition that he should never marry. Marry! Ha! <laughs> ha! And he laughed bitterly to himself at the thought. Winter one year set in early, 
and it was freezing hard. Without a snowstorm made every one remain at home who could do so. Thus it happened that Antony's neighbors who lived opposite to him did not notice that his house remained unopened for two days, and that he had not showered himself during that time, for who would go out in such weather unless he were obliged to do so? They were grey, gloomy days, and in the house whose windows were not glass, twilight and dark nights reigned in turns. During these two days old Antony had not left his bed, he had not the strength to do so. The bitter weather had for some time affected his limbs. There lay the old bachelor, forsaken by all and unable to help himself. He could scarcely reach the water-jug that he had placed by his bed, and the last drop was gone. It was not fever nor sickness, but old age that had laid him low. In the little corner where his bed lay, he was overshadowed, as it were, by a perpetual night. A little spider, which he could, however, not see, busily and cheerfully spun its web above him, so that there should be a kind of little banner waving over the old man when his eyes closed. The time passed slowly and painfully. He had no tears to shed, he felt no pain. No thought of Molly came into his mind. He felt as if the world was nothing to him, as if he were lying beyond it, with no one to think of him. Now and then he felt slight sensations of hunger and thirst, but no one came to him, no one tended him. He thought of all those who had once suffered from starvation, of Saint Elizabeth, who once wandered on the earth, the saint of his home and his childhood, the noble Duchess of Thuringia, that highly esteemed lady who visited the poorest villages, bringing hope and relief to the sick inmates. The recollection of her pious deeds was as light to the soul of poor Antony. He thought of her as she went about speaking words of comfort, binding up the wounds of the afflicted and feeding the hungry, although often blamed for it by her stern husband. He remembered a story told of her that on one occasion when she was carrying a basket full of wine and provisions, her husband, who had watched her footsteps, stepped forward and asked her angrily what she carried in her basket, whereupon, with fear and trembling, she answered, "'Roses, which I have plucked from the garden!' Then he tore away the cloth which covered the basket, and what could equal the surprise of the pious woman to find that by miracle everything in her basket, the wine, the bread, had all been changed into roses. In this way the memory of the kind lady dwelt in the calm mind of Antony. She was a living reality in his little dwelling in the Danish land. He uncovered his face that he might look into her gentle eyes, while everything around him changed from its look of poverty and want to a bright rose tint. The fragrance of roses spread through the room, mingled with the sweet smell of apples. He saw the branches of an apple tree spreading above him. It was the tree which he and Molly had planted together. The fragrant leaves of the tree fell upon him and cooled his burning brow. Upon his parched lips they seemed like refreshing bread and wine, and as they rested on his breast a peaceful calm stole over him and he felt inclined to sleep. "'I shall sleep now.' He whispered to himself, Sleep will do me good. In the morning I shall be upon my feet again, strong and well, glorious, wonderful. That apple tree planted in love now appears before me in heavenly beauty. And he slept. The following day, the third day during which his house had been closed, the snowstorm ceased. Then his opposite neighbor stepped over to the house in which old Antony lived, for he had not yet showed himself. There he lay stretched on his bed, dead, with his old nightcap tightly clasped in his two hands. The nightcap, however, was not placed on his head in his coffin. 
He had a clean white one on then. Where now were the tears he had shed? What had become of those wonderful pearls? They were in the nightcap still. Such tears as these cannot be washed out, even when the nightcap is forgotten. The old thoughts and dreams of a bachelor's nightcap still remain. Never wish for such a nightcap. It would make your forehead hot, cause your pulse to beat with agitation, and conjure up dreams which would appear realities. The first who wore old Anthony's cap felt the truth of this, though it was half a century afterwards. That man was the mayor himself, who had already made a comfortable home for his wife and eleven children by his industry. The moment he put the cap on he dreamt of unfortunate love, of bankruptcy, and of dark days. "'Hello, how the nightcap burns!' he exclaimed, as he tore it from his head. Then a pearl rolled out, and then another, and another, and they glittered and sounded as they fell. What can this be? Is it paralysis, or something dazzling my eyes? They were the tears which old Anthony had shed half a century before. To every one who afterwards put this cap on his head came visions and dreams which agitated him not a little. His own history was changed into that of Anthony till it became quite a story and many stories might be made by others, so we will leave them to relate their own. We have told the first, and our last word is, don't wish for a bachelor's nightcap. End of The Old Bachelor's Nightcap Recording by Caroline Kleberg, Berlin, Germany Section 14 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Something by Hans Christian Andersen, 1858. I mean to be somebody and do something useful in the world, said the eldest of five brothers. I don't care how humble my position is, so that I can only do some good, which will be something. I intend to be a brickmaker, bricks are always wanted, and I shall be really doing something. Your something is not enough for me, said the second brother. What you talk of doing is nothing at all. It is journeyman's work or might even be done by a machine. No, I shall prefer to be a builder at once. There is something real in that. A man gains a position, he becomes a citizen, has his own sign, his own house of call for his workmen. So I shall be a builder. If all goes well, in time I shall become a master and have my own journeyman, and my wife will be treated as a master's wife. This is what I call something. I call it all nothing, said the third, not in reality any position. There are many in a town far above a master builder in position. You may be an upright man, but even as a master you will only be ranked among common men. I know better what to do than that. I will be an architect, which will place me among those who possess riches and intellect, and who speculate in art. I shall certainly have to rise by my own endeavours from a bricklayer's labourer, or a carpenter's apprentice, a lad wearing a paper cap, although I now wear a silk hat. I shall have to bear beer and spirits for the journeymen, and they will call me thou, which will be an insult. I shall endure it, however, for I shall look upon it all as a mere representation, a masquerade, a mummery, which to-morrow, that is, when I myself as a journeyman, shall have served my time, will vanish, and I shall go my way and all that has passed will be nothing to me. Then I shall enter the academy and get instructed in drawing, and be called an architect. 
I may even attain to rank and have something placed before or after my name, and I shall build as others have done before me. By this there will be always something to make me remembered, and is that not worth living for? Not in my opinion, said the fourth. I will never follow the lead of others, and only imitate what they have done. I will be a genius, and become greater than all of you together. I will create a new style of building, and introduce a plan for erecting houses suitable to the climate, with material easily obtained in the country, and thus suit national feeling and the developments of the age, besides building a story for my own genius. But supposing the climate and the material are not good for much, said the fifth brother, that would be very unfortunate for you, and have an influence over your experiments. Nationality may assert itself until it becomes affectation, and the developments of a century may run wild, as youth often does. I see clearly that none of you will ever really be anything worth notice. However, you may now fancy it, but do as you like. I shall not imitate you. I mean to keep clear of all these things and criticize what you do. In every action something imperfect may be discovered, something not right, which I shall make it my business to find out and expose. That will be something, I fancy. And he kept his word and became a critic. People said of this fifth brother, there is something very precise about him. He has a good headpiece, but he does nothing, and on that very account they thought he must be something. Now you see, this is a little history which will never end. As long as the world exists, there will always be men like these five brothers. And what became of them? Were they each nothing or something? You shall hear. It is quite a history. The eldest brother, he who fabricated bricks, soon discovered that each brick, when finished, brought him in a small coin, if only a copper one, and many copper pieces, if placed one upon another, can be changed into a shining shilling and at whatever door a person knocks who has a number of these in his hands whether it be the bakers the butchers or the tailors the door flies open and he can get all he wants so you see the value of bricks some of the bricks however crumbled to pieces or were broken but the elder brother found a use for even these on the high bank of earth which formed a dike on the sea coast a poor woman named margaret wished to build herself a house so all the imperfect bricks were given to her, and a few whole ones with them, for the eldest brother was a kind-hearted man, although he never achieved anything higher than making bricks. The poor woman built herself a little house. It was small and narrow, and the window was quite crooked, the door too low, and the straw roof might have been better thatched. But still it was a shelter, and from within you could look far over the sea, which dashed wildly against the sea wall on which the little house was built. The salt waves sprinkled their white foam over it, but it stood firm, and remained long after he who had given the bricks to build it was dead and buried. The second brother, of course, knew better how to build than poor Margaret, for he served an apprenticeship to learn it. When his time was up, he packed up his knapsack and went on his travels, singing the journeyman's song. While young I can wander without a care, and build new houses everywhere. Fair and bright are my dreams of home, always thought of wherever I roam. Hooray for a workman's life of glee, there's a loved one at home who thinks of me. Home and friends I never forget, and I mean to be a master yet. And that is what he did. On his return home he became a master builder, built one house after another in the town till they formed quite a street, which when finished became really an ornament to the town. These houses built a house for him in return, which was to be his own. But how can houses build a house? If the houses were asked, they could not answer, but the people would understand and say, certainly the street built his house for him. It was not very large, and the floor was of lime, but when he danced with his bride on the lime-covered floor, it was to him white and shining, and from every stone in the wall flowers seemed to spring forth and decorate the room as with the richest tapestry. It was really a pretty house, and in it were a happy pair. The flag of the corporation fluttered before it, and the journeymen and apprentices shouted, Hooray! He had gained his position, he had made himself something, and at last he died, which was something too. 
Now we come to the architect, the third brother, who had been first a carpenter's apprentice, had worn a cap, and served as an errand boy, but afterwards went to the academy in Rosen to be an architect, a high and noble gentleman. Ah, yes, the houses of the new street, which the brother who was a master builder erected, may have built his house for him, but the street received its name from the architect, and the handsomest house in the street became his property. That was something, and he was something, for he had a list of titles before and after his name. His children were called well-born, and when he died his widow was treated as a lady of position, and that was something. His name remained always written at the corner of the street, and lived in everyone's mouth as its name. Yes, this also was something. And what about the genius of the family, the fourth brother, who wanted to invent something new and original? He tried to build a lofty story himself, but it fell to pieces, and he fell with it and broke his neck. However, he had a splendid funeral with the city flags and music in the procession. Flowers were strewn on the pavement, and three orations were spoken over his grave, each one longer than the other. He would have liked this very much during his life, as well as the poems about him in the papers, for he liked nothing so well as to be talked of. A monument was also erected over his grave. It was only another story over him, but that was something. Now he was dead like the three other brothers. The youngest, the critic, outlived them all, which was quite right for him. It gave him the opportunity of having the last word, which to him was of great importance. People always said he had a good headpiece. At last his hour came and he died, and arrived at the gates of heaven. Souls always enter those gates in pairs, so he found himself standing and waiting for admission with another. And who should it be but old Dame Margaret from the house on the dyke? It is evidently for the sake of contrast that I and this wretched soul should arrive here exactly at the same time, said the critic. Pray, who are you, my good woman? said he. Do you want to get in here too? And the old woman curtsied as well as she could, and thought it must be St. Peter himself who spoke to her. I am a poor old woman, she said, without my family. I am old Margaret, that lived in the house on the dyke. Well, and what have you done? What great deed have you performed down below? I have done nothing at all in the world that could give me a claim to have these doors open for me, she said. It would be only through mercy that I can be allowed to slip in through the gate. In what manner did you leave the world, he asked, just for the sake of saying something, for it made him feel very weary to stand there and wait. How I left the world, she replied. Why, I can scarcely tell you. During the last years of my life I was sick and miserable, and I was unable to bear creeping out of bed suddenly into the frost and cold. Last winter was a hard winter, but I have got over it all now. There were a few mild days, as your honour no doubt knows. The ice lay thickly on the lake, as far one could see. The people came from the town and walked upon it, and they say they were dancing and skating upon it, I believe, and a great feasting. The sound of beautiful music came into my poor little room where I lay. Towards evening, when the moon rose beautifully, though not yet in her full splendour, I glanced from my bed over the wide sea, and there, just where the sea and sky met, rose a curious white cloud. I lay looking at the cloud till I observed a little black spot in the middle of it, which gradually grew larger and larger, and then I knew what it meant. I am old and experienced, and although this token is not often seen, I knew it, and a shuddering seized me. Twice in my life I had seen the same thing, and I knew that there would be an awful storm with a spring tide, which would overwhelm the poor people who were now out on the ice, drinking, dancing, and making merry. Young and old, the whole city were there. Who was to warn them, if no one noticed the sign or knew what it meant, as I did? I was so alarmed that I felt more strength and life than I had done for some time. I got out of bed and reached the window. I could not crawl any further from weakness and exhaustion, but I managed to open the window. I saw the people outside running and jumping about on the ice. I saw the beautiful flags waving in the wind. I heard the boys shouting, Hooray! and the lads and lasses singing, and everything full of merriment and joy. But there was the white cloud with the black spot hanging over them. I cried out as loudly as I could, but no one heard me. I was too far off from the people. 
Soon would the storm burst, the ice break, and all who were on it be irretrievably lost. They could not hear me, and to go to them was quite out of my power. Oh, if I could only get them safe on land! Then came the thought, as if from heaven, that I would rather set fire to my bed and let the house be burnt down than that so many people would perish miserably. I got a light, and in a few moments the red flames leaped up as a beacon to them. I escaped, fortunately, as far as the threshold of the door, but there I fell down and remained. I could go no further. The flames rushed out towards me, flickered on the window, and rose high above the roof. The people on the ice became aware of the fire and ran as fast as possible to help a poor sick woman who, as they thought, was being burnt to death. There was not one who did not run. I heard them coming, and I also at the same time was conscious of a rush of air and a sound like the roar of heavy artillery. The spring flood was lifting the ice covering, which broke into a thousand pieces, but the people had reached the sea wall, where the sparks were flying round. I had saved them all, but I suppose I could not survive the cold and fright, so I came up here to the gates of paradise. I am told they are open to poor creatures such as I am, and I have now no house left on earth, but I do not think that will give me a claim to be admitted here. Then the gates were opened, and an angel led the old woman in. She had dropped one little straw out of her straw bed, when she set it on fire to save the lives of so many. It had been changed into the purest gold, into gold that constantly grew and expanded into flowers and fruit of immortal beauty. See, said the angel, pointing to the wonderful straw, this is what the poor woman has brought. What dost thou bring? I know thou hast accomplished nothing, not even made a single brick. Even if thou couldst return, and at least produce so much, very likely when made, the brick would be useless unless done with a good will, which is always something, but thou canst not return to earth, and I can do nothing for thee. Then the poor soul, the old mother who had lived in the house on the dyke, pleaded for him. She said, His brother made all the stone and bricks and sent them to me to build my poor little dwelling, which was a great deal to do for a poor woman like me. Could not all these bricks and pieces be as a wall of stone to prevail for him? It is an act of mercy. He is wanting it now, and here is the very fountain of mercy. Then, said the angel, thy brother, he who has been looked upon as the meanest of you all, he whose honest deed to thee appeared so humble, it is he who has sent you this heavenly gift. Thou shalt not be turned away. Thou shalt have permission to stand without the gate and reflect, and repent of thy life on earth. But thou shalt not be admitted here until thou hast performed one good deed of repentance, which will indeed for thee be something. I could have expressed that better, thought the critic, but he did not say it aloud, which for him was something after all. End of section 14 Recording by Claire Section 15 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul The Last Dream of the Old Oak In the forest, high up on the steep shore, and not far from the open sea coast, stood a very old oak tree. It was just three hundred and sixty-five years old, but that long time was to the tree as the same number of days might be to us. We wake by day and sleep by night, and then we have our dreams. It is different with the tree. It is obliged to keep awake through three seasons of the year, and does not get any sleep till winter comes. Winter is its time for rest. It's night after a long day of spring, summer, and autumn. On many a warm summer, the ephemera, the flies that exist for only a day, 
had fluttered about the old oak, enjoyed life and felt happy, and if, for a moment, one of the tiny creatures rested on one of his larger fresh leaves, the tree would always say, Poor little creature, your whole life consists only of a single day. How very short. It must be quite melancholy. Melancholy? What do you mean? The little creature would always reply. Everything around me is so wonderfully bright and warm and beautiful that it makes me joyous. But only for one day, and then it is all over. Over? repeated the fly. What is the meaning of all over? Are you all over too? No, I shall very likely live for thousands of your days, and my day is whole seasons long. Indeed, it is so long that you could never reckon it out. No? Then I don't understand you. You may have thousands of days, but I have thousands of moments in which I can be merry and happy. Does all the beauty of the world cease when you die? No, replied the tree. It will certainly last much longer, infinity longer than I can even think of. Well then, said the little fly, we have the same time to live, only we reckon differently. And the little creature danced and floated in the air, rejoicing in her delicate wings of gauze and velvet, rejoicing in the balmy breezes laden with the fragrance of clover fields and wild roses elder blossoms and honeysuckle from the garden hedges wild thyme primroses and mint and the scent of all this was so strong that the perfume almost intoxicated the little fly the long and beautiful day had been so full of joy and sweet delights that when the sun sunk low it felt tired of all its happiness and enjoyment its wings could sustain it no longer and gently and slowly it glided down upon the soft waving blades of grass, nodded its little head as well as it could nod, and slept peacefully and sweetly. The fly was dead. Poor little ephemera, said the oak, what a terribly short life! And so, on every summer day, the dance was repeated, the same questions asked and the same answers given. The same thing was continued, through many generations of ephemera, all of them felt equally merry and equally happy. The oak remained awake through the morning of spring, the noon of summer, and the evening of autumn. Its time of rest, its night drew nigh, winter was coming. Already the storms were singing, Good night, good night. Here fell a leaf, and there fell a leaf. We will rock you and lull you. Go to sleep, go to sleep. We will sing you to sleep and shake you to sleep, and it will do your old twigs good. They will even crackle with pleasure. Sleep sweetly, sleep sweetly. It is your three hundred and sixty-fifth night. Correctly speaking, you are but a youngster in the world. Sleep sweetly. The clouds will drop snow upon you, which will be quite a coverlid, warm and sheltering to your feet sweet sleep to you and pleasant dreams and there stood the oak stripped of all its leaves left to rest during the whole of a long winter and to dream many dreams of events that had happened in its life as in the dreams of men the great tree had once been small indeed in its cradle it had been an acorn According to human compilation, it was now in the fourth century of its existence. It was the largest and best tree in the forest. Its summit towered above all the other trees, and could be seen far out at sea, so that it served as a landmark to the sailors. It had no idea how many eyes looked eagerly for it. In its topmost branches, the wood pigeon built her nest, and the cuckoo carried out his usual vocal performances, and his well-known notes echoed amid the boughs, and in the autumn, when the leaves looked like beaten copper plates, the birds of passage would come and rest upon the branches, before taking their flight across the sea. But now it was winter, the tree stood leafless, so that everyone could see how crooked and bent were the branches that sprang forth from the trunk. Crows and rooks came by turns and sat on them, and talked of the hard times which were beginning, 
and how difficult it was in winter to obtain food. It was just about Holy Christmas time that the tree dreamed a dream. The tree had, doubtless, a kind of feeling that the festive time had arrived, and in his dream fancied he heard the bells ringing from all the churches round, and yet it seemed to him to be a beautiful summer's day, mild and warm. His mighty summits was crowned with spreading fresh green foliage, the sunbeams played among the leaves and branches, and the air was full of fragrance from herb and blossom. Painted butterflies chased each other. The summer flies danced around him, as if the world had been created merely for them to dance and be merry in. All that had happened to the tree during every year of his life seemed to pass before him, as in a festive procession. He saw the knights of olden times, and noble ladies ride by through the wood on their gallant steeds, with plumes waving in their hats and falcons on their wrists. The hunting horn sounded and the dogs barked. He saw hostile warriors, in coloured dresses and glittering armour, with spear and halberd, pitching their tents and anon striking them. The watchfires again blazed, and men sang and slept under the hospital shelter of the tree. He saw lovers meet in quiet happiness near him in the moonshine, and carve the initials of their names in the greyish-green bark on his trunk. Once, but long years had intervened since then, guitars and aeolian harps had been hung on his boat by merry travellers. Now they seemed to hang there again, and he could hear their marvellous tones. The wood pigeons cooed, as if to explain the feelings of the tree, and the cuckoo called out to tell him how many summer days he had yet to live. Then it seemed as if new life was thrilling through every fibre of root and stem and leaf, rising even to the highest branches. The tree felt itself stretching and spreading out, while through the root beneath the earth ran the warmth vigour of life. As he grew higher and still higher, with increased strength, his topmost boughs became broader and fuller, and in proportion to his growth, so was his self-satisfaction increased, and with it arose a joyous longing to grow higher and higher, to reach even to the warm bright sun itself. Already had his topmost branches pierced the clouds, which floated beneath them like troops of birds of passage, or large white swans. Every leaf seemed gifted with sight, as if it possessed eyes to see. The stars became visible in broad daylight, large and sparkling, like clear and gentle eyes. They recalled to the memory the well-known look in the eyes of a child, or in the eyes of lovers who had once met beneath the branches of the old oak. These were wonderful and happy moments for the old tree, full of peace and joy. And yet, amidst all this happiness, the tree felt a yearning, longing desire, that all the other trees, bushes, herbs, and flowers beneath him might be able also to rise higher, as he had done, and to see all this splendour and experience the same happiness. The grand majestic oak could not be quite happy in the midst of his enjoyment, while all the rest, both great and small, were not with him. And this feeling of yearning trembled through every branch, through every leaf, as warmly and fervently, as if they had been the fibres of a human heart. The summit of the tree waved to and fro, and bent downward, as if in his silent longing he sought for something. Then there came to him the fragrance of thyme, followed by the more powerful scent of honeysuckle and violets, and he fancied he heard the note of the cuckoo. At length his longing was satisfied. Up through the clouds came the green summits of the forest trees, and beneath him the oak saw them rising and growing higher and higher. Bush and herb shot upward, and some even tore themselves up by the roots to rise more quickly. The birch tree was the quickest of all, like lightning flash, the slender stem shot upwards in a zigzag line, the branches spreading around it like green gorse and banners. Every native of the wood, even the brown and feathery rushes, grew with the rest, while the birds ascended with a melody of song. On a blade of grass that fluttered in the air like a long green ribbon, 
sat a grasshopper cleaning his wings with his legs. May beetles hummed, the bees murmured, the birds sang, each in his own way. The air was filled with the sounds of song and gladness. But where is the little blue flower that grows by the water? asked the oak, and the purple bell flower, and the daisy. You see, the oak wanted to have them all with him. Here we are, we are here, sounded in voice and song. But the beautiful thyme of last summer, where is that? And the lilies of the valley, which last year covered the earth with their bloom, and the wild apple tree with its lovely blossoms, and all the glory of the wood, which has flourished year after year, even what may have but now sprouted forth could be with us. We are here, we are here! sounded voices higher in the air, as if they had flown there beforehand. "'Why, this is beautiful, too beautiful to be believed,' said the oak in a joyful tone. "'I have them all here, both great and small. Not one has been forgotten. Can such happiness be imagined?' It seemed almost impossible. "'In heaven, with the eternal God, it can be imagined, and it is possible.' sounded the reply through the air. And the old tree, as it still grew upwards and onwards, felt that his roots were loosening themselves from the earth. "'It is right so, it is best,' said the tree. "'No fetters hold me now. I can fly up to the very highest point in light and glory, and all I love are with me, both small and great. All, all are here.' Such was the dream of the old oak, and while he dreamed, a mighty storm came rushing over land and sea at the holy Christmas time. The sea rolled in great billows towards the shore. There was a cracking and crushing heard in the tree. The root was torn from the ground just at the moment when in his dream he fancied it was being loosened from the earth. He fell. His three hundred and sixty-five years were passed as the single day of the ephema. On the morning of Christmas Day, when the sun rose, the storm had ceased. From all the churches sounded the festive bells, and from every hearth, even of the smallest hut, rose the smoke into the blue sky, like the smoke from the festive thank-offerings on the druid's altars. The sea gradually became calm, and on board a great ship that had withstood the tempest during the night, all the flags were displayed as a token of joy and festivity. "'The tree's down! The old oak, our landmark on the coast!' exclaimed the sailors. "'It must have fallen in the storm of last night. Who can replace it? Alas, no one!' This was a funeral oration over the old tree. Short, but well meant. There it lay, stretched on the snow-covered shore, and over it sounded the notes of a song from the ship, a song of Christmas joy, and of the redemption of the soul of man, and of eternal life through Christ's atoning blood. Sing aloud on the happy morn, all is fulfilled, for Christ is born. With songs of joy let us loudly sing, Hallelujahs to Christ our King. Thus sounded the old Christmas carol, and every one aboard the ship felt his thoughts elevated through the song and the prayer. Even as the old tree had felt lifted up by its last, its beautiful dream on that Christmas morn. End of the last dream of the old oak. Section 16 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. THE MARSH KING'S DAUGHTER PART One. 
the storks relate to their little ones a great many stories and they are all about moors and reed banks and suited to their age and capacity the youngest of them are quite satisfied with cribble crabble or such nonsense and think it very grand but the elder ones want something with a deeper meaning or at least something about their own family we are only acquainted with one of the two longest and oldest stories which the storks relate it is about moses who was exposed by his mother on the banks of the nile and was found by the king's daughter who gave him a good education and he afterwards became a great man but where he was buried is still unknown every one knows this story but not the second very likely because it is quite an inland story it has been repeated from mouth to mouth from one stork mamma to another for thousands of years and each had told it better than the last and now we mean to tell it better than all the first stork pair who related it lived at the time it happened and had their summer residence on the rafters of the vikings footnote sea kings or pirates of the north end footnote house which stood near the wild moorlands of wencesle that is to speak more correctly the great moor heath high up in the north of jutland by the scoggin peak this wilderness is still an immense wild heath of marshy ground about which we can read in the official directory it is said that in olden times the place was a lake the ground of which had heaved up from beneath and now the moorland extends for miles in every direction and is surrounded by damp meadows trembling undulating swamps and marshy ground covered with turf on which grow bilberry bushes and stunted trees mists are almost always hovering over this region which seventy years ago was overrun with wolves it may well be called the wild moor and one can easily imagine with such a wild expanse of marsh and lake how lonely and dreary it must have been a thousand years ago many things may be noticed now that existed then the reeds grow to the same height and bear the same kind of long purple-brown leaves with their feathery tips there still stands the birch with its white bark and its delicate loosely hanging leaves and with regard to the living beings who frequented this spot the fly still wears a gauzy dress of the same cut and the favorite colors of the stork are white with black and red for stockings the people certainly in those days wore very different dresses to those they now wear but if any of them be he huntsman or squire master or servant ventured on the wavering undulating marshy ground of the moor they met with the same fate a thousand years ago as they would now the wanderer sank and went down to the marsh king as he is named who rules in the great moorland empire beneath they also called him gunkle king but we like the name of marsh king better and we will give him that name as the storks do very little is known of the marsh king's rule but that perhaps is a good thing in the neighborhood of the moorlands and not far from the great arm of the north sea and the cataget which is called the lymph jordan lay the castle of the viking with its watertight stone cellars its tower and its three projecting stories on the ridge of the roof the stork had built his nest and there the stork mamma sat on her eggs and felt sure her hatching would come to something one evening stork papa stayed out rather late and when he came home he seemed quite busy bustling and important i have something very dreadful to tell you said he to the stork mamma keep it to yourself then she replied remember that i am hatching eggs it may agitate me and will affect them you must know it at once said he the daughter of our host in egypt has arrived here she has ventured to take this journey and now she is lost she who sprung from the race of the fairies is it cried the mother stork oh tell me all about it you know i cannot bear to be kept waiting at a time when i am hatching eggs well you see mother he replied she believed what the doctor said and what i have heard you state also that the more flowers which grow about here would heal her sick father and she has flown to the north in swan's plumage in company with some other swan princesses who come to these parts every year to renew their youth she came and where is she now you enter into particulars too much said the mamma stork and the eggs may take cold i cannot bear such suspense as this well said he i have kept watch and this evening i went among the rushes where i thought the marshy ground would bear me and while i was there three swans came something in their manner of flying seemed to say to me look carefully now there is one not all swan only swan's feathers you know mother you have the same intuitive feeling that i have you know whether a thing is right or not immediately yes of course said she but tell me about the princess i am tired of hearing about the swan's feathers 
well you know that in the middle of the moor there is something like a lake said the stork papa you can see the edge of it if you raise yourself a little just there by the reeds and the green banks lay the trunk of an elder tree upon this the three swans stood flapping their wings and looking about them one of them threw off her plumage and i immediately recognized her as one of the princesses of our home in egypt there she sat without any covering but her long black hair i heard her tell the two others to take great care of the swan's plumage while she dipped down into the water to pluck the flowers which she fancied she saw there the others nodded and picked up the feather dress and took possession of it i wonder what will become of it thought i and she most likely asked herself the same question if so she received an answer a very practical one for the two swans rose up and flew away with her swan's plumage dive down now they cried thou shalt never more fly in the swan's plumage thou shalt never again see egypt here on the moor thou wilt remain so saying they tore the swan's plumage into a thousand pieces the feathers drifted about like a snow shower and then the two deceitful princesses flew away why that is terrible said the stork mamma i feel as if i could hardly bear to hear any more but you must tell me what happened next the princess wept and lamented aloud her tears moistened the elder stump which was really not an elder stump but the marsh king himself he who in marshy ground lives and rules i saw myself how the stump of the tree turned round and was a tree no more while long clammy branches like arms were extended from it then the poor child was terribly frightened and started up to run away she hastened to cross the green slimy ground but it will not bear any weight much less hers she quickly sank and the elder stump dived immediately after her in fact it was he who drew her down great black bubbles rose up out of the moor slime and with these every trace of the two vanished and now the princess is buried in the wild marsh she will never now carry flowers to egypt to cure her father it would have broken your heart mother had you seen it you ought not have told me said she at such a time as this the eggs might suffer but i think the princess will soon find help some one will rise up to help her ah if it had been you or i or one of our people it would have been all over with us i mean to go every day said he to see if anything comes to pass and so he did a long time went by but at last he saw a green stalk shooting out of the deep marshy ground as it reached the surface of the marsh a leaf spread out and unfolded itself broader and broader and close to it came forth a bud one morning when the stork papa was flying over the stem he saw that the power of the sun's rays had caused the bud to open and in the cup of the flower lay a charming child a little maiden looking as if she had just come out of a bath the little one was so like the egyptian princess that the stork at the first moment thought it must be the princess herself but after a little reflection he decided that it was much more likely to be the daughter of the princess and the marsh king and this explained also her being placed in the cup of a water lily but she cannot be left to lie here thought the stork and in my nest there are already so many but stay i have thought of something the wife of the viking has no children and how often she has wished for a little one people always say the stork brings the little ones i will do so in earnest this time i shall fly with the child to the viking's wife what rejoicing there will be and then the stork lifted the little girl out of the flower cup flew to the castle picked a hole with his beak in the bladder covered window and laid the beautiful child in the bosom of the viking's wife then he flew back quickly to the stork mamma and told her what he had seen and done and the little storks listened to it all for they were then quite old enough to do so so you see he continued that the princess is not dead for she must have sent her little one up here and now i have found a home for her ah i said it would be so from the first replied the stork mamma but now think a little of your own family our travelling time draws near and i sometimes feel a little irritation already under the wings the cuckoos and the nightingale are already gone and i heard the quail say they should go too as soon as the wind was favourable our youngsters will go through all the manoeuvres at the review very well or i am much mistaken in them the viking's wife was above measure delighted when she awoke the next morning and found the beautiful child lying in her bosom she kissed it and caressed it but it cried terribly and struck out with its arms and legs and did not seem to be pleased at all at last it cried itself to sleep and as it lay there so still and quiet it was a most beautiful sight to see the viking's wife was so delighted that body and soul were full of joy her heart felt so light within her that it seemed as if her husband and his soldiers who were absent must come home as suddenly and unexpectedly as the little child had done 
she and her whole household therefore busied themselves in preparing everything for the reception of her lord the long coloured tapestry on which she and her maidens had worked pictures of their idols odin thor and frigga was hung up the slaves polished the old shields that served as ornaments cushions were placed on the seats and dry wood laid in the fireplace in the centre of the hall so that the flames might be fanned up at a moment's notice the viking's wife herself assisted in the work so that at night she felt very tired and quickly fell into a sound sleep when she awoke just before morning she was terribly alarmed to find that the infant had vanished she sprang from her couch lighted a pine chip and searched all round the room when at last in that part of the bed where her feet had been lay not the child but a great ugly frog she was quite disgusted at this sight and seized a heavy stick to kill the frog but the creature looked at her with such strange mournful eyes that she was unable to strike the blow once more she searched round the room then she started at hearing the frog utter a low painful croak she sprang from the couch and opened the window hastily at the same moment the sun rose and threw its beams through the window till it rested on the couch where the great frog lay suddenly it appeared as if the frog's broad mouth contracted and became small and red the limbs moved and stretched out and extended themselves till they took a beautiful shape and behold there was the pretty child lying before her and the ugly frog was gone how is this she cried have i had a wicked dream is it not my own lovely cherub that lies there then she kissed it and fondled it but the child struggled and fought and bit as if she had been a little wild cat the viking did not return on that day nor the next he was however on the way home but the wind so favourable to the storks was against him for it blew toward the south a wind in favour of one is often against the other after two or three days had passed it became clear to the viking's wife how matters stood with the child it was under the influence of a powerful sorcerer by day it was charming in appearance as an angel of light but with a temper wicked and wild while at night in the form of an ugly frog it was quiet and mournful with eyes full of sorrow here were two natures changing inwardly and outwardly with the absence and return of sunlight and so it happened that by day the child with the actual form of its mother possessed the fierce disposition of its father at night on the contrary its outward appearance plainly showed its descent on the father's side while inwardly it had the heart and mind of its mother who would be able to loosen this wicked charm which the sorcerer had worked upon it the wife of the viking lived in constant pain and sorrow about it her heart clung to the little creature but she could not explain to her husband the circumstances in which it was placed he was expected to return shortly and were she to tell him he would very likely as was the custom at that time expose the poor child in the public highway and let any one take it away who would the good wife of the viking could not let that happen and she therefore resolved that the viking should never see the child excepting by daylight one morning there sounded a rushing of storks wings over the roof more than a hundred pair of storks had rested there during the night to recover themselves after their excursion and now they soared aloft and prepared for the journey southward all the husbands are here and ready they cried wives and children also how light we are screamed the young storks in chorus something pleasant seems creeping over us even down to our toes as if we were full of live frogs ah how delightful it is to travel in foreign lands hold yourselves properly in the line with us cried papa and mamma do not use your beak so much it tries the lungs and then the storks flew away about the same time sounded the clang of the warriors trumpets across the heath the viking had landed with his men they were returning home richly laden with spoil from the gallic coast where the people as did also the inhabitants of britain often cried in alarm deliver us from the wild northmen life and noisy pleasure came with them into the castle of the viking on the moorland a great cask of mead was drawn into the hall piles of wood blazed cattle were slain and served up that they might feast in reality the priest who offered the sacrifice sprinkled the devoted parishioners with the warm blood the fire crackled and the smoke rolled along beneath the roof the soot fell upon them from the beams but they were used to all these things guests were invited and received handsome presents all wrongs and unfaithfulness were forgotten they drank deeply and threw in each other's faces the bones that were left which was looked upon as a sign of good feeling amongst them a bard who was a kind of musician as well as a warrior and who had been with the viking in his expedition and knew what to sing about gave them one of his best songs in which they heard all their warlike deeds praised and every wonderful action brought forth with honor every verse ended with this refrain golden possessions will flee away friends and foes must die one day every man on earth must die but famous name will never die 
and with that they beat upon their shields and hammered upon the table with knives and bones in a most outrageous manner the viking's wife sat upon a raised cross seat in the open hall she wore a silk dress golden bracelets and large amber beads she was in costly attire and the bard named her in his song and spoke of the rich treasure of gold which she had brought to her husband her husband had already seen the wonderfully beautiful child in the daytime and was delighted with her beauty even her wild ways pleased him he said the little maiden would grow up to be a heroine with the strong will and determination of a man she would never wink her eyes even if in joke an expert hand should attempt to cut off her eyebrows with a sharp sword the full cask of mead soon became empty and a fresh one was brought in for these were people who liked plenty to eat and drink the old proverb which every one knows says that the cattle know when to leave their pasture but a foolish man knows not the measure of his own appetite yes they all knew this but men may know what is right and yet often do wrong they also knew that even the welcome guest becomes wearisome when he sits too long in the house but there they remained for pork and mead are good things and so at the viking's house they stayed and enjoyed themselves and at night the bondmen slept in the ashes and dipped their fingers in the fat and licked them oh it was a delightful time once more in the same year the viking went forth though the storms of autumn had already commenced to roar he went with his warriors to the coast of britain he said that it was but an excursion of pleasure across the water so his wife remained at home with the little girl after a while it is quite certain the foster mother began to love the poor frog with its gentle eyes and its deep sighs even better than the little beauty who bit and fought with all around her the heavy damp mists of autumn which destroyed the leaves of the wood had already fallen upon forest and heath feathers of plucked birds as they call snow flew about in thick showers and winter was coming the sparrows took possession of the stork's nest and conversed about the absent owners in their own fashion and they the stork pair and all their young ones where were they staying now the storks might have been found in the land of egypt where the sun's rays shone forth bright and warm as it does here at midsummer tamarinds and acacias were in full bloom all over the country the crescent of mahomet glittered brightly from the cupolas of the mosques and on the slender pinnacles sat many of the storks resting after their long journey swarms of them took divided possession of the nests nests which lay close to each other beneath the venerable columns and crowded the arches of the temples in forgotten cities the date and the palm lifted themselves as a screen or as a sunshade over them the gray pyramids looked like broken shadows in the clear air and the far-off desert where the ostrich wheels his rapid flight and the lion with his subtle eyes gazes at the marble sphinx which lies half buried in the sand the waters of the nile had retreated and the whole bed of the river was covered with frogs which was a most acceptable prospect for the stork families the young storks thought their eyes deceived them everything around appeared so beautiful it is always like this here and this is how we live in our warm country said the stork mamma and the thought made the young ones almost beside themselves with pleasure is there anything more to see they asked are we going farther into the country there is nothing farther for us to see answered the stork mamma beyond this delightful region there are immense forests where branches of the trees entwine round each other while prickly creeping plants cover the paths and only an elephant could force a passage for himself with his great feet the snakes are too large and the lizards too lively for us to catch then there is the desert if you went there your eyes would soon be full of sand with the lightest breeze and if it should blow great guns you would most likely find yourself in a sand drift here is the best place for you where there are frogs and locusts here i shall remain and so must you and so they stayed the parents sat in the nest on the slender minaret and rested yet still were busily employed in cleaning and smoothing their feathers and in sharpening their beaks against their red stockings then they would stretch out their necks salute each other and gravely raise their heads with the high polished forehead and soft smooth feathers while their brown eyes shone with intelligence the female young ones strutted about amidst the moist rushes glancing at the other young storks and making acquaintances and swallowing a frog at every third step or tossing a little snake about with their beaks in a way they considered very becoming and besides it tasted very good the young male storks soon began to quarrel they struck at each other with their wings and pecked with their beaks till the blood came and in this manner many of the young ladies and gentlemen were betrothed to each other it was of course what they wanted and indeed what they lived for then they returned to a nest and there the quarrelling began afresh for in hot countries people are almost all violent and passionate but for all that it was pleasant especially for the old people who watched them with great joy all that their young ones did suited them 
Every day here there was sunshine, plenty to eat, and nothing to think of but pleasure. But in the rich castle of their Egyptian host, as they called him, pleasure was not to be found. The rich and mighty lord of the castle lay on his couch in the midst of the great hall with its many-colored walls looking like the center of a great tulip, but he was stiff and powerless in all his limbs and lay stretched out like a mummy. His family and servants stood round him. He was not dead, although he could scarcely be said to live. The healing moor-flower from the north, which was to have been found and brought to him by her who loved him so well, had not arrived. His young and beautiful daughter, who in swan's plumage had flown over land and seas to the distant north, had never returned. She is dead, so the two swan maidens had said when they came home, and they made up quite a story about her, and this is what they told. We three flew away together through the air, said they. A hunter caught sight of us and shot at us with an arrow. The arrow struck our young friend and sister, and slowly singing her farewell song, she sank down, a dying swan, into the forest lake. On the shores of the lake, under a spreading birch tree, we laid her in the cold earth. We had our revenge. We bound fire under the wings of a swallow, who had a nest on the thatched roof of the huntsman. The house took fire and burst into flames. The hunter was burned with the house, and the light was reflected over the sea as far as the spreading birch, beneath which we laid her sleeping dust. She will never return to the land of Egypt. And then they both wept, and Stork Papa, who heard the story, snapped with his beak so that it might be heard a long way off. Deceit and lies, cried he, I should like to run my beak deep into their chests. And perhaps break it off, said the mamma Stork, then what a sight you would be. Think first of yourself, and then of your family. All others are nothing to us. Yes, I know, said the stork papa, but to-morrow I can easily place myself on the edge of the open cupola when the learned and wise men assemble to consult on the state of the sick man. Perhaps they may come a little nearer to the truth. And the learned and wise men assembled together and talked a great deal on every point, but the stork could make no sense out of anything they said, neither were there any good results from their consultations, either for the sick man or for his daughter in the marshy heath. When we listen to what people say in this world, we shall hear a great deal, but it is an advantage to know what has been said and done before when we listen to a conversation. The stork did, and we know at least as much as he, the stork. Love is a life-giver. The highest love produces the highest life. Only through love can the sick man be cured. This had been said by many, and even the learned men acknowledged that it was a wise saying. What a beautiful thought, exclaimed the Papa Stork immediately. I don't quite understand it, said the Mama Stork when her husband repeated it. However, it is not my fault, but the fault of the thought, whatever it may be. I have something else to think of. Now the learned men had spoken also of love between this one and that one, of the difference of the love which we have for our neighbor to the love that exists between parents and children, of the love of the plant for the light, and how the germ springs forth when the sunbeam kisses the ground. All these things were so elaborately and learnedly explained that it was impossible for Stork Papa to follow it, much less to talk about it. His thoughts on the subject quite weighed him down. He stood the whole of the following day on one leg, with half-shut eyes, thinking deeply. So much learning was quite a heavy weight for him to carry. One thing, however, the Papa Stork could understand. Every one, high and low, had from their inmost hearts expressed their opinion that it was a great misfortune for so many thousands of people, the whole country indeed, to have this man so sick, with no hopes of his recovery. And what joy and blessing it would spread around if he could by any means be cured. But where bloomed the flower that could bring him help? They had searched for it everywhere, in learned writings, in the shining stars, in the weather and wind. Inquiries had been made in every byway that could be thought of, until at last the wise and learned men has asserted, as we have already been told, that love the life-giver could alone give new life to a father. And in saying this they had overdone it, and said more than they understood themselves. They repeated it and wrote it down as a recipe. Love is a life-giver. But how could such a recipe be prepared? That was a difficulty they could not overcome. At last it was decided that help could only come from the princess herself, whose whole soul was wrapped up in her father, especially as a plan had been adopted by her to enable her to obtain a remedy. End of the Marsh King's Daughter, Part 1《セクション17》of Hans Christian Andersen《Fairy Tales and Short Stories》Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Marsh King's Daughter, Part 2. More than a year had passed since the princess had set out at night, when the light of the young moon was soon lost beneath the horizon. She had gone to the marble sphinx in the desert, shaking the sand from her sandals, and then passed through the long passage, which leads to the center of one of the great pyramids, where the mighty kings of antiquity, surrounded with pomp and splendor, lie veiled in the form of mummies. She had been told by the wise men that if she laid her hand on the breast of one of them, from the head she would learn where to find life and recovery for her father. She had performed all this, and in a dream had learnt that she must bring home to her father the lotus flower, which grows in the deep sea, near the moors and the heath in the Danish land. The very place and situation had been pointed out to her, and she was told that the flower would restore her father to health and strength and therefore she had gone forth from the land of egypt flying over to the open marsh and the wild moor in the plumage of a swan the papa and mamma storks knew all this and we also know it now we know too that the marsh king has drawn her down to himself and that to the loved ones at home she is forever dead one of the wisest of them said as the stork mamma also said that in some way she would after all manage to succeed and so at last they comforted themselves with this hope and would wait patiently in fact they could do nothing better i should like to get away the swan's feathers from those two treacherous princesses said the papa stork then at least they would not be able to fly over again to the wild moor and do more wickedness i can hide the two suits of feathers over yonder till we find some use for them but where will you put them asked the mamma stork in our nest on the moor I and the young ones will carry them by turns during our flight across, and as we return, should they prove too heavy for us, we shall be sure to find plenty of places on the way in which we can conceal them until our next journey. Certainly one suit of swan's feathers would be enough for the princess, but two are always better. In those northern countries no one can have too many traveling wrappers. No one will thank you for it, said the stork mamma, but you are master, and excepting at breeding time, I have nothing to say. In the Viking's castle on the wild moor, to which the storks directed their flight in the following spring, the little maiden still remained. They had named her Helga, which was rather too soft a name for a child with a temper like hers, although her form was still beautiful. Every month this temper showed itself in sharper outlines, and in the course of years, while the storks still made the same journeys in autumn to the hill, and in spring to the moors, the child grew to be almost a woman and before any one seemed aware of it she was a wonderfully beautiful maiden of sixteen the casket was splendid but the contents were worthless she was indeed wild and savage even in those hard uncultivated times it was a pleasure to her to splash about with her white hands in the warm blood of the horse which had been slain for sacrifice in one of her wild moods she bit off the head of the black cock which the priest was about to slay for the sacrifice to her foster father she said one day if thine enemy were to pull down thine house about thy ear and thou shouldst be sleeping in unconscious security i would not wake thee even if i had the power i would never do it for my ears still tingle with the blow that thou gavest me years ago i have never forgotten it but the viking treated her words as a joke he was like everyone else bewitched with her beauty and knew nothing of the change in the form and temper of helga at night Without a saddle, she would sit on a horse as if she were a part of it, while it rushed along at full speed. Nor would she spring from its back, even when it quarreled with other horses and bit them. She would often leap from the high shore into the sea with all her clothes on, and swim to meet the Viking, when his boat was steering home towards the shore. She once cut off a long lock of her beautiful hair, and twisted it into a string for her bow. If a thing is to be done well, said she, I must do it myself. The Viking's wife was, for the first time in which she lived, a woman of strong character and will, but compared to her daughter she was a gentle, timid woman, and she knew that a wicked sorcerer had the terrible child in his power. It was sometimes as if Helga acted from sheer wickedness, for often when her mother stood on the threshold of the door, or stepped into the yard, she would seat herself on the brink of the well, wave her arms and legs in the air, and suddenly fall right in. Here she was able, from her frog nature, to dip and dive about in the water of the deep well, until at last she would climb forth like a cat, and come back into the hall, dripping with water, 
so that the green leaves that were strewn on the floor were whirled around and carried away by the streams that flowed from her but there was one time of the day which placed a check upon helga it was the evening twilight when this hour arrived she became quiet and thoughtful and allowed herself to be advised and led then also a secret feeling seemed to draw her towards her mother and as usual when the sun set and the transformation took place both in body and mind inwards and outwards she would remain quiet and mournful with her form shrunk together in the shape of a frog her body was much larger than those animals ever are and on this account it was much more hideous in appearance for she looked like a wretched dwarf with a frog's head and webbed fingers her eyes had a most piteous expression she was without a voice excepting a hollow croaking sound like the smothered sobs of a dreaming child then the viking's wife took her on her lap and forgot the ugly form as she looked into the mournful eyes and often said i could wish that thou wouldst always remain my dumb frog child for thou art too terrible when thou art clothed in a form of beauty and the viking woman wrote runic characters against sorcery and spells of sickness and threw them over the wretched child but they did no good one can scarcely believe she was ever small enough to lie in the cup of the water lily said the papa stork and now she has grown up and the image of her egyptian mother especially about the eyes ah we shall never see her again perhaps she has not discovered how to help herself as you and the wise men said she would year after year i have flown across and across the moor but there was no sign of her still being alive yes and i may as well tell you that each year when i arrived a few days before you to repair the nest and put everything in its place i have spent a whole night flying here and there over the marshy lake as if i had been an owl or a bat but all to no purpose the two suit of swan's plumage which i and the young ones dragged over here from the land of the nile are of no use trouble enough it was to us to bring them here in three journeys and now they are lying at the bottom of the nest and if a fire should happen to break out and the wooden house be burnt down they would be destroyed and our good nest would be destroyed too said the mamma stork but you think less of that than of your plumage stuff and your moor princess go and stay with her in the marsh if you like you are a bad father to your own children as i have told you already when i hatched my first brood i only hope neither we nor our children may have an arrow sent through our wings owing to that wild girl helga does not know in the least what she is about we have lived in this house longer than she has she should think of that and we have never forgotten our duty we have paid every year our toll of a feather an egg and a young one as it is only right we should do you don't suppose i can wander about the courtyard or go everywhere as i used to do in old times i can do it in egypt where i can be a companion of the people without forgetting myself but here i cannot go and peep into the pots and kettles as i do there no i can only sit up here and feel angry with that girl that little wretch and i am angry with you too you should have left her lying in the water lily then no one would have known anything about her you are far better than your conversation said the papa stork i know you better than you know yourself and with that he gave a hop and flapped his wings twice proudly then he stretched his neck and flew or rather soared away without moving his outspread wings he went on for some distance and then he gave a great flap with his wings and flew on his course at a rapid rate his head and neck bending proudly before him while the sun's rays fell on his glossy plumage he is the handsomest of them all said the mamma stork as she watched him but i won't tell him so early in the autumn the viking again returned home laden with spoil and bringing prisoners with him among them was a young christian priest one of those who condemned the gods of the north often lately there had been both in hall and chamber a talk of the new faith which was spreading far and wide in the south and which through the means of the holy ansgarius had already reached as far as hedeby on the schlee even helga had heard of this belief in the teachings of the one who was named christ and who for the love of mankind and for their redemption had given up his life but to her all this had as it were gone in one ear and out the other it seemed that she only understood the meaning of the word love when in the form of a miserable frog she crouched together in the corner of the sleeping chamber but the viking's wife had listened to the wonderful story and had felt herself strangely moved by it on their return after this voyage the men spoke of the beautiful temples built of polished stone which had been raised for the public worship of this holy love some vessels curiously formed of massive gold had been brought home among the booty there was a peculiar fragrance about them all for they were incense vessels which had been swung before the altars in the temples by christian priests in the deep stony cellars of the castle the young christian priest was immured and his hands and feet tied together with strips of bark 
the viking's wife considered him as beautiful as baldur and his distress raised her pity but helga said he ought to have ropes fastened to his heels and be tied to the tails of wild animals i would let the dogs loose after him she said over the moor and across the heath hurrah that would be a spectacle for the gods and better still to follow in its course but the viking would not allow him to die such a death as that especially as he was the disowned and despiser of the high gods in a few days he had decided to have him offered as a sacrifice on the bloodstone in the grove for the first time a man was to be sacrificed here helga begged to be allowed to sprinkle the assembled people with the blood of the priest she sharpened her glittering knife and when one of the great savage dogs who were running about the viking's castle in great numbers sprang toward her she thrust the knife into his side merely as she said to prove its sharpness the viking's wife looked at the wild badly disposed girl with great sorrow and when night came on and her daughter's beautiful form and disposition were changed she spoke in eloquent words to helga of the sorrow and of deep grief that was in her heart the ugly frog in its monstrous shape stood before her and raised its brown mournful eyes to her face listening to her words and seeming to understand them with the intelligence of a human being never once to my lord and husband has a word passed my lips of what i have to suffer through you my heart is full of grief about you said the viking's wife the love of a mother is greater and more powerful than i ever imagined but love never entered thy heart it is cold and clammy like the plants on the moor then the miserable form trembled it was as if these words had touched an invisible bond between body and soul for great tears stood in the eyes a better time will come for thee at last continued the viking's wife and it will be terrible for me too it had been better for thee if thou hadst been left on the high road with the cold night wind to lull thee to sleep and the viking's wife shed bitter tears and went away in anger and sorrow passing under the partition of firs which hung loose over the beam and divided the hall the shrivel frog still sat in the corner alone deep silence reigned around at intervals a half-stifled sigh was heard from its inmost soul it was the soul of helga it seemed in pain as if a new life were arising in her heart then she took a step forward and listened then stepped again forward and seized with her clumsy hands the heavy bar which was laid across the door gently and with much trouble she pushed back the bar as silently lifted the latch and then took up the glimmering lamp which stood in the antechamber of the hall it seemed as if a stronger will than her own gave her strength she removed the iron bolt from the closed cellar door and slipped in to the prisoner he was slumbering she touched him with her cold moist hand and as he awoke and caught sight of the hideous form he shuddered as if he beheld a wicked apparition she drew her knife cut through the bonds which confined his hands and feet and beckoned him to follow her he uttered some holy names and made the sign of the cross while the form remained motionless by his side who art thou he asked whose outward appearance is that of an animal while thou willingly performest acts of mercy the frog figure beckoned him to follow her and led him through a long gallery concealed by hanging drapery to the stables and then pointed to a horse he mounted upon it and she sprang up also before him and held tightly by the animal's mane the prisoner understood her and they rode on at a rapid trot by a road which he would never have found by himself across the open heath he forgot her ugly form and only thought how the mercy and loving-kindness of the almighty was acting through this hideous apparition as he offered pious prayers and sang holy songs of praise she trembled was it the effect of prayer and praise that caused this or was she shuddering in the cold morning air at the thought of approaching twilight what were her feelings she raised herself up and wanted to stop the horse and spring off but the christian priest held her back with all his might and then sang a pious song as if this could loosen the wicked charm that had changed her into the semblance of a frog and the horse galloped on more wildly than before the sky painted itself red the first sunbeam pierced through the clouds and in the clear flood of sunlight the frog became changed it was helga again young and beautiful but with a wicked demoniac spirit he held now a beautiful young woman in his arms and he was horrified at the sight he stopped the horse and sprang from its back he imagined that some new sorcery was at work but helga also leaped from the horse and stood on the ground the child's short garment reached only to her knee she snatched the sharp knife from her girdle and rushed like lightning at the astonished priest let me get at thee she cried let me get at thee that i may plunge this knife into thy body thou art pale as ashes thou beardless slave she pressed in upon him they struggled with each other in heavy combat but it was as if an invisible power had been given to the christian in the struggle he held her fast and the old oak under which they stood seemed to help him for the loosened roots on the ground became entangled in the maiden's feet and held them fast 
close by rose a bubbling spring and he sprinkled helga's face and neck with the water commanded the unclean spirit to come forth and pronounced upon her a christian blessing but the water of faith has no power unless the wellspring of faith flows within and yet even here its power was shown something more than the mere strength of a man opposed itself through his means against the evil which struggled within her his holy action seemed to overpower her she dropped her arms glanced at him with pale cheeks and looks of amazement he appeared to her a mighty magician skilled in secret arts his language was the darkest magic to her and the movement of his hands in the air were as the secret signs of a magician's wand she would not have blinked had he waved over her head a sharp knife or a glittering axe but she shrunk from him as he signed her with the sign of the cross on her forehead and breast and sat before him like a tame bird with her head bowed down then he spoke to her in gentle words of the deed of love she had performed for him during the night when she had come to him in the form of an ugly frog to loosen his bonds and to lead him forth to life and light and he told her that she was bound in closer fetters than he had been and that she could recover also life and light by his means he would take her to hedeby footnote now the city of sleswig and footnote to st ansgarius and there in that christian town the spell of the sorcerer would be removed but he would not let her sit before him on the horse though of her own free will she wished to do so thou must sit behind me not before me said he thy magic beauty has a magic power which comes from an evil origin and i fear it still i am sure to overcome through my faith in christ then he knelt down and prayed with pious fervor it was as if the quiet woodland were a holy church consecrated by his worship the birds sang as if they were also of this new congregation and the fragrance of the wild flowers was as the ambrosial perfume of incense while above all sounded the words of scripture a light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide their feet into the way of peace and he spoke these words with the deep longing of his whole nature meanwhile the horse that had carried them in wild career stood quietly by plucking at the tall bramble bushes till the ripe young berries fell down upon helga's hand as if inviting her to eat patiently she allowed herself to be lifted on the horse and sat there like a somnambulist as one who walked in his sleep the christian bound two branches together with bark in the form of a cross and held it on high as they rode through the forest the way gradually grew thicker of brushwood as they rode along till at last it became a trackless wilderness bushes of the wild slow here and there blocked up the path so that they had to ride over them the bubbling spring formed not a stream but a marsh round which also they were obliged to guide the horse still there were strength and refreshment in the cool forest breeze and no trifling power in the gentle words spoken in faith and christian love by the young priest whose inmost heart yearned to lead this poor lost one into the way of light and life it is said that raindrops can make a hollow in the hardest stone and the waves of the sea can smooth and round the rough edges of the rocks so did the dew of mercy fall upon helga softening what was hard and smoothing what was rough in her character these effects did not yet appear she was not herself aware of them neither does the seed in the lap of earth know when the refreshing dew and the warm sunbeams fall upon it that it contains within itself power by which it will flourish and bloom the song of the mother sinks into the heart of the child and the little one prattles the words after her without understanding their meaning but after a time the thoughts expand and what has been heard in childhood seems to the mind clear and bright so now the word which is all-powerful to create was working in the heart of helga they rode forth from the thick forest crossed the heath and again entered a pathless wood here towards evening they met with robbers where hast thou stolen that beauteous maiden cried the robbers seizing the horse by the bridle and dragging the two riders from its back the priest had nothing to defend himself with but the knife he had taken from helga and with this he struck out right and left one of the robbers raised his axe against him but the young priest sprang on one side and avoided the blow which fell with great force on the horse's neck so that the blood gushed forth and the animal sank to the ground then helga seemed suddenly to awake from her long deep reverie she threw herself hastily upon the dying animal the priest placed himself before her to defend and shelter her but one of the robbers swung his iron axe against the christian's head with such force that it was dashed to pieces the blood and brains were scattered about and he fell dead upon the ground then the robber seized beautiful helga by her white arms and slender waist but at that moment the sun went down and as its last ray disappeared she was changed into the form of a frog a greenish white mouth spread half over her face her arms became thin and slimy while broad hands with webbed fingers spread themselves out like fans 
then the robbers in terror let her go and she stood among them a hideous monster and as is the nature of frogs to do she hopped up as high as her own size and disappeared into the thicket then the robbers knew that this must be the work of an evil spirit or some sort of sorcery and in a terrible fright they ran hastily from the spot the full moon had already risen and was shining in all her radiant splendor over the earth when from the thicket in the form of a frog crept poor helga she stood still by the corpse of the christian priest and the carcass of the dead horse she looked at them with eyes that seemed to weep and from the frog's head came forth a croaking sound as when a child bursts into tears she threw herself first upon one and then upon the other brought water in her hand which from being webbed was large and hollow and poured it over them but they were dead and dead they would remain she understood that at last soon wild animals would come and tear their dead bodies but no that must not happen then she dug up the earth as deep as she was able that she might prepare a grave for them she had nothing but a branch of a tree in her two hands between the fingers of which the web skin stretched and they were torn by the work while the blood ran down her hands she saw at last that her work would be useless more than she could accomplish so she fetched more water and washed the face of the dead and then covered it with fresh green leaves she also brought large boughs and spread over him and scattered dry leaves between the branches then she brought the heaviest stones that she could carry and laid them over the dead body filling up the crevices with moss till she thought she had fenced in his resting place strongly enough the difficult task had employed her the whole night and as the sun broke forth there stood the beautiful helga in all her loveliness with her bleeding hands and for the first time with tears on her maiden cheeks it was in this transformation as if two natures were striving together within her her whole frame trembled and she looked around her as if she had just awoke from a painful dream she leaned for support against the trunk of a slender tree and at last climbed to the topmost branches like a cat and seated herself firmly upon them she remained there the whole day sitting alone like a frightened squirrel in the silent solitude of the wood where the rest and stillness is as the calm of death butterflies fluttered around her and close by were several ant hills each with its hundreds of busy little creatures moving quickly to and fro in the air danced myriads of gnats swarm upon swarm troops of buzzing flies ladybirds dragonflies with golden wings and other little winged creatures the worm crawled forth from the moist ground and the moles crept out but excepting these all around had the stillness of death but when people say this they do not quite understand themselves what they mean none noticed helga but a flock of magpies which flew chattering round the top of the tree on which she sat these birds hopped close to her on the branches with bold curiosity a glance from her eyes was a signal to frighten them away and they were not clever enough to find out who she was indeed she hardly knew herself when the sun was near setting and the evening's twilight about to commence the approaching transformation aroused her to fresh exertion she let herself down gently from the tree and as the last sunbeam vanished she stood again in the wrinkled form of a frog with the torn web skin on her hands but her eyes now gleamed with more radiant beauty than they had ever possessed in her most beautiful form of loveliness they were now pure mild maidenly eyes that shone forth in the face of a frog they showed the existence of deep feeling and a human heart and the beauteous eyes overflowed with tears weeping precious drops that lightened the heart on the raised mound which she had made as a grave for the dead priest she found the cross made of the branches of a tree the last work of him who now lay dead and cold beneath it a sudden thought came to helga and she lifted up the cross and planted it upon the grave between the stones that covered him and the dead horse the sad recollection brought the tears to her eyes and in this gentle spirit she traced the same sign in the sand round the grave and as she formed with both her hands the sign of the cross the web skin fell from them like a torn glove she washed her hands in the water of the spring and gazed with astonishment at their delicate whiteness again she made the holy sign in the air between herself and the dead man her lips trembled her tongue moved and the name which she in her ride through the forest had so often heard spoken rose to her lips and she uttered the words jesus christ then the frog skin fell from her she was once more a lovely maiden her head bent wearily her tired limbs required rest her sleep however was short towards midnight she awoke before her stood the dead horse prancing and full of life which shone forth from his eyes and from his wounded neck close by his side appeared the murdered christian priest the more beautiful than baldor as the viking's wife had said but now he came as if in a flame of fire such gravity such stern justice such a piercing glance shone from his large gentle eyes that it seemed to penetrate into every corner of her heart 
beautiful helga trembled at the look and her memory returned with a power as if it had been the day of judgment every good deed that had been done for her every loving word that had been said were vividly before her mind she understood now that love had kept her here during the day of her trial while the creature formed of dust and clay soul and spirit had wrestled and struggled with evil she acknowledged that she had only followed the impulses of an evil disposition that she had done nothing to cure herself everything had been given her and all had happened as it were by the ordination of providence she bowed herself humbly confessed her great imperfections in the sight of him who can read every fault of the heart and then the priest spoke daughter of the moorland thou hast come from the swamp and the marshy earth but from this thou shalt arise the sunlight shining into thy inmost soul proves the origin from which thou hast really sprung and has restored the body to its natural form i am come to thee from the land of the dead and thou also must pass through the valley to reach the holy mountains where mercy and perfection dwell i cannot lead thee to hedeby that thou mayest receive christian baptism for first thou must remove the thick veil with which the waters of the moorland are shrouded and bring forth from its depths the living author of thy being and thy life till this is done thou canst not receive consecration then he lifted her on the horse and gave her a golden censer similar to those she had already seen at the viking's house a sweet perfume rose from it while the open wound in the forehead of the slain priest shone with the rays of a diamond he took the cross from the grave and held it aloft and now they rode through the air over the rustling trees over the hills where warriors lay buried each by his dead war horse and the brazen monumental figures rose up and galloped forth and stationed themselves on the summits of the hills the golden crescent on their foreheads fastened with golden knots glittered in the moonlight and their mantles floated in the wind the dragon that guards buried treasure lifted his head and gazed after them the goblins and the satyrs peeped out from beneath the hills and flitted to and fro in the fields waving blue red and green torches like the glowing sparks in burning paper over woodland and heath flood and fen they flew on till they reached the wild moor over which they hovered in broad circles the christian priest held the cross aloft and it glittered like gold while from his lips sounded pious prayers beautiful helga's voice joined with his in the hymns he sung as a child joins in her mother's song she swung the censer and a wonderful fragrance of incense arose from it so powerful that the reeds and rushes of the moor burst forth into blossom each germ came forth from the deep ground all that had life raised itself blooming water lilies spread themselves forth like a carpet of wrought flowers and upon them lay a slumbering woman young and beautiful helga fancied that it was her own image she saw reflected in the still water but it was her mother she beheld the wife of the marsh king the princess from the land of the nile end of section 17section 18 of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume 4 1854 to 1859 by hans christian andersen translated by h p paul the marsh king's daughter Part three. The dead Christian priest desired that the sleeping woman should be lifted on the horse, but the horse sank beneath the load as if he had been a funeral pall fluttering in the wind. But the sign of the cross made the airy phantom strong, and then the three rode away from the marsh to firm ground. At the same moment the cock crew in the Viking's castle, and the dream figures dissolved and floated away in the air, but mother and daughter stood opposite to each other am i looking at my own image in the deep water said the mother is it myself that i see represented on a white shield cried the daughter then they came nearer to each other in a fond embrace the mother's heart beat quickly and she understood the quickened pulses my child she exclaimed the flower of my heart my lotus flower of the deep water and she embraced her child again and wept and the tears were as a baptism of new life and love for helga in swan's plumage i came here said the mother and here i threw off my feather dress then i sank down through wavering ground deep into the marsh beneath which closed like a wall around me i found myself after a while in fresher water still a power drew me down deeper and deeper i felt the weight of sleep upon my eyelids then i slept and dreams hovered round me 
It seemed to me as if I were again in the pyramids of Egypt, and yet the wavering elder trunk that had frightened me on the moor stood ever before me. I observed the clefts and wrinkles in the stem. They shone forth in strange colors, and took the form of hieroglyphics. It was the mummy case on which I gazed. At last it burst, and forth stepped the thousand years old king, the mummy form, black as pitch, black as the shining wood snail, or the slimy mud of the swamp. Whether it was really the mummy or the marsh king, I know not. He seized me in his arms, and I felt as if I must die. When I recovered myself, I found in my bosom a little bird flapping its wings, twittering and fluttering. The bird flew away from my bosom, upwards towards the dark, heavy canopy above me, but a long green band kept it fastened to me. I heard and understood the tenor of its longings. Freedom! Sunlight! To my father! Then I thought of my father, and the sunny land of my birth, my life, and my love. Then I loosened the band, and let the bird fly away to its home, to a father. Since that hour I have ceased to dream. My sleep has been long and heavy, till in this very hour harmony and fragrance awoke me and set me free. The green band which fastened the wings of the bird to the mother's heart, where did it flutter now? Whither had it been wafted? The stork only had seen it. The band was the green stalk, the cup of the flower, the cradle in which lay the child, that now in blooming beauty had been folded to the mother's heart. And while the two were resting in each other's arms, the old stark flew round and round them in narrowing circles, till at length he flew away swiftly to his nest, and fetched away the two suits of swan's feathers, which he had preserved there for many years. Then he returned to the mother and daughter, and threw the swan's plumage over them. The feathers immediately closed around them, and they rose up from the earth in the form of two white swans. And now we can converse with pleasure, said the stork papa. We can understand one another, although the beaks of birds are so different in shape. It is very fortunate that you came tonight. Tomorrow we should have been gone. The mother, myself, and the little ones were about to fly to the south. Look at me now. I am an old friend from the Nile, and a mother's heart contains more than her beak. She always said that the princess would know how to help herself. I and the young ones carry the swan's feathers over here, and I am glad of it now, and how lucky it is that I am here still. When the day dawns, we shall start with a great company of other storks. We'll fly first, and you can follow in our track, so that you cannot miss your way. I and the young ones will have an eye upon you. And the lotus flower which I was to take with me, said the Egyptian princess, is flying here by my side, clothed in swan's feathers. The flower of my heart will travel with me, and so the riddle is solved. Now for home, now for home. But Helga said she could not leave the Danish land without once more seeing her foster mother, the loving wife of the Viking. Each pleasing recollection, each kind word, every tear from the heart which her foster mother had wept for her, rose in her mind, and at that moment she felt as if she loved this mother the best. "'Yes, we must go to the Viking's castle,' said the stork. "'Mother and the young ones are waiting for me there. How they will open their eyes and flap their wings. My wife, you see, does not say much. She is short and abrupt in her manner, but she means well for all that. I will flap my wings at once, that they may hear us coming.' Then Stork Papa flapped his wings in the first-rate style, and he and the swans flew away to the Viking's castle. In the castle everyone was in a deep sleep. It had been late in the evening before the Viking's wife retired to rest. She was anxious about Helga, who three days before had vanished with the Christian priest. Helga must have helped him in this flight, for it was her horse that was missed from the stable. But by what power had all this been accomplished? The Viking's wife thought of it with wonder, thought on the miracles which they said could be performed by those who believed in the Christian faith and followed its teachings. These passing thoughts formed themselves into a vivid dream, and it seemed to her that she was still lying awake on her couch while without darkness reigned. A storm arose, she heard the lake dashing and rolling from east to west like the waves of the North Sea or the Cattegat. The monstrous snake which, it is said, surrounds the earth in the depths of the ocean was trembling in spasmodic convulsions. The night of the fall of the gods was come. Ragnarok, as the heathens called the judgment day, when everything shall pass away, even the high gods themselves. The war trumpet sounded, riding upon the rainbow, came the gods, clad in steel, to fight their last battle on the last battlefield. Before them flew the winged vampires, and the dead warriors closed up the train. The whole firmament was ablaze with the northern lights, and yet the darkness triumphed. It was a terrible hour. 
and close to the terrified woman helga seemed to be seated on the floor in the hideous form of a frog yet trembling and clinging to her foster mother who took her on her lap and lovingly caressed her hideous and frog-like as she was the air was filled with the clashing of arms and the hissing of arrows as if a storm of hail was descending upon the earth it seemed to her the hour when earth and sky would burst asunder and all things would be swallowed up in saturn's fiery lake but she knew that a new heaven and a new earth would arise and that cornfields would wave where now the lake rolled over desolate sands and the ineffable god reign then she saw rising from the region of the dead balder the gentle the loving and as the viking's wife gazed upon him she recognized his countenance it was the captive christian priest white christian she exclaimed aloud and with the word she pressed a kiss on the forehead of the hideous frog child then the frog skin fell off and helga stood before her in all her beauty more lovely and gentle looking and with eyes beaming with love she kissed the hands of her foster mother blessed her for all her fostering love and care during the days of her trial and misery for the thought she had suggested and awoke in her heart and for naming the name which she now repeated then beautiful helga rose as a mighty swan and spread her wings with the rushing sound of troops of birds of passage flying through the air then the viking's wife awoke but she still heard the rushing sound without she knew it was the time for the storks to depart and that it must be their wings which she heard she felt she should like to see them once more and bid them farewell she rose from her couch stepped out on the threshold and beheld on the ridge of the roof a party of storks ranged side by side troops of the birds were flying in circles over the castle and the highest trees but just before her as she stood on the threshold and close to the well where helga had so often sat and alarmed her with her wildness now stood two swans gazing at her with intelligent eyes then she remembered her dream which still appeared to her as a reality she thought of helga in the form of a swan she thought of a christian priest and suddenly a wonderful joy arose in her heart the swans flapped their wings and arched their necks as if to offer her a greeting and the viking's wife spread out her arms toward them as if she accepted it and smiled through her tears she was roused from deep thought by a rustling of wings and snapping of beaks all the storks arose and started on their journey towards the south we will not wait for the swans said the mamma stork if they want to go with us let them come now we can't sit here till the plovers start it is a fine thing after all to travel in families not like the finches and the partridges there the male and the female birds fly in separate flocks which to speak candidly i consider very unbecoming what are those swans flapping their wings for well everyone flies in his own fashion said the papa stork the swans fly in an oblique line the cranes in the form of a triangle and the plovers in a curved line like a snake don't talk about snakes while we are flying up here said stork mamma it puts ideas into the children's heads that cannot be realized are those the high mountains i have heard spoken of asked helga in the swan's plumage they are the storm clouds driving along beneath us replied her mother what are yonder white clouds that rise so high again inquired helga those are the mountains covered with the perpetual snows that you see yonder said her mother and then they flew across the alps toward the blue mediterranean africa's land egyptia's strand sang the daughter of the nile in her swan's plumage as from the upper air she caught sight of her native land a narrow golden wavy strip on the shores of the nile the other birds espied it also and hastened their flight i can smell the nile mud and the wet frogs said the stork mamma and i begin to feel quite hungry yes now you shall taste something nice and you will see the marabout bird and the ibis and the crane they all belong to our family but they are not nearly so handsome as we are they give themselves great airs especially the ibis the egyptians have spoiled him they make a mummy of him and stuff him with spices i would rather be stuffed with live frogs and so would you and so you shall better have something in your inside while you are alive than to be made a parade of after you are dead that is my opinion and i am always right the storks are come was said in a great house on the banks of the nile where the lord lay in the hall on his downy cushions covered with a leopard skin scarcely alive yet not dead waiting and hoping for the lotus flower from the deep moorland in the far north relatives and servants were standing by his couch when the two beautiful swans who had come with the storks flew into the hall they threw off their soft white plumage and two lovely female forms approached the pale sick old man and threw back their long hair and when helga bent over her grandfather redness came back to his cheeks his eyes brightened and life returned to his benumbed limbs the old man rose up with health and energy renewed daughter and grandchild welcomed him as joyfully as if with a morning greeting after a long and troubled dream 
joy reigned through the whole house as well as in the stork's nest although there the chief cause was really the good food especially the quantities of frogs which seemed to spring out of the ground in swarms then the learned men hastened to note down in flying characters the story of the two princesses and spoke of the arrival of the health-giving flower as a mighty event which had been a blessing to the house and the land meanwhile the stork papa told the story to his family in his own way but not till they had eaten and were satisfied otherwise they would have had something else to do than to listen to stories well said the stork mamma when she had heard it you will be made something of at last i suppose they can do nothing less what could i be made said the stork papa what have i done just nothing you have done more than all the rest she replied but for you and the youngsters the two young princesses would never have seen egypt again and the recovery of the old man would not have been effected you will become something they must certainly give you a doctor's hood and our young ones will inherit it and their children after them and so on you already look like an egyptian doctor at least in my eyes i cannot quite remember the words i heard when i listened on the roof said the stork papa while relating the story to his family all i know is that what the wise men said was so complicated and so learned that they received not only rank but presents even the head cook at the great house was honored with a mark of distinction most likely for the soup and what did you receive said the stork mamma they certainly ought not to forget the most important person in the affair as you really are the learned men have done nothing at all but use their tongues surely they will not overlook you late in the night while the gentle sleep of peace rested on the now happy house there was still one watcher it was not stork papa who although he stood on guard on one leg could sleep soundly helga alone was awake she leaned over the balcony gazing at the sparkling stars that shone clearer and brighter in the pure air than they had done in the north and yet they were the same stars she thought of the viking's wife in the wild moorland of the gentle eyes of her foster mother and of the tears she had shed over the poor frog child that now lived in splendor and starry beauty by the watchers of the nile with air balmy and sweet as spring she thought of the love that had dwelt in the breast of the heathen woman love that had been shown to a wretched creature hateful as a human being and hideous when in the form of an animal she looked at the glittering stars and thought of the radiance that had shone forth on the forehead of the dead man as she had fled with him over the woodland and moor tones were awakened in her memory words which she had heard him speak as they rode onward when she was carried wandering and trembling through the air words from the great fountain of love the highest love that embraces all the human race what had not been won and achieved by this love day and night beautiful helga was absorbed in the contemplation of the great amount of her happiness and lost herself in the contemplation like a child who turns hurriedly from the giver to examine the beautiful gifts she was overpowered with her good fortune which seemed always increasing and therefore what might it become in the future had she not been brought by a wonderful miracle to all this joy and happiness and in these thoughts she indulged until at last she thought no more of the giver it was the overabundance of youthful spirits unfolding its wings for a daring flight her eyes sparkled with energy when suddenly arose a loud noise in the court below and the daring thought vanished she looked down and saw two large ostriches running round quickly in narrow circles she had never seen these creatures before great coarse clumsy looking birds with curious wings that looked as if they had been clipped and the birds themselves had the appearance of having been roughly used she inquired about them and for the first time heard the legend which the egyptians relate respecting the ostrich once they say the ostriches were a beautiful and glorious race of birds with large strong wings one evening the other large birds of the forest said to the ostrich brother shall we fly to the river tomorrow morning to drink god willing and the ostrich answered i will with the break of the day therefore they commenced their flight first rising high in the air towards the sun which is the eye of god still higher and higher the ostrich flew far above the other birds proudly approaching the light trusting in its own strength and thinking not of the giver or saying if god will when suddenly the avenging angel drew back the veil from the flaming ocean of sunlight and in a moment the wings of the proud bird were scorched and shriveled and they sunk miserably to the earth since that time the ostrich and his race have never been able to rise in the air they can only fly terror-stricken along the ground or run round and round in narrow circles it is a warning to mankind that in all our thoughts and schemes and in every action we undertake we should say if god will then helga bowed her head thoughtfully and seriously and looked at the circling ostrich as with timid fear and simple pleasure that glanced at its own great shadow on the sunlit walls and the story of the ostrich sunk deeply into the heart and mind of helga 
a life of happiness both in the present and in the future seemed secure for her and what was yet to come might be the best of all god willing early in the spring when the storks were again about to journey northward beautiful helga took off her golden bracelets scratched her name on them and beckoned to the stork father he came to her and she placed the golden circlet round his neck and begged him to deliver it safely to the viking's wife so that she might know that her foster daughter still lived was happy and had not forgotten her it is rather heavy to carry thought stork papa when he had it on his neck but gold and honor are not to be flung into the street the stork brings good fortune they'll be obliged to acknowledge that at last you lay gold and i lay eggs said stork mamma with you it is only once in a way i lay eggs every year but no one appreciates what we do i call it very mortifying but then we have a consciousness of our own worth mother replied stork papa what good will that do you retorted stork mamma it will neither bring you a fair wind nor a good meal the little nightingale who is singing yonder in the tamarind grove will soon be going north too helga said she had often heard her singing in the wild moor so she determined to send a message by her while flying in the swan's plumage she had learnt the bird language she had often conversed with the stork and the swallow and she knew that the nightingale would understand so she begged the nightingale to fly to the beech wood on the peninsula of jutland where a mound of stone and twigs had been raised to form the grave and she begged the nightingale to persuade all the other little birds to build their nests round the place so that evermore should resound over that grave music and song and the nightingale flew away and time flew away also in the autumn an eagle standing upon a pyramid saw a stately train of richly laden camels and men attired in armor on foaming arabian steeds whose glossy skins shone like silver their nostrils were pink and their thick flowing manes hung almost to their slender legs a royal prince of arabia handsome as a prince should be and accompanied by distinguished guests was on his way to the stately house on the roof of which the stork's empty nest might be seen they were away now in the far north but expected to return very soon and indeed they returned on a day that was rich in joy and gladness a marriage was being celebrated in which the beautiful helga glittering in silk and jewels was the bride and the bridegroom the young arab prince bride and bridegroom sat at the upper end of the table between the bride's mother and grandfather but her gaze was not on the bridegroom with his manly sunburnt face round which curled a black beard and whose dark fiery eyes were fixed upon her but away from him at a twinkling star that shone down upon her from the sky then was heard the sound of rushing wings beating the air the storks were coming home and the old stork pair although tired with the journey and requiring rest did not fail to fly down at once to the balustrades of the veranda for they knew already what feast was being celebrated they had heard of it on the borders of the land and also that helga had caused their figures to be represented on the walls for they belonged to her history i call that very sensible and pretty said stork papa yes but it is very little said mamma stork they could not possibly have done less but when helga saw them she rose and went out into the veranda to stroke the backs of the storks the old stork pair bowed their heads and curved their necks and even the youngest among the young ones felt honored by this reception helga continued to gaze upon the glittering star which seemed to glow brighter and purer in its light then between herself and the star floated a form purer than the air and visible through it it floated quite near to her and she saw that it was the dead christian priest who also was coming to her wedding feast coming from the heavenly kingdom the glory and brightness yonder outshines all that is known on earth said he then helga the fair prayed more gently and more earnestly than she had ever prayed in her life before that she might be permitted to gaze if only for a single moment at the glory and brightness of the heavenly kingdom then she felt herself lifted up as it were above the earth through a sea of sound and thought not only around her but within her was there light and song such as words cannot express now we must return he said you will be missed only one more look she begged but one short moment more we must return to earth the guests will have all departed only one more look the last then helga stood again in the veranda but the marriage lamps in the festive hall had all been extinguished and the torches outside had vanished the storks were gone not a guest could be seen no bridegroom all in those few short moments seemed to have died then a great dread fell upon her she stepped from the veranda through the empty hall into the next chamber where slept strange warriors she opened a side door which once led into her own apartment but now as she passed through she found herself suddenly in a garden which she had never before seen here the sky blushed red it was the dawn of morning three minutes only in heaven and a whole night on earth had passed away 
Then she saw the storks and called to them in her own language. Then Stork Papa turned his head towards her, listened to her words, and drew near. You speak our language, said he. What do you wish? Why do you appear, you, a strange woman? It is I. It is Helga. Dost thou not know me? Three minutes ago we were speaking together yonder in the veranda. That is a mistake, said the stork. You must have dreamed all this. No, no, she exclaimed. Then she reminded him of the Viking's castle, of the great lake, and of the journey across the ocean. Then Stork Papa winked his eyes and said, Why, that's an old story which happened in the time of my grandfather. There certainly was a princess of that kind in Egypt once, who came from the Danish land, but she vanished on the evening of her wedding day, many hundred years ago, and never came back. You may read about it yourself yonder, on a monument in the garden. There you will find swans and storks sculptured, and on top is a figure of the Princess Helga in marble. And so it was. Helga understood it all now, and sank on her knees. The sun burst forth in all its glory, as in olden times. The form of the frog vanished in his beams, and the beautiful form stood forth in all its loveliness. So now, bathed in light, rose a beautiful form, purer, clearer than air, a ray of brightness, from the source of light himself. The body crumbled into dust, and a faded lotus flower lay on the spot on which Helga had stood. Now that is a new ending to the story, said Stork Papa. I really never expected it would end in this way, but it seems a very good ending. And what will the young one say to it, I wonder, said Stork Mama. Ah, that is a very important question, replied the Stork. End of section 18「Section 19 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Races A prize, or rather two prizes, a great one and a small one, had been awarded for the greatest swiftness in running. Not in a single race, but for the whole year. I obtain the first prize, said the hare. Justice must still be carried out, even when one has relations and good friends among the prize committee. But that the snail should have received the second prize, I consider almost an insult to myself. No, said the fence rail, who had been a witness at the distribution of prizes, there should be some consideration for industry and perseverance. I have heard many respectable people say so, and I can quite understand it. The snail certainly took half a year to get over the threshold of the door, but he injured himself and broke his collarbone by the haste he made. He gave himself up entirely to the race, and ran with his house on his back, which was all, of course, very praiseworthy, and therefore he obtained the second prize. I think I ought to have had some consideration, too, said the swallow. I should imagine no one can be swifter in soaring in flight than I am. And how far have I been? Far, far away. Yes, that is your misfortune, said the fence rail. You are so fickle, so unsettled. You must always be traveling about into foreign lands when the cold commences here. You have no love of fatherland in you. There can be no consideration for you. But now, if I have been lying the whole winter in the moor said the swallow, and suppose I slept the whole time, would that be taken into account? Bring a certificate from the old moorhen, said he, that you have slept away half your time in fatherland. Then you will be treated with some consideration. I deserve the first prize and not the second, said the snail. I know so much, at least, that the hare only ran from cowardice, and because he thought there was danger in delay. I, on the other hand, made running the business of my life, and have become a cripple in the service. If anyone had a first prize, it ought to have been myself. But I do not understand chattering and boasting. On the contrary, I despise it. And the snail spat at them with contempt. I am able to affirm with word of oath that each prize, at least those for which I voted, was given with just and proper consideration, said the old boundary post in the wood, who was a member of the committee of judges. I always act with due order, consideration, and calculation. Seven times have I already had the honor to be present at the distribution of the prizes, and to vote, but today is the first time I have been able to carry out my will. I always reckon the first prize by going through the alphabet, from the beginning, and the second by going through from the end. B 
be so kind as to give me your attention, and I will explain to you how I reckon from the beginning. The eighth letter from A is H, and there we have H for hair. Therefore, I awarded to the hair the first prize. The eighth letter from the end of the alphabet is S, and therefore the snail received the second prize. Next year, the letter I will have its turn for the first prize, and the letter R for the second. I should really have voted for myself, said the mule, if I had not been one of the judges on the committee. Not only the rapidity with which advance is made, but every other quality should have due consideration, as, for instance, how much weight a candidate is able to draw. But I have not brought this quality forward now, nor the sagacity of the hare in his flight, nor the cunning with which he suddenly springs aside and doubles, to lead people on a false track, thinking he has concealed himself. No, there is something else on which more stress should be laid, and which ought not be left unnoticed. I mean that which mankind called the beautiful. It is on the beautiful that I particularly fix my eyes. I observe the well-grown ears of the hare. It is a pleasure to me to observe how long they are. It seemed as if I saw myself again in the days of my childhood, and so I voted for the hare. Buzz, said the fly, there, I'm not going to make a long speech, but I wish to say something about hares. I have really overtaken more than one hare, when I have been seated on the engine in front of a railway train. I often do so. One can then so easily judge of one's own swiftness. Not long ago I crushed the hind legs of a young hare. He had been running a long time before the engine. He had no idea that I was traveling there. At last he had to stop in his career, and the engine ran over his hind legs and crushed them for I set upon it. I left him lying there and rode on farther. I call that conquering him, but I do not want the prize. It really seems to me, thought the wild rose, though she did not express her opinions aloud, it is not in her nature to do so, though it would have been quite as well if she had. It certainly seems to me that the sunbeam ought to have had the honor of receiving the first prize. The sunbeam flies in a few minutes along the immeasurable path from the sun to us. It arrives in such strength that all nature awakes to loveliness and beauty. We roses blush and exhale fragrance in its presence. Our worshipful judges don't appear to have noticed this at all. Were I the sunbeam, I would give each one of them a sunstroke. But that would only make them mad, and they are mad enough already. I only hope, continued the rose, that peace may reign in the wood. It is glorious to bloom, to be fragrant, and to live. To live in story and in song. The sunbeam will outlive us all. What is the first prize? asked the earthworm, who had overslept the time and only now came up. It contains a free admission to a cabbage garden, replied the mule. I propose that as one of the prizes. The hare most decidedly must have it, and I, as an active and thoughtful member of the committee, took especial care that the prize should be one of advantage to him. So now he is provided for. The snail can now sit on the fence, and lick up moss and sunshine. He has also been appointed one of the first judges of swiftness in racing. It is worth much to know that one of the members is a man of talent in the thing men call a committee. I must say I expect much in the future. We have already made such a good beginning. End of the Races Section 20 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. Translated by H. P. Paul. THE PHILOSOPHER'S STONE Far away towards the east, in India, which seemed in those days the world's end, stood the tree of the sun, a noble tree such as we have never seen, and perhaps never may see. The summit of this tree spread itself for miles like an entire forest, each of its smaller branches forming a complete tree. Palms, beech trees, pines, plane trees, and various other kinds which are found in all parts of the world were here like small branches shooting forth from the great tree, while the larger boughs with their knots and curves formed valleys and hills, 
clothed with velvety green and covered with flowers. Everywhere it was like a blooming meadow or a lovely garden. Here were birds from all quarters of the world assembled together, birds from the primeval forests of America, from the rose gardens of Damascus, and from the deserts of Africa, in which the elephant and the lion may boast of being the only rulers. Birds from the polar regions came flying here, and, of course, the stork and the swallow were not absent. But the birds were not the only living creatures. There were stags, squirrels, antelopes, and hundreds of other beautiful and light-footed animals here found a home. The summit of the tree was a wide-spreading garden, and in the midst of it, where the green boughs formed a kind of hill, stood a castle of crystal, with a view from it towards every quarter of heaven. Each tower was erected in the form of a lily, and within the stern was a winding staircase through which one could ascend to the top and step out upon the leaves as upon balconies. The calyx of the flower itself formed a most beautiful, glittering, circular hall, above which no other roof arose than the blue firmament and the sun and the stars. Just as much splendor, but of another kind, appeared below, in the wide halls of the castle. Here on the walls were reflected pictures of the world, which represented numerous and varied scenes of everything that took place daily, so that it was useless to read the newspapers, and indeed there were none to be obtained in this spot. All was to be seen in living pictures by those who wished it, and all would have been too much for even the wisest man, and this man dwelt here. His name is very difficult. You would not be able to pronounce it, so it may be omitted. He knew everything that a man on earth can know, or imagine. Every invention already in existence, or yet to be, was known to him, and much more. Still, everything on earth has a limit. The wise king Solomon was not half so wise as this man. He could govern the powers of nature and held sway over potent spirits. Even death itself was obliged to give him every morning a list of those who were to die during the day. And King Solomon himself had to die at last, and this fact it was which so often occupied the thoughts of this great man in the castle on the tree of the sun. He knew that he also, however high he might tower above other men in wisdom, must one day die. He knew that his children would fade away like the leaves of the forest and become dust. He saw the human race wither and fall like leaves from the tree. He saw new men come to fill their places but the leaves that fell off never sprouted forth again. They crumbled to dust or were absorbed into other plants. What happens to man? asked the wise man of himself when touched by the angel of death. What can death be? The body decays and the soul. Yes, what is the soul? And whither does it go? To eternal life says the comforting voice of religion. But what is this change? Where and how shall we exist? Above, in heaven, answers the pious man. It is there we hope to go. Above, repeated the wise man, fixing his eyes upon the moon and stars above him. He saw that to this earthly sphere above and below were constantly changing places and that the position varied according to the spot on which a man found himself. He knew also that even if he ascended to the top of the highest mountain which rears its lofty summit on this earth, the air, which to us seems clear and transparent, would be dark and cloudy. The sun would have a coppery glow and send forth no rays, and our earth would lie beneath him wrapped in an orange-colored mist. How narrow are the limits which confine the bodily sight, and how little can be seen by the eye of the soul. 
how little do the wisest among us know of that which is so important to us all in the most secret chamber of the castle lay the greatest treasure on earth the book of truth the wise men had read it through page after page every man may read in this book but only in fragments to many eyes the characters seem so mixed in confusion that the words cannot be distinguished on certain pages the writing often appears so pale or so blurred that the page becomes a blank the wiser a man becomes the more he will read and those who are wisest read most the wise man knew how to unite the sunlight and the moonlight with the light of reason and the hidden powers of nature and through this stronger light many things in the pages were made clear to him but in the portion of the book entitled life after death not a single point could he see distinctly this pained him should he never be able here on earth to obtain a light by which everything written in the book of truth should become clear to him like the wise king solomon he understood the language of animals and could interpret their talk into song but that made him none the wiser he found out the nature of plants and metals and their power in curing diseases and arresting death but none to destroy death itself in all created things within his reach he sought the light that should shine upon the certainty of an eternal life but he found it not the book of truth lay open before him but its pages were to him as blank paper christianity placed before him in the bible a promise of eternal life but he wanted to read it in his book in which nothing on the subject appeared to be written he had five children four sons educated as the children of such a wise father should be and a daughter fair gentle and intelligent but she was blind yet this deprivation appeared as nothing to her her father and brothers were outward eyes to her and a vivid imagination made everything clear to her mental sight the sons had never gone farther from the castle than the branches of the tree extended and the sister had scarcely ever left home they were happy children in that home of their childhood the beautiful and fragrant tree of the sun like all children they loved to hear stories related to them and their father told them many things which other children would not have understood but these were as clever as most grown-up people are among us he explained to them what they saw in the pictures of life on the castle walls the doings of man and the progress of events in all the lands of the earth and the sons often expressed a wish that they could be present and take part in these great deeds then their father told them that in the world there was nothing but toil and difficulty that it was not quite what it appeared to them as they looked upon it in their beautiful home he spoke to them of the true the beautiful and the good and told them that these three held together in the world and by that union they became crystallized into a precious jewel clearer than a diamond of the first water a jewel whose splendor had a value even in the sight of god in whose brightness all things are dim this jewel was called the philosopher's stone he told them that by searching man could attain to a knowledge of the existence of god and that it was in the power of every man to discover the certainty that such a jewel as the philosopher's stone really existed this information would have been beyond the perception of other children but these children understood and others will learn to comprehend its meaning after a time they questioned their father about the true the beautiful and the good and he explained it to them in many ways he told them that god when he made man out of the dust of the earth touched his work five times 
leaving five intense feelings, which we call the five senses. Through these, the true, the beautiful, and the good are seen, understood, and perceived, and through these they are valued, protected, and encouraged. Five senses have been given, mentally and corporeally, inwardly and outwardly, to body and soul. The children thought deeply on all these things, and meditated upon them day and night. Then the eldest of the brothers dreamt a splendid dream. Strange to say, not only the second brother, but also the third and fourth brothers all dreamt exactly the same thing, namely that each went out into the world to find the philosopher's stone. Each dreamt that he found it, and that as he rode back on his swift horse in the morning dawn over the velvety green meadows to his home in the castle of his father, that the stone gleamed from his forehead like a beaming light, and threw such a bright radiance upon the pages of the book of truth that every word was illuminated which spoke of the life beyond the grave. But the sister had no dream of going out into the wide world. It never entered her mind. Her world was her father's house. I shall ride forth into the wide world, said the eldest brother. I must try what life is like there as I mix with men. I will practice only the good and true. With these I will protect the beautiful. Much shall be changed for the better while I am there. Now these thoughts were great and daring, as our thoughts generally are at home before we have gone out into the world and encountered its storms and tempests, its thorns and its thistles. In him and in all his brothers the five senses were highly cultivated, inwardly and outwardly but each of them had one sense which in keenness and development surpassed the other four. In the case of the eldest, this preeminent sense was sight, which he hoped would be of special service. He had eyes for all times and all people, eyes that could discover in the depths of the earth hidden treasures and look into the hearts of men as through a pane of glass. He could read more than is often seen on the cheek that blushes or grows pale, in the eye that droops or smiles. Stags and antelopes accompanied him to the western boundary of his home, and there he found the wild swans. These he followed and found himself far away in the north, far from the land of his father, which extended eastward to the ends of the earth. How he opened his eyes with astonishment! How many things were to be seen here, and so different to the mere representation of pictures such as those in his father's house! At first he nearly lost his eyes in astonishment at the rubbish and mockery brought forward to represent the beautiful. But he kept his eyes and soon found full employment for them. He wished to go thoroughly and honestly to work in his endeavor, to understand the true, the beautiful, and the good. But how were they represented in the world? He observed that the wreath which rightly belonged to the beautiful was often given the hideous, that the good was often passed by unnoticed, while mediocrity was applauded when it should have been hissed. People look at the dress not at the wearer, thought more of a name than of doing their duty, and trusted more to reputation than to real service. It was everywhere the same. I see I must make a regular attack on these things, said he, and he accordingly did not spare them. But while looking for the truth came the evil one, the father of lies, to intercept him. Gladly would the fiend have plucked out the eyes of this seer, but that would have been a too straightforward path for him. He works more cunningly. He allowed the young man to seek for and discover the beautiful and the good. But while he was contemplating them, the evil spirit blew one mote after another into each of his eyes, 
and such a proceeding would injure the strongest sight. Then he blew upon the motes, and they became beams, so that the clearness of his sight was gone, and the seer was like a blind man in the world, and had no longer any faith in it. He had lost his good opinion of the world, as well as of himself. And when a man gives up the world and himself, too, it is all over with him. All over, said the wild swan who flew across the sea to the east. All over, twittered the swallows who were also flying eastward toward the tree of the sun. It was no good news which they carried home. I think the seer has been badly served, said the second brother, but the hearer may be more successful. This one possessed the sense of hearing to a very high degree. So acute was this sense that it was said he could hear the grass grow. He took a fond leave of all at home and rode away, provided with good abilities and good intentions. The swallows escorted him, and he followed the swans till he found himself out in the world and far away from home. But he soon discovered that one may have too much of a good thing. His hearing was too fine. He not only heard the grass grow, but could hear every man's heart beat, whether in sorrow or in joy. The whole world was to him like a clockmaker's great workshop, in which all the clocks were going tick, tick, and all the turret clocks striking ding-dong. It was unbearable. For a long time his ears endured it, but at last all the noise and tumult became too much for one man to bear. There were rascally boys of sixty years old, for years alone do not make a man, who raised a tumult which might have made the hearer laugh, but for the applause which followed, echoing through every street and house, and was even heard in country roads. Falsehood thrust itself forward and played the hypocrite. The bells on the fool's cap jingled and declared they were church bells, and the noise became so bad for the hearer that he thrust his fingers into his ears. Still he could hear false notes and bad singing, gossip and idle words, scandal and slander, groaning and moaning without and within. Heaven, help us! He thrust his fingers farther and farther into his ears, till at last the drums burst. And now he could hear nothing more of the true, the beautiful, and the good, for his hearing was to have been the means by which he hoped to acquire his knowledge. He became silent and suspicious, and at last trusted no one, not even himself, and no longer hoping to find and bring home the costly jewel. He gave it up and gave himself up too, which was worse than all. The birds in their flight towards the east carried the tidings, and the news reached the castle in the tree of the sun. I will try now, said the third brother. I have a keen nose. Now that was not a very elegant expression, but it was his way, and we must take him as he was. He had a cheerful temper and was, besides, a real poet. He could make many things appear poetical by the way in which he spoke of them, and ideas struck him long before they occurred to the minds of others. I can smell he would say, and he attributed to the sense of smelling, which he possessed in a high degree, a great power in the region of the beautiful. I can smell, he would say, and many places are fragrant or beautiful according to the taste of the frequenters. One man feels at home in the atmosphere of the tavern, among the flaring tallow candles, and when the smell of spirits mingles with the fumes of bad tobacco, Another prefers sitting amidst the overpowering scent of jasmine, or perfuming himself with scented olive oil. This man seeks the fresh sea breeze, while that one climbs the lofty mountain top to look down upon the busy life in miniature beneath him. 
As he spoke in this way, it seemed as if he had already been out in the world, as if he had already known and associated with man. But this experience was intuitive. It was the poetry within him, a gift from heaven bestowed on him in his cradle. He bade farewell to his parental roof in the tree of the sun, and departed on foot from the pleasant scenes that surrounded his home. Arrived at its confines, he mounted on the back of an ostrich, which runs faster than a horse, and afterwards, when he fell in with the wild swans, he swung himself on the strongest of them, for he loved change, and away he flew over the sea to distant lands, where there were great forests, deep lakes, lofty mountains, and proud cities. Wherever he came, it seemed as if sunshine traveled with him across the fields, for every flower, every bush, exhaled a renewed fragrance, as if conscious that a friend and protector was near, one who understood them and knew their value. The stunted rosebush shot forth twigs, unfolded its leaves, and bore the most beautiful roses. Everyone could see it, and even the black, slimy wood snail noticed its beauty. I will give my seal to the flower, said the snail. I have trailed my slime upon it. I can do no more. Thus it always fares with the beautiful in this world, said the poet. And he made a song upon it, and sung it after his own fashion. But nobody listened. Then he gave a drummer two pence and a peacock's feather, and composed a song for the drum, and the drummer beat it through the streets of the town. And when the people heard it, they said, That is a capital tune. The poet wrote many songs about the true, the beautiful, and the good. His songs were listened to in the tavern, where the tallow candles flared, in the fresh clover field, in the forest, and on the high seas, and it appeared as if this brother was to be more fortunate than the other two. But the evil spirit was angry at this, so he set to work with soot and incense, which he can mix so artfully as to confuse an angel, and how much more easily a poor poet. The evil one knew how to manage such people. He so completely surrounded the poet with incense that the man lost his head, forgot his mission and his home, and at last lost himself and vanished in smoke. But when the little birds heard of it, they mourned, and for three days they sang not one song. The black wood snail became blacker still, not for grief but for envy. They should have offered me incense, he said for it was I who gave him the idea of the most famous of his songs, the drum song of the way of the world, and it was I who spat at the rose. I can bring a witness to that fact. But no tidings of all this reached the poet's home in India. The birds had all been silent for three days, and when the time of mourning was over, so deep had been their grief that they had forgotten for whom they wept. Such is the way of the world. Now I must go out into the world and disappear like the rest, said the fourth brother. He was as good-tempered as the third, but no poet, though he could be witty. The two eldest had filled the castle with joyfulness, and now the last brightness was going away. Sight and hearing have always been considered two of the chief senses among men, and those which they wish to keep bright. The other senses are looked upon as of less importance. But the younger son had a different opinion. He had cultivated his taste in every way, and taste is very powerful. It rules over what goes into the mouth, as well as over all which is presented to the mind. And, consequently, this brother took upon himself to taste everything stored up in bottles or jars. This he called the rough part of his work. Every man's mind was to him as a vessel in which something was concocting, every land a kind of mental kitchen. 
There are no delicacies here, he said. So he wished to go out into the world to find something delicate to suit his taste. Perhaps fortune may be more favorable to me than it was to my brothers. I shall start on my travels, but what conveyance shall I choose? Are air balloons invented yet? He asked of his father, who knew of all inventions that had been made, or would be made. Air balloons had not then been invented, nor steamships, nor railways. Good, he said, then I shall choose an air balloon. My father knows how they are to be made and guided. Nobody has invented one yet, and the people will believe that it is an aerial phantom, when I have done with the balloon, I shall burn it, and for my purpose, you must give me a few pieces of another invention which will come next. I mean a few chemical matches. He obtained what he wanted and flew away. The birds accompanied him farther than they had the other brothers. They were curious to know how this flight would end. Many more of them came swooping down, they thought it must be some new bird, and he soon had a goodly company of followers. They came in clouds till the air became darkened with birds, as it was with the cloud of locusts over the land of Egypt. And now he was out in the wide world. The balloon descended over one of the greatest cities, and the aeronaut took up his station at the highest point on the church steeple. The balloon rose again into the air, which had ought not to have done. What became of it is not known, neither is it of any consequence, for balloons had not then been invented. There he sat on the church steeple. The birds no longer hovered over him. They had got tired of him, and he was tired of them. All the chimneys in the town were smoking. There are altars erected to my honor, said the wind, who wished to say something agreeable to him, as he sat there boldly looking down upon the people in the street. There was one stepping along, proud of his purse, another of the key he carried behind him, though he had nothing to lock up, another took pride in his moth-eaten coat, and another in his mortified body. Vanity, all vanity, he exclaimed. I must go down there by and by and touch and taste, but I shall sit here a little while longer, for the wind blows pleasantly at my back. I shall remain here as long as the wind blows and enjoy a little rest. It is comfortable to sleep late in the morning when one had a great deal to do, said the sluggard, so I shall stop here as long as the wind blows, for it pleases me. And there he stayed. But as he was sitting on the weathercock of the steeple, which kept turning round and round with him, he was under the false impression that the same wind still blew, and that he could stay where he was without expense. But in India, in the castle on the tree of the sun, all was solitary and still, since the brothers had gone away one after the other. Nothing goes well with them, said the father. They will never bring the glittering jewel home. It is not made for me. They are all dead and gone. Then he bent down over the book of truth and gazed on the page on which he should have read of the life after death, but for him there was nothing to be read or learned upon it. His blind daughter was his consolation and joy. She clung to him with sincere affection and for the sake of his happiness and peace, she wished the costly jewel could be found and brought home. With longing tenderness she thought of her brothers. Where were they? Where did they live? How she wished she might dream of them, but it was strange that not even in dreams could she be brought near to them. But at last one night she dreamt that she heard the voices of her brothers calling to her from the distant world, and she could not refrain herself, but went out to them, and yet it seemed in her dream that she still remained in her father's house. She did not see her brothers, but she felt 
as if it were a fire burning in her hand, which, however, did not hurt her, for it was the jewel she was bringing to her father. When she awoke, she thought for a moment that she still held the stone, but she only grasped the knob of her distaff. During the long evening, she had spun constantly, and round the distaff were woven threads finer than the web of a spider. Human eyes could never have distinguished these threads when separated from each other, but she had wetted them with her tears, and the twist was as strong as a cable. She rose with the impression that her dream must be a reality, that her resolution was taken. It was still night, and her father slept. She pressed a kiss upon his hand, and then took her distaff and fastened the end of the thread to her father's house. But for this, blind as she was, she would never have found her way home again. To this thread she must hold fast, and trust not to others, or even to herself. From the tree of the sun she broke four leaves, which she gave up to the wind and the weather, that they might be carried to her brothers as letters and a greeting, in case she did not meet them in the wide world. Poor blind child, what would become of her in those distant regions? But she had the invisible thread, to which she could hold fast, and she possessed a gift which all the others lacked. It was the determination to throw herself entirely into whatever she undertook, and it made her feel as if she had eyes, even at the tips of her fingers, and could hear down into her very heart. Quietly she went forth into the noisy, bustling, wonderful world, and wherever she went the skies grew bright, and she felt the warm sunbeam, and a rainbow above in the blue heavens seemed to span the dark world. She heard the song of the birds, and smelt the scent of the orange groves and apple orchards so strongly that she seemed to taste it. Soft tones and charming songs reached her ear, as well as harsh sounds and rough words, thoughts and opinions in strange contradiction to each other. Into the deepest recesses of her heart penetrated the echo of human thoughts and feelings. Now she heard the following words, sadly sung. Life is a shadow that flits away in a night of darkness and woe. But then there would follow brighter thoughts. Life has the rose's sweet perfume with sunshine, light, and joy. And if one stands as sounded painfully, each mortal thinks of himself alone is a truth, alas, too clearly known. Then, on the other hand, came the answer. Love, like a mighty flowing stream, fills every heart with its radiant gleam. She heard, indeed, such words as these. In the petty turmoil here below, all is vain and paltry show. Then came also words of comfort. Great and good are the actions done by many whose worth is never known. And if sometimes the mocking strain reached her, why not join in the jesting cry that contemns all gifts from the throne on high? In the blind girl's heart, a stronger voice repeated, To trust in thyself and God is best, in his holy will forever to rest. But the evil spirit could not see this, and remained contented. He has more cleverness than ten thousand men, and he found means to compass his end. He betook himself to the marsh and collected a few little bubbles of stagnant water. Then he uttered over them the echoes of lying words that they might become strong. He mixed up together songs of praise with lying epitaphs, as many as he could find, boiled them in tears shed by envy, put upon them rouge which he had scraped from faded cheeks. And from these he produced a maiden, in form and appearance like a blind girl, the angel of completeness, as men called her. The evil one's plot was successful. The world knew not which was the true, 
and indeed how should the world know? To trust in thyself and God is best, in his holy will forever to rest. So sung the blind girl in full faith. She had entrusted the four green leaves from the tree of the sun to the winds, as letters of greeting to her brothers, and she had full confidence that the leaves would reach them. She fully believed that the jewel which outshines all the glories of the world would yet be found, and that upon the forehead of humanity it would glitter even in the castle of her father. Even in my father's house, she repeated. Yes, the place in which this jewel is to be found is earth, and I shall bring more than the promise of it with me. I feel it glow and swell more and more in my closed hand. Every grain of truth which the keen wind carried up and whirled towards me, I caught and treasured. I allowed it to be penetrated with the fragrance of the beautiful, of which there is so much in the world, even for the blind. I took the beatings of a heart engaged in a good action, and added them to my treasure. All that I can bring is but dust. Still it is a part of the jewel we seek, and there is plenty. My hand is quite full of it. She soon found herself again at home, carried thither in a flight of thought, never having loosened her hold of the invisible thread fastened to her father's house. As she stretched out her hand to her father, the powers of evil dashed with the fury of a hurricane over the tree of the sun. A blast of wind rushed through the open doors and into the sanctuary where lay the book of truth. It will be blown to dust by the wind, said the father as he seized the open hand she held towards him. No, she replied with quiet confidence. It is indestructible. I feel its beam warming my very soul. Then her father observed that a dazzling flame gleamed from the white page on which the shining dust had passed from her hand. It was there to prove the certainty of eternal life, and on the book glowed one shining word, and only one, the word, Believe. And soon the four brothers were again with the father and daughter. When the green leaf from home fell on the bosom of each, a longing had seized them to return. They had arrived accompanied by the birds of passage, the stag, the antelope, and all the creatures of the forest who wished to take part in their joy. We have often seen, when a sunbeam burst through a crack in the door into a dusty room, how a whirring column of dust seems to circle round, but this was not poor, insignificant, common dust which the blind girl had brought. Even the rainbow's colors are dim when compared with the beauty which shone from the page on which it had fallen. The beaming word, believe, from every grain of truth had the brightness of the beautiful and the good, more bright than the mighty pillar of the flame that led Moses and the children of Israel to the land of Canaan. And from the word, believe, arose the bridge of hope, reaching even to the unmeasurable love in the realms of the infinite. End of the Philosopher's Stone Section 21 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Story of the Wind. Near the shores of the Great Belt, which is one of the straits that connect the Kattegat with the Baltic, stands an old mansion with thick red walls. I know every stone of it, says the wind. I saw it when it was part of the castle of Mark Stig on the promontory. But the castle was obliged to be pulled down, 
and the stone was used again for the walls of a new mansion on another spot, the baronial residence of Barraby, which still stands near the coast. I knew them well, those noble lords and ladies, the successive generations that dwelt there, and now I am going to tell you of Waldemar Dar and his daughters. How proud was his bearing, for he was of royal blood, and could boast of more noble deeds than merely hunting the stag and emptying the wine-cup. His rule was despotic. It shall be, he was accustomed to say. His wife, in garments embroidered with gold, stepped proudly over the polished marble floors. The tapestries were gorgeous, and the furniture of costly and artistic taste. She had brought gold and plate with her into the new house. The cellars were full of wine. Black fiery horses neighed in the stables. There was a look of wealth about the house of Borrowby at that time. They had three children, daughters, fair and delicate maidens. Ida, Joanna, and Anna Dorothea. I have never forgotten their names. They were a rich, noble family, born in affluence and nurtured in luxury. Where, where, roared the wind, and went on. I did not see in this house, as in other great houses, the high-born lady sitting among her women, turning the spinning wheel. She could sweep the sounding chords of the guitar, and sing to the music, not always Danish melodies, but the songs of a strange land. It was li live and let live here. Stranger guests came from far and near. Music sounded, goblets clashed, and I, said the wind, was not able to drown the noise. Ostentation, pride, splendour, and display ruled, but not the fear of the Lord. It was on the evening of the first of May, the wind continued. I came from the west and had seen the ships overpowered with the waves, when all on board persisted or were cast shipwrecked on the coast of Jutland. I had hurried across the heath and over Jutland's wood-girt eastern coast, and over the island of Funen, and then I drove across the great belt sighing and moaning. At length I lay down to rest on the shores of Zealand, near to the great house of Borrowby, where the splendid forest of oaks still flourished. The young men of the neighbourhood were collecting branches and brushwood under the oak trees. The largest and driest they could find they carried into the village and piled up high in a heap, and set them on fire. Then the men and maidens danced, and sung in a circle round the blazing pile. I lay quite quiet, said the wind, but I silently touched a branch which had been brought by one of the handsomest of the young men, and the wood blazed up brightly, blazed brighter than all the rest. Then he was chosen as the chief, and received the name of the shepherd, and might choose his lamb from among the maidens. There was greater mirth and rejoicing than I had ever heard in the halls of the rich baronial house. Then the noble lady drove by towards the baron's mansion with her three daughters, in a gilded carriage drawn by six horses. The daughters were young and beautiful, three charming blossoms, a rose, a lily, and a white hyacinth, the mother was a proud tulip, and never acknowledged the salutations of any of the men or maidens who paused in their sport to do her honour. The gracious lady seemed like a flower that was rather stiff in the stalk. Rose, lily, and hyacinth, yes, I saw them all three. Whose little lambs will they one day become, thought I? Their shepherd will be a gallant knight, perhaps a prince. The carriage rolled on, and the peasants resumed their dancing. They drove about the summer through all the villages near, but one night when I rose again the high-born lady lay down to rise again no more. That thing came to her which comes to us all, in which there is nothing new. Walda Madar remained for a time silent and thoughtful. The loftiest tree may be bowed without being broken, said a voice within him. His daughters wept. All the people in the mansion wiped their eyes, but Lady Da had driven away, and I drove away too, said the wind. Whirr, whirr. I returned again. I often returned and passed over the island of Funen and the shores of the belt. Then I rested by Borrowby near the glorious wood where the heron made his nest, the haunt of the wood pigeons, the bluebirds, and the black stork. It was yet spring. Some were sitting on their eggs, others had already hatched their young broods, but how they fluttered about and cried out when the axe sounded through the forest blow upon blow. The trees of the forest were doomed. Waldemar Da wanted to build a noble ship, 
a man of war, a three-decker, which the king would be sure to buy, and these, the trees of the wood, the landmark of the seamen, the refuge of the birds, must be felled. And the hawk started up and flew away, for its nest was destroyed. The heron and all the birds of the forest became homeless, and flew about in fear and anger. I could well understand how they felt. Crows and ravens croaked as if in scorn, while the trees were cracking and falling around them. Far in the interior of the wood, where the noisy swarm of labourers were working, stood Waldemar Dar and his three daughters, and all were laughing at the wild cries of the birds, excepting one, the youngest, Anna Dorothea, who felt grieved to the heart, and when they made preparations to fell a tree that was almost dead, and on whose naked branches the black stork had built her nest, she saw the poor little things stretching out their necks, and she begged for mercy for them with the tears in her eyes. So the tree with the black stork's nest was left standing. The tree itself, however, was not worth much to speak of. Then there was a great deal of hewing and sawing, and at last the three-decker was built. The builder was a man of low origin, but possessing great pride. His eyes and forehead spoke of large intellect, and Waldemar Da was fond of listening to him, and so was Waldemar's daughter Ida, the eldest, now about fifteen years old. And while he was building the ship for the father, he was building for himself a castle in the air in which he and Ida were to live when they were married. This might have happened indeed if there had been a real castle with stone walls, ramparts, and a moat, but in spite of his clever head, the builder was still but a poor inferior bird, and how can a sparrow expect to be admitted into the society of peacocks? I passed on in my course, said the wind, and he passed away also. He was not allowed to remain, and little Ida got over it because she was obliged to do so. Proud black horses, worth looking at, were neighing in the stable and they were locked up for the admiral who had been sent by the king to inspect the new ship and make arrangements for its purchase was loud in admiration for these beautiful horses i heard it all said the wind for i accompanied the gentlemen through the open door of the stable and strewed stalks of straw like bars of gold at their feet waldemar da wanted gold and the admiral wished for the proud black horses therefore he praised them so much but the hint was not taken and consequently the ship was not bought it remained on the shore, covered with boards, a Noah's Ark that never got to the water, were, and that was a pity. In the winter, when the fields were covered with snow, and the water filled with large blocks of ice which I had blown up to the coast, continued the wind, great flocks of crows and ravens, dark and black as they usually are, came and alighted on the lonely deserted ship. Then they croaked in harsh accents of the forest that now existed no more, of the many pretty birds' nests destroyed, and the little ones left without a home, and all for the sake of that great bit of lumber, that proud ship that never sailed forth. I made the snowflakes whirl till the snow lay like a great lake around the ship, and drifted over it. I let it hear my voice, that it may know what the storm has to say. Certainly I did my part towards teaching its seamanship. That winter passed away, and another winter and summer both passed, as they are still passing away, even as I pass away. The snow drifts onwards, the apple blossoms are scattered, the leaves fall. Everything passes away, and men are passing away too. But the great man's daughters are still young, and little Ida is a rose as fair to look upon as on the day when the shipbuilder first saw her. I often tumble her long brown hair while she stood in the garden by the apple tree, musing and not heeding how I strewed the blossoms on her hair and dishevelled it. Or sometimes while she stood gazing at the red sun in the golden sky through the opening branches of the dark, thick foliage of the garden trees. Her sister Joanna was bright and slender as a lily. She had a tall and lofty carriage and figure, though, like her mother, rather stiff in back. She was very fond of walking through the great hall where hung the great portraits of her ancestors. The women were represented in dresses of velvet and silk, with tiny little hats embroidered with pearls on their braided hair. They were all handsome women. The gentlemen appeared clad in steel or in rich cloaks lined with squirrel's fur. They wore little ruffs and swords at their sides. Where would Joanna's place be on that wall some day? And how would he look, her noble lord and husband? 
This is what she thought of, and often spoke of in a low voice to herself. I heard it as I swept into the long hall and turned round to come out again. Anna Dorothea, the pale hyacinth, a child of fourteen, was quiet and thoughtful. Her large, deep blue eyes had a dreamy look, but a childlike smile still played around her mouth. I was not able to blow it away, neither did I wish to do so. We have met in the garden, in the hollow lane, in the field and meadow, where she gathered herbs and flowers which she knew would be useful to her father in preparing the drugs and mixtures he was always concocting. Walder Madar was arrogant and proud, but he was also a learned man, and knew a great deal. It was no secret, and many opinions were expressed on what he did. In his fireplace there was fire, even in summer-time. He would lock himself in his room, and for days the fire would be kept burning. But he did not talk much of what he was doing. The secret powers of nature are generally discovered in solitude, and did he not soon expect to find out the art of making the greatest of all good things, the art of making gold? So he fondly hoped. Therefore the chimney smoked and the fire crackled so constantly. Yes, I was there too, said the wind. Leave it alone, I sang down the chimney. Leave it alone, it will all end in smoke, air, coals and ashes, and you will burn your fingers. But Waldemar Da did not leave it alone, and all he possessed vanished like smoke blown by me. The splendid black horses, where are they? What became of the cows in the field, the old gold and silver vessels in cupboards and chests, and even the house and home itself? It was easy to melt all these away in the gold-making crucible, and yet obtain no gold. And so it was. Empty are the barns and storerooms, the cellars and cupboards, the servants decreased in number, and the mice multiplied. First one window became broken, and then another, so that I could get in and other places beside the door. Where the chimney smokes, the meal is being cooked, says the proverb, but here a chimney smoked that devoured all the meals for the sake of gold. I blew round the courtyard, said the wind, like a watchman blowing his home, but no watchman was there. I twirled the weathercock round on the summit of the tower, and it creaked like the snoring of a warder, but no warder was there. Nothing but mice and rats. Poverty laid the tablecloth. Poverty sat in the wardrobe and in the larder. The door fell off its hinges. Cracks and fissures made their appearance everywhere, so that I could go in and out at pleasure, and that is how I know all about it. Amid smoke and ashes, sorrow and sleepless nights, the hair and beard of the master of the house turned grey, and deep furrows showed themselves round his temples. His skin turned pale and yellow, while his eyes still looked eagerly for gold, the longed-for gold, and the result of his labour was debt instead of gain. I blew the smoke and ashes into his face and beard. I moaned through the broken window-panes and the yawning clefts in the walls. I blew into the chests and drawers belonging to his daughters, wherein lay the clothes that had become faded and threadbare from being worn over and over again. Such a song has not been sung at the children's cradle as I sung now. The lordly life had changed to a life of penury. I was the only one who rejoiced aloud in that castle, said the wind. At last I snowed them up, and they say snow keeps people warm. It was good for them, for they had no wood in the forest from which they might have obtained it had been cut down. The frost was very bitter, and I rushed through loopholes and passages, over gables and roofs with keening and cutting swiftness. The three high-born daughters were lying in bed because of the cold, and their father crouching beneath his leather coverlet. Nothing to eat, nothing to burn, no fire in the hearth. Here was a life for high-born people. Give it up, give it up! but my Lord Dow would not do that. After winter, spring will come, he said. After want, good times. We must not lose patience. We must learn to wait. Now my horses and lands are all mortgaged. It is indeed high time. But gold will come at last, at Easter. I heard him as he thus spoke. He was looking at a spider's web, and he continued, Thou cunning little weaver, thou dost teach me perseverance. Let any one tear thy web, and thou wilt begin again and repair it. Let it be entirely destroyed, thou wilt resolutely begin to make another till it is completed. So ought we to do if we wish to succeed at last. It was the morning of Easter Day. 
The bells sounded from the neighbouring church, and the sun seemed to rejoice in the sky. The master of the castle had watched through the night in feverish excitement, and had been melting and cooling, distilling and mixing. I heard him sighing like a soul in despair. I heard him praying, and I noticed how he held his breath. The lamp burnt out, but he did not observe it. I blew up the fire and the coals on the hearth, and it threw a red glow on his ghastly white face, lighting it up with a glare while his sunken eyes looked out wildly from their cavernous depths and appeared to grow larger and more prominent, as if they would burst from their sockets. Look at the alchemic glass, he cried. Something glows in the crucible, pure and heavy. He lifted it with a trembling hand and exclaimed in a voice of agitation, Gold, gold! He was quite giddy. I could have blown him down, said the wind, but I only fanned the glowing coals and accompanied him through the door to the room where his daughter sat shivering. His coat was powdered with ashes, and there were ashes in his beard and his tangled hair. He stood erect and held high in the air the brittle glass that contained his costly treasure. Found! Found! Gold! Gold! He shouted again, holding the glass aloft that it might flash in the sunshine. But his hand trembled, and the alchemic glass fell from it, clattering to the ground and break into a thousand pieces. The last bubble of his happiness had burst, with a whiz and a whir, and I rushed away from the gold-maker's house. Late in the autumn, when the days were short, and the mist sprinkled cold drops on the berries and the leafless branches, I came back in fresh spirits, rushed through the air, swept the sky clear, and snapped off the dry twigs, which is certainly no great labour to do, yet it must be done. There was another kind of sweeping out taking place at Waldemar Dars, in the castle of Borrowby. His enemy, O. Rammel, of Basness, was there, with the mortgage of the house and everything it contained in his pocket. I rattled the broken windows, beat against the old rotten doors, and whistled through the cracks and crevices so that Mr. O. Rammel did not much like to remain here. Ida and Anna Dorothea wept bitterly. Joanna stood pale and proud, biting her lip till the blood came. But what could that avail? O. Rammel offered Waldemar Dar permission to remain in the house till the end of his life. No one thanked him for the offer, and I saw the ruined old gentleman lift his head and throw it back more proudly than ever. Then I rushed against the house and the old lime trees with such force that one of the thickest branches, a decayed one, was broken off, and the branch fell at the entrance and remained there. It might have been used as a broom if any one had wanted to sweep the place out, and a grand sweeping out there really was. I thought it would be so. It was hard for any one to preserve composure on such a day, but these people had strong wills, as unbending as their hard fortune. There was nothing they could call their own excepting the clothes they wore. Yes, there was one thing more, an alchemist's glass, a new one which had been lately bought, and filled with what could be gathered from the ground of the treasure which had promised so much but failed in keeping its promise. Waldemar Da hid the glass in his bosom, and taking his stick in his hand, the once rich gentleman passed with his daughters out of the house of Borrowby. I blew coldly upon his flustered cheeks, I stroked his grey beard and his long white hair, and I sang as well as I was able, Whirr, whirr, gone away, gone away. Ida walked on one side of the old man, and Anna Dorothea on the other. Joanna turned round as they left the entrance. Why? Fortune would not turn because she turned. She looked at the stone in the walls which had once formed part of the castle of Mark Stig, and perhaps she thought of his daughters and of the old song. The eldest and the youngest, hand in hand, went forth alone in a distant land. These were only two. Here there were three, and their father with them also. They walked along the high road, where once they had driven in their splendid carriage. They went forth with their father as beggars. They wandered across an open field to a mud hut, which they rented for a dollar and a half a year, a new home with bare walls and an empty cupboard. Crows and magpies fluttered about them, and cried as if in contempt, Caw, caw, turned out of thou nest, caw, caw, as they had done in the wood at Borrowby, when the trees were felled. Da and his daughters could not help hearing it, so I blew about their ears to drown the noise. What use was it? 
that they should listen. So they went to live in the mud hut in the open field, and I wandered away, over moor and meadow, through bare bushes and leafless forests, to the open sea, to the broad shores in other lands. Whirr, whirr, away, away, year after year. And what became of Walder Madda and his daughters? Listen, the wind will tell us. The last I saw of them was the pale hyacinth, Anna Dorothea. She was old and bent then, for fifty years had passed, and she had outlived them all. She could relate the history. Yonder on the heath, near the town of Wyborg in Jutland, stood the fine new house of the canon. It was built of red brick, with projecting gables. It was inhabited, for the smoke curled up thickly from the chimneys. The canon's gentle lady and her beautiful daughters sat in the bay window and looked over the hawthorn hedge of the garden towards the brown heath. What were they looking at? Their glance fell upon a stork's nest, which was built upon a tumbled-down old hut. The roof, as far as one existed at all, was covered with moss and lichen. The stork's nest covered the greater part of it, and that alone was in good condition, for it was kept in order by the stork himself. That is a house to be looked at and not to be touched, said the wind. For the sake of the stork's nest it had been allowed to remain, although it is a blot on the landscape. They did not like to drive the stork away. Therefore the old shed was left standing, and the poor woman who dwelt in it allowed to stay. She had the Egyptian bird to thank for that. Or was it perchance her reward for having once interceded for the preservation of the nest of its black brother in the forest of Borrowby? At that time she, the poor woman, was a young child, a white hyacinth in a rich garden. She remembered that time well, for it was Anna Dorothea. Oh, oh, she sighed, for people can sigh like the moaning of the wind among the reeds and rushes. Oh, oh, she would say, no bell sounded at thy burial, Waldemada. The poor schoolboys didn't even sing a psalm when the former lord of Borrowby was laid in the earth to rest. Oh, everything has its end. Even misery. Sister Ida became the wife of a peasant. That was the hardest trial which befell our father, that the husband of his own daughter should be a miserable serf whom his owner could place for punishment on the wooden horse. I suppose he is under the ground now, and Ida. Alas, alas, it is not ended yet. Miserable that I am. Kind heaven grant me that I may die. That was Anna Dorothea's prayer in the wretched hut that was left standing, for the sake of the stork. I took pity on the proudest of the sisters, said the wind. Her courage was like that of a man, and in man's clothes she served as a sailor on board ship. She was of few words, and of a dark countenance, but she did not know how to climb, so I blew her overboard before any one found out that she was a woman. And in my opinion that was well done, said the wind. On such another Easter morning as that on which Waldemada imagined he had discovered the art of making gold, I heard the tones of a psalm under the stork's nest, and within the crumbling walls. It was Anna Dorothea's last song. There was no window in the hut, only a hole in the wall, and the sun rose like a globe of burnished gold and looked through. With what splendour he filled that dismal dwelling! Her eyes were glazing and her heart breaking, so it would have been even had the sun not shone that morning on Anna Dorothea. The stork's nest had secured her home till her death. I sung over her grave. I sung at her father's grave. I know where it lies and where her grave is too, but nobody else knows it. New times now. All is changed. The old high road is lost amid cultivated fields. The new one now winds along over covered graves, and soon the railway will come with its trains of carriages, and rush over graves where lie those whose very names have been forgotten. All passed away, passed away. This is the story of Walder Madar and his daughters. Tell it better any of you if you know how, said the wind, and he rushed away and was gone. End of the Story of the Wind Section 22 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. Hans Christian Andersen. Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, to by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. THE GIRL WHO TROD ON THE LOAF There once was a girl who trod on a loaf to avoid soiling her shoes, and the misfortunes that happened to her in consequence are well known. Her name was Inga. She was a poor child, but proud and presuming, and with a bad and cruel disposition. When quite a little child she would delight in catching flies and tearing off their wings, so as to make creeping things of them. When older she would take cockchafers and beetles and stick pins through them. Then she pushed a green leaf or a little scrap of paper towards their feet, and when the poor creatures would seize it and hold it fast and turn over and over in their struggles to get free from the pin, she would say, The cockchafer is reading. See how he turns over the leaf. She grew worse instead of better with years, and unfortunately she was pretty, which caused her to be excused when she should have been sharply reproved. Your headstrong will requires severity to conquer it, her mother often said to her. As a little child you used to trample on my apron, but one day I fear you will trample on my heart. And alas, this fear was realized. Inga was taken to the house of some rich people, who lived at a distance, and who treated her as their own, and dressed her so fine that her pride and arrogance increased. When she had been there about a year, her patroness said to her, You ought to go for once and see your parents, Inga. So Inga started to go and visit her parents, but she only wanted to show herself in the native place, that the people might see how fine she was. She reached the entrance of the village, and saw the young laboring men and maidens standing together chatting, and her own mother amongst them. Inga's mother was sitting on a stone to rest, with a faggot of sticks lying before her, which she had picked up in the wood. Then Inga turned back. She, who was so finely dressed, she felt ashamed of her mother, a poorly clad woman who picked up wood in the forest. She did not turn back out of pity for her mother's poverty, but from pride. Another half-year went by, and her mistress said, You ought to go home again and visit your parents, Inga, and I will give you a large wheaten loaf to take to them. They will be glad to see you, I am sure. So Inga put on her best clothes and her new shoes, drew her dress up around her, and set out, stepping very carefully, that she might be clean and neat about the feet. And there was nothing wrong in doing so. But when she came to the place where the footpath led across the moor, she found small pools of water and a great deal of mud. So she threw the loaf into the mud and trod upon it, that she might pass without wetting her feet. But as she stood with one foot on the loaf and the other lifted up to step forward, the loaf began to sink under her, lower and lower, till she disappeared altogether, and only a few bubbles on the surface of the muddy pool remained to show where she had sunk. And this is the story. But where did Inga go? She sank into the ground and went down to the Marsh Woman, who is always brewing there. The Marsh Woman is related to the Elf Maidens, who are well known for songs are sung and pictures painted about them. But of the Marsh Woman nothing is known, excepting that, when a mist arises from the meadows in summertime, it is because she is brewing beneath them. To the Marsh Woman's brewery, Inga sunk down to a place which no one can endure for long. A heap of mud is a palace compared with the Marsh Woman's brewery, and as Inga fell she shuddered in every limb, and soon became cold and stiff as marble. Her foot was still fastened to the loaf, which bowed her down as a golden ear of corn bends the stem. An evil spirit soon took possession of Inga and carried her to a still worse place, in which she saw crowds of unhappy people, waiting in a state of agony for the gates of mercy to be opened to them and in every heart was a miserable and eternal feeling of unrest. It would take too much time to describe the various tortures these people suffered, but Inga's punishment consisted in standing there as a statue with her foot fastened to the loaf. She could move her eyes about and see all the misery around her, but she could not turn her head, and when she saw the people looking at her, she thought they were admiring her pretty face and fine clothes, for she was still vain and proud but she had forgotten how soiled her clothes had become while in the marsh woman's brewery, and that they were covered with mud. A snake had also fastened itself in her hair and hung down her back, while from each fold in her dress a great toad peeped out and croaked like an asthmatic poodle. 
Worse than all was the terrible hunger that tormented her, and she could not stoop to break off a piece of the loaf on which she stood. No, her back was too stiff and her whole body like a pillar of stone, and then came creeping over her face and eyes, flies without wings. She winked and blinked, but they could not fly away, for their wings had been pulled off. This, added to the hunger she felt, was horrible torture. If this lasts much longer, she said, I shall not be able to bear it. But it did last, and she had to bear it without being able to help herself. A tear, followed by many scalding tears, fell upon her head and rolled over her face and neck, down to the loaf on which she stood. Who could be weeping for Inga? She had a mother in the world still, and the tears of sorrow which a mother sheds for her child will always find their way to the child's heart, but they often increase the torment instead of being a relief. And Inga could hear all that was said about her in the world she had left and every one seemed cruel to her. The sin she had committed in treading on the loaf was known on earth, for she had been seen by the cowherd from the hill, when she was crossing the marsh and had disappeared. When her mother wept and exclaimed, Oh, Inga, what grief thou hast caused thy mother! She would say, Oh, that I never been born! My mother's tears are useless now! And then the words of the kind people who had adopted her came to her ears, when they said, Inga was a sinful girl, who did not value the gifts of God, but trampled them under her feet. Oh, thought Inga, they should have punished me and driven all my naughty tempers out of me. A song was made about the girl who trod on a loaf to keep her shoes from being soiled. And this song was sung everywhere. The story of her sin was also told to the little children, and they called her Wicked Inga, and said she was so naughty that she ought to be punished. Inga heard all this, and her heart became hardened and full of bitterness. But one day, while hunger and grief were gnawing in her hollow frame, she heard a little innocent child, while listening to the tale of the vain haughty Inga, burst into tears and exclaim, "'But will she never come up again?' And she heard the reply, "'No, she will never come up again. But if she were to say she was sorry and ask pardon and promise never to do so again?' asked the little one. "'Yes, then she might come. But she will not beg pardon,' was the answer." "'Oh, I wish she would,' said the child, who was quite unhappy about it. "'I should be so glad. I would give up my doll and all my playthings, if she could only come here again. Poor Inga, it's so dreadful for her.' These pitying words penetrated to Inga's inmost heart, and seemed to do her good. It was the first time anyone had said, "'Poor Inga,' without saying something about her faults. A little innocent child was weeping and praying for mercy for her. It made her feel quite strange and she would gladly have wept herself, and it added to her torment to find she could not do so. And while she thus suffered in a place where nothing changed, years passed away on earth, and she heard her name less frequently mentioned. But one day a sigh reached her ear, and the words, Inga, Inga, what a grief thou hast been to me! I said it would be so. It was the last sigh of her dying mother. After this Inga heard her kind mistress say, Ah, oh, poor Inga, shall I ever see thee again? Perhaps I may, for we know not what may happen in the future. But Inga knew right well that her mistress would never come to that dreadful place. Time passed, a long, bitter time. Then Inga heard her name pronounced once more, and saw what seemed two bright stars shining above her. They were two gentle eyes closing on earth. Many years had passed since the little girl had lamented and wept about poor Inga. That child was now an old woman, whom God was taking to himself. In the last hour of existence, the events of a whole life often appear before us. And this hour the old woman remembered how when a child she had shed tears over the story of Inga, and she prayed for her now. As the eyes of the old woman closed to earth, the eyes of the soul opened upon the hidden things of eternity. And then she, in whose last thoughts Inga had been so vividly present, saw how deeply the poor girl had sunk. She burst into tears at the sight, and in heaven as she had done when a little child on earth. She wept and prayed for poor Inga. Her tears and her prayers echoed through the dark void that surrounded the tormented captive soul, and the unexpected mercy was obtained for it through an angel's tears. As in thought, Inga seemed to act over again every sin she had committed on earth. She trembled, and tears she had never yet been able to weep rushed to her eyes. It seemed impossible that the gates of mercy could ever be opened to her. But while she acknowledged this in deep penitence, a beam of radiant light shot suddenly into the depths upon her, more powerful than the sunbeam that dissolves the man of snow which the children have raised, more quickly than the snowflake melts and becomes a drop of water on the warm lips of a child, 
was the stony form of Inga changed, and as a little bird she soared, with the speed of lightning upward to the world of mortals, a bird that felt timid and shy to all things around it that seemed to shrink with shame from meeting any living creature, and hurriedly sought to conceal itself in a dark corner of an old ruined wall. There it sat, cowering and unable to utter a sound, for it was voiceless. Yet how quickly the little bird discovered the beauty of everything around it, the sweet fresh air, the soft radiance of the moon as its light spread over the earth, the fragrance which exhaled from bush and tree made it feel happy as it sat there clothed in its fresh bright plumage. All creation seemed to speak of beneficence and love. The bird wanted to give utterance to thoughts that stirred in his breast, as the cuckoo and the nightingale in the spring, but it could not. Yet in heaven can be heard the song of praise even from a worm, and the notes trembling in the breast of the bird were as audible to heaven even as the psalms of David before they had fashioned themselves into words and song. Christmas time drew near, and a peasant who dwelt close by the old wall stuck up a pole with some ears of corn fastened to the top, that the birds of heaven might have feast and rejoice in the happy blessed time. And on Christmas morning the sun arose and shone upon the ears of corn, which were quickly surrounded by a number of twittering birds. Then from a hole in the wall gushed forth in song the swelling thoughts of the bird as he issued from his hiding place to perform his first good deed on earth. And in heaven it was well known who that bird was. The winter was very hard. The ponds were covered with ice, and there was very little food for either the beasts of the field or the birds of the air. Our little bird flew away into the public roads, and found here and there, in the ruts of the sledges and grain of corn, and at the halting places, some crumbs. Of these he ate only a few, but he called around him the other birds, and the hungry sparrows, that they too might have food. He flew into the towns and looked about, and wherever a kind hand had strewed bread on the window sill for the birds, he only ate a single crumb himself, and gave all the rest to the rest of the other birds. In the course of the winter the bird had in this way collected many crumbs and given them to other birds, till they equaled the weight of the loaf on which Inga had trod to keep her shoes clean. And when the last bread crumb had been found and given, the gray wings of the bird became white, and spread themselves out for flight. "'See yonder is a seagull!' cried the children when they saw the white bird, as it dived into the sea, and rose again into the clear sunlight, white and glittering. But no one could tell whither it went. Then, although some declared, it flew straight to the sun. End of The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf Section number 23 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. Anne Lisbeth by Hans Christian Andersen, 1859. Anne Lisbeth was a beautiful young woman, with a red and white complexion, glittering white teeth, and clear soft eyes, and her footstep was light in the dance, but her mind was lighter still. She had a little child, not at all pretty, so he was put out to be nursed by a labourer's wife, and his mother went to the Count's castle. She sat in splendid rooms, richly decorated with silk and velvet, not a breath of air allowed to blow upon her, and no one was allowed to speak to her harshly, for she was nurse to the Count's child. He was fair and delicate as a prince, and beautiful as an angel, and how she loved this child. Her own boy was provided for by being at the labourers, where the mouth watered more frequently than the pot boiled, and where in general no one was at home to take care of the child. Then he would cry, but what nobody knows nobody cares for, so he would cry till he was tired, and then fall asleep. And while we are asleep, we can feel neither hunger nor thirst. Ah, yes, sleep is a capital invention. As years went on, 
Anne Lesbeth's child grew apace like weeds. Although they said his growth had been stunted, he had become quite a member of the family in which he dwelt. They received money to keep him, so that his mother got rid of him altogether. She had become quite a lady. She had a comfortable home of her own, in the town, and out of doors, when she went for a walk, she wore a bonnet. But she never walked out to see the labourer. That was too far from the town, and indeed she had nothing to go for. The boy now belonged to those labouring people. He had food, and he could also do something towards earning his living. He took care of Mary's red cow, for he knew how to tend cattle and make himself useful. The great dog by the yard gate of a nobleman's mansion sits proudly on top of his kennel when the sun shines, and barks at every one that passes. But if it rains, he creeps into his house, and there he is warm and dry. Anne Lisbeth's boy also sat in the sunshine on top of the fence, cutting out a little toy. If it was springtime, he knew of three strawberry plants in blossom which would certainly bear fruit. This was his most hopeful thought, though it often came to nothing and he had to sit out in the rain in the worst weather and get wet to the skin and let the cold wind dry the clothes on his back afterwards. If he went near the farmyard belonging to the Count, he was pushed and knocked about, for the men and the maids said he was so horrible ugly. But he was used to all this, for nobody loved him. This was how the world treated Anne Lisbeth's boy, and how could it be otherwise? It was his faith to be loved by no one. Hitherto he had been a land crab. The land at last cast him adrift. He went to sea in a wretched vessel and sat at the helm while the skipper sat over the grog can. He was dirty and ugly, half frozen and half starved. He always looked as if he never had enough to eat, which was really the case. Late in the autumn, when the weather was rough, windy and wet, and the cold penetrated through the thickest clothing, especially at sea, a wretched boat went out to sea with only two men on board. Or, more correctly, a man and a half, for it was the skipper and his boy. There had only been a kind of twilight all day, and it soon grew quite dark, and so bitterly cold, that the skipper took a dram to warm him. The bottle was old, and the glass too. It was perfect in the upper part, but the foot was broken off, and it had therefore been fixed upon a little carved block of wood painted blue. A dram is a great comfort, and two are better still, thought the skipper, while the boy sat at the helm, which he held fast in his hard-seamed hands. He was ugly, and his hair was matted, and he looked crippled and stunted. They called him the field labourer's boy, though in the church register he was entered as Anne Lisbeth's son. The wind cut through the rigging, and the boat cut through the sea. The sails, filled by the wind, swelled out and carried them along in wild career. It was wet and rough above and below, and might still be worse. Hold! What is that? What has struck the boat? Was it a water spout, or a heavy sea rolling suddenly upon them? Heaven help us, cried the boy at the helm, as the boat heeled over and lay on its beam ends. It had struck upon a rock which rose from the depths of the sea, and sank at once, like an old shoe in a puddle. It sank at once, with mouse and man, as the sailing is. There might have been mice on board, but only one man and a half, the skipper and the labourer's boy. No one saw it but the skimming seagulls and the fishes beneath the water, and they, even they did not see it properly, for they darted back with terror as the boat filled with water and sank. There it lay, scarcely a fathom below the surface, and those two were provided for, buried and forgotten. The glass with the foot of blue wood was the only thing that did not sink, for the wood floated and the glass drifted away to be cast upon the shore and broken, where and when is indeed of no consequence. 
it had served its purpose, and it had been loved, which Anne Lisbeth's boy had not been. But in heaven, no soul will be able to say never loved. Anne Lisbeth had now lived in the town many years. She was called Madame, and felt dignified in consequence. She remembered the old noble days, in which she had driven in the carriage, and had associated with Countess and Baroness. Her beautiful noble child had been a dear angel, and possessed the kindest heart. He had loved her so much, and she had loved him in return. They had kissed and loved each other, and the boy had been her joy, her second life. Now he was fourteen years of age, tall, handsome, and clever. She had not seen him since she carried him in her arms. Neither had she been for years to the Count's palace. It was quite a journey thither from the town. "'I must make one effort to go,' said Anne Lisbeth, "'to see my darling, the Count's sweet child, and press him to my heart. "'Certainly he must long to see me, too, the young Count.' No doubt he thinks of me and loves me as in those days when he would fling his angel arms round my neck and lisp, Anne Liz. It was music to my ears. Yes, I must make an effort to see him again. She drove across the county in a grazer's cart and then got out and continued her journey on foot and thus reached the Count's castle. It was as great and magnificent as it had always been and the garden looked the same as ever. All the servants were strangers to her. Not one of them knew Anne Lisbeth, nor of what consequence she had once been there. But she felt sure the Countess would soon let them know it, and her darling boy too, how she longed to see him. Now that Anne Lisbeth was at her journey's end, she was kept waiting a long time, and for those who wait, time passes slowly. But before the great people went in to dinner, she was called in and spoken to very graciously. She was to go in again after dinner, and then she would see her sweet boy once more. How tall and slender and thin he had grown, but the eyes and the sweet angel mouth were still beautiful. He looked at her, but he did not speak. He certainly did not know who she was. He turned round and was going away, but she seized his hand and pressed it to her lips. "'Well, well,' he said. And with that he walked out of the room. He who filled her every thought, he whom she loved best and who was her whole earthly pride. Anne Lisbeth went forth from the castle into the public road, feeling mournful and sad. He whom she had nursed day and night, and even now carried about in her dreams, had been cold and strange, and had not a word or thought respecting her. A great black raven darted down in front of her on the high road, and croaked dismally. Ah, said she, what bird of ill omen art thou? Presently she passed the labourer's hut. His wife stood at the door and the two women spoke to each other. "'You look well,' said the woman. "'You are fat and plump. You are well off.' "'Oh, yes,' answered Anne Lisbeth. "'The boat went down with them,' continued the woman. "'Hans, the skipper, and the boy were both drowned. "'So there's an end of them. "'I always thought the boy would be able to help me with a few dollars. "'He'll never cost you anything more, Anne Lisbeth.' "'So they were drowned,' repeated Anne Lisbeth. "'But she said no more, and the subject was dropped. "'She felt very low-spirited, "'because her count-child had shown no inclination to speak to her "'who loved him so well, and who had travelled so far to see him. "'The journey had cost money, too, "'and she had derived no great pleasure from it. "'Still, she said not a word of all this.' She could not relieve her heart by telling the labourer's wife, lest the latter should think she did not enjoy her former position at the castle. Then the raven flew over her, screaming again as he flew. "'The black wretch!' said Anne Lisbeth. "'He will end by frightening me today.' She had brought coffee and chicory with her, 
for she thought it would be a charity to the poor woman to give them to her to boil a cup of coffee, and then she would take a cup herself. The woman prepared the coffee, and in the meantime Anne Lisbeth seated her in a chair and fell asleep. Then she dreamed of something which she had never dreamed before. Singularly enough, she dreamed of her own child, who had wept and hungered in the labourer's hut, and had been knocked about in heat and in cold, and who was now lying in the depths of the sea, in a spot only known by God. She fancied she was still sitting in the hut, where the woman was busy preparing the coffee, for she could smell the coffee berries roasting. But suddenly it seemed to her that there stood on the threshold a beautiful young form, as beautiful as the Count's child, and this apparition said to her, "'The world is passing away. Hold fast to me, for you are my mother after all. You have an angel in heaven. Hold me fast.' and the child angel stretched out his hand and seized her. Then there was a terrible crash, as of a world crumbling to pieces, and the angel child was rising from the earth and holding her by the sleeve so tightly that she felt herself lifted from the ground. But, on the other hand, something heavy clung to her feet and dragged her down, and it seemed as if hundreds of women were clinging to her and crying, "'If thou art to be saved, we must be saved too. "'Hold fast, hold fast!' "'And then they all hung on her, but there were too many, "'and as they clung the sleeve was torn, "'and Anne Lisbeth fell down in horror and awoke. "'Indeed, she was on the point of falling over in reality "'with the chair on which she, she sat, "'but she was so startled and alarmed "'that she could not remember what she had dreamt, "'only that it was something very dreadful.' They drank their coffee and had a chat together, and then Anne Lisbeth went away towards the little town where she was to meet the carrier who was to drive her back to her own home. But when she came to him, she found that he would not be ready to start until the evening of the next day. Then she began to think of the expense and what the distance would be to walk. She remembered that the route by the seashore was two miles shorter than by the high road. And as the weather was clear, and there would be moonlight, she determined to make her way on foot, and to start at once, that she might reach home the next day. The sun had set, and the evening bells sounded through the air from the tower of the village church, but to her it was not the bells, but the cry of the frogs in the marshes. Then they ceased, and all around became still, not a bird could be heard. They were all at rest. Even the owl had not left her hiding place. Deep silence reigned on the margin of the wood by the seashore. As Anne Lisbeth walked on, she could hear her own footsteps in the sands. Even the waves of the sea were at rest, and all in the deep waters had sunk into silence. There was quiet among the dead and the living in the deep sea. Anne Lisbeth walked on, thinking of nothing at all, as people say, or rather her thoughts wandered, but not away from her, for thought is never absent from us, it only slumbers. Many thoughts that have lain dormant are roused at the proper time, and begin to stir in the mind and the heart, and seem even to come upon us from above. It is written that a good deed bears a blessing for its fruit, and it is also written that the wages of sin is death. Much has been said and much written which we pass over or know nothing of. A light arises within us, and then forgotten things make themselves remembered, and thus it was with Anne Lisbeth. The germ of every vice and every virtue lies in our heart, in yours and in mine. They lie like little grains of seed, till a ray of sunshine, or the touch of an evil hand, or you turn the corner to the right or to the left, and the decision is made, the little seed is stirred, it swells and shoots up, and pours its sap into your blood, 
directing your course either for good or evil. Troublesome thoughts often exist in the mind, fermenting there, which are not realised by us, while the senses are, as it were, slumbering, but still they are there. Anne Lisbeth walked on thus with her senses half asleep, but the thoughts were fermenting within her. From one Shrove Tuesday to another, much may occur to weigh down the heart. It is the reckoning of a whole year. Much may be forgotten. Sins against heaven in word and thought, sins against our neighbour and against our own conscience. We are scarcely aware of their existence, and Anne Lisbeth did not think of any of her errors. She had committed no crime against the law of the land. She was an honourable person in a good position that she knew. She continued her walk along by the margin of the sea. What was it she saw lying there? An old hat, a man's hat. Now when might that have been washed overboard? She drew nearer. She stopped to look at the hat. Ha! What was lying yonder? She shuddered, yet it was nothing save a heap of grass and tangled seaweed flung across a long stone, but it looked like a corpse. Only tangled grass, and yet she was frightened at it. As she turned to walk away, much came into her mind that she had heard in her childhood. Old superstitions of spectres by the seashore, of the ghosts of drowned but unburied people, whose corpses had been washed up on the desolate beach. The body, she knew, could do no harm to anyone, but the spirit could pursue the lonely wanderer, attach itself to him and demand to be carried to the churchyard, where it might rest in consecrated ground. "'Hold fast! Hold fast!' the spectre would cry, and as Anne Lisbeth murmured these words to herself, the whole of her dream was suddenly recalled to her memory, when the mother had clung to her and uttered these words, when, amid the crashing of worlds, her sleeve had been torn, and she had slipped from the grasp of her child, who wanted to hold her up in that terrible hour. Her child, her own child, which she had never loved, lay now buried in the sea, and might rise up like a spectre from the waters, and cry, Hold fast, carry me to consecrated ground. As these thoughts passed through her mind, fear gave speed to her, her feet, so that she walked faster and faster, fear came upon her, as if a cold, clammy hand had been laid upon her heart, so that she almost fainted. As she looked across the sea, all there grew darker. A heavy mist came rolling onwards and clung to bush and tree, distorting them into fantastic shapes. She turned and glanced at the moon, which had risen behind her. It looked like a pale, rayless surface, and a deadly weight seemed to hang upon her limbs. Hold, thought she and then she turned round a second time to look at the moon. A white face appeared quite close to her, with a mist, hanging like a garment from its shoulders. Stop! Carry me to consecrated earth, sounded in her ears, in strange hollow tones. The sound did not come from frogs or ravens. She saw no sign of such creatures. A grave... Dig me a grave, was repeated, quite loud. Yes, it was indeed the spectre of her child, the child that lay beneath the ocean, and whose spirit could have no rest until it was carried to the churchyard, and until a grave had been dug for its inconsecrated ground. She would go there at once, and there she would dig. She turned in the direction of the church, and the weight on her heart seemed to grow lighter, and even to vanish altogether. But when she turned to go home by the shortest lay way, it returned. Stop! Stop! And the words came quite clear, though they were like the croak of a frog, or the wail of a bird. A grave! Dig me a grave! 
The mist was cold and damp. Her hands and face were moist and clammy with horror. A heavy weight again seized her and clung to her. Her mind became clear for thoughts that had never before been there. In these northern regions, a beechwood often buds in a single night and appears in the morning sunlight in its full glory of youthful green. So, in a single instant, can the consciousness of the sin that has been committed in thoughts, words and actions of our past life be unfolded to us. When once the conscious is awakened, it springs up in the heart spontaneously, and God awakens the conscience when we least expect it. Then we can find no excuse for ourselves. The deed is there and bears witness against us. The thoughts seem to become words and to sound far out into the world. We are horrified at the thought of what we have carried within us and at the consciousness that we cannot overcome the evil which has its origin in thoughtlessness and pride. The heart conceals within itself the vices as well as the virtues and they grow in the shallowest ground. Anne Lisbeth now experienced in thought what we have clothed in words. She was overpowered by them and sank down and crept along for some distance on the ground. A grave! Dig me a grave! sounded again in her ears and she would have gladly buried herself if in the grave she could have found forgetfulness of her actions. It was the first hour of her awakening, full of anguish and horror. Superstition made her alternately shudder with cold or burn with the heat of fever. Many things of which she had feared even to speak came into her mind, silently as the cloud shadows in the moonshine. A spectral apparition flitted by her. She had heard of it before. Close by her galloped four snorting steeds, with fire flashing from their eyes and nostrils. They dragged a burning coach, and within it sat the wicked lord of the manor, who had ruled here a hundred years before. The legend says that every night at twelve o'clock he drove into his castle yard and out again. He was not as pale as dead men are, but black as a coal. He nodded and pointed to Anne Lisbeth, crying out, Hold fast, hold fast, and then you may ride again in a nobleman's carriage and forget your child. She gathered herself up and hastened to the churchyard, but the black crosses and black ravens danced before her eyes, and she could not distinguish one from the other. The ravens croaked as the raven had done, which she had saw in the daytime, but now she understood what they said. I am the raven mother. I am the raven mother, each raven croaked, and Anne Lisbeth felt that the name also applied to her, and she fancied she should be transformed into a black bird and have to cry as they cried if she did not dig the grave, and she threw herself upon the earth, and with her hands dug a grave in the hard ground, so that the blood ran from her fingers. A grave! Dig me a grave! still sounded in her ears. She was fearful that the cock might crow, and the first red streak appear in the east before she had finished her work, and then she would be lost. And the cock crowed, and the day dawned in the east, and the grave was only half dug. An icy hand passed over her head and face and down towards her heart. Only half a grave, a voice wailed and fled away. Yes, it fled away over the sea. It was the ocean spectre and exhausted and overpowered, Anne Lisbeth sank, sank to the ground and her senses left her. It was a bright day when she came to herself and two men were raising her up but she was not lying in the churchyard, but on the seashore, where she had dug a deep hole in the sand and cut her hand with a piece of broken glass, whose sharp stern was stuck in a little blue block of painted wood. Anne Lisbeth was in a fever. 
conscience had roused the memories of superstitions and had so acted upon her mind that she fancied she had only half a soul and that her child had taken the other half down into the sea. Never would she be able to cling to the mercy of heaven till she had recovered this other half which was now held fast in the deep water. Anne Lisbeth returned to her home, but she was no longer the woman she had been. Her thoughts were like a confused, tangled skein. Only one thread, only one thought was clear to her, namely that she must carry the spectre of the seashore to the churchyard and dig a grave for him there, that by so doing she might win back her soul. Many a night she was missed from her home, and was always found on the seashore waiting for the spectre. In this way a whole year passed, and then one night she vanished again, and was not to be found. The whole of the next day was spent in a useless search after her. Towards evening, when the clerk entered the church to toll the vesper bell, he saw by the altar Anne Lisbeth, who had spent the whole day there, her powers of body were almost exhausted, but her eyes flashed brilliantly, and on her cheeks was a rosy flush. The last rays of the setting sun shone upon her, and gleamed over the altar upon the shining clasps of the Bible, which lay open at the words of the prophet Joel, "'Rend your hearts, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord.' That was just a chance, people said, but do things happen by chance? In the face of Anne Lesbeth, lighted up by the evening sun, could be seen peace and rest. She said she was happy now, for she had conquered. The spectre of the shore, her own child, had come to her the night before, and had said to her, Thou hast dug me only half a grave, but thou hast now for a year and a day buried me altogether in, their, in thy heart, and it is there a mother can best hide her child. And then he gave her back her lost soul, and brought her into the church. Now I am in the house of God, she said, and in that house we are happy. When the sun set, Anne Lisbeth's soul had ridden, risen again to that region where there is no more pain, and Anne Lisbeth's troubles were at an end. End of Anne Lisbeth Recording by Hannah in Cardiff, UK. Section 24 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zach Brewster Geis. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Ola the Tower Keeper In the world it's always going up and down, and now I can't go up any higher. So said Ola the Tower Keeper. Most people will have to try both the ups and the downs, and rightly considered we all get to be watchmen at last and look down upon life from a height. Such was the speech of Ola, my friend, the old tower-keeper, a strange talkative old fellow, who seemed to speak out everything that came into his head, and who for all that had many a serious thought deep in his heart. Yes, he was the child of respectable people, and there were even some who said that he was the son of a privy councillor, or that he might have been. He had studied, too, and had been assistant teacher and deputy clerk, but of what service was all that to him? In those days he lived in the clerk's house, and was to have everything in the house, to be at free quarters, as the saying is, but he was still, so to speak, a fine young gentleman. He wanted to have his boots cleaned with patent blacking, and the clerk could only afford ordinary grease, and upon that point they split. One spoke of stinginess, the other of vanity, and the blacking became the black cause of enmity between them, and at last they parted. This is what he demanded of the world in general, namely patent blacking, and he got nothing but grease. Accordingly he at last drew back from all men and became a hermit, but the church tower is the only place in a great city where hermitage, office, and bread can be found together. 
so he betook himself up thither and smoked his pipe as he made his solitary rounds. He looked upward and downward and had his own thoughts and told in his own way of what he read in his books and in himself. I often lend him books, good books, and you may know by the company he keeps. He loved neither the English governess novels nor the French ones, which he called a mixture of empty wind and raisin stalks. He wanted biographies and descriptions of the wonders of the world. I visited him at least once a year, generally directly after New Year's Day, and then he always spoke of this and that which the change of the year had put into his head. I will tell the story of three of these visits, and will reproduce his own words whenever I can remember them. First Visit Among the books which I had lately lent Ole was one which had greatly rejoiced and occupied him. It was a geological book containing an account of the boulders. "'Yes, they're rare old fellows, these boulders,' he said, "'and to think that we should pass them without noticing them. "'And over the street pavement, the paving stones, "'those fragments of the oldest remains of antiquity, "'one walks without ever thinking about them. "'I've done the very thing myself. "'But now I look respectfully at every paving stone. "'Many thanks for the book. "'It has filled me with thought "'and has made me long to read more on the subject.' The romance of the earth is, after all, the most wonderful of all romances. It's a pity one can't read the first volume of it because it is written in a language that we don't understand. One must read in the different strata, in the pebble stones for each separate period. Yes, it is a romance, a very wonderful romance, and we all have our place in it. We grope and ferret about and yet remain where we are, but the ball keeps turning without emptying the ocean over us. The clod on which we move about holds and does not let us through. And then it's a story that has been acting for thousands upon thousands of years and is still going on. My best thanks for the book about the boulders. Those are fellows indeed. They could tell us something worth hearing if they only knew how to talk. It's really a pleasure now and then to become a mere nothing, especially when a man is highly placed as... And then to think that we all, even with patent lacquer are nothing more than insects of a moment on that ant hill, the earth, though we may be insects with stars and garters, places and offices. One feels quite a novice beside these venerable million-year-old boulders. On last New Year's Eve I was reading the book and had lost myself in it so completely that I forgot my usual New Year's diversion, namely the wild hunt to Amwa. Ah, you don't know what that is. The journey of the witches on broomsticks is well enough known. That journey is taken on St. John's Eve to the Brocken. But we have a wild journey, also, which is national and modern, and that is the journey to Amah on the night of the new year. All indifferent poets and poetesses, musicians, newspaper writers, and artistic notabilities, I mean those who are no good, ride in the new year's night through the air to Amah. They sit backwards on their painting brushes or quill pens, for steel pens won't bear them. They're too stiff. As I told you, I see that every New Year's night, and could mention the majority of the writers by name, but I should not like to draw their enmity upon myself, for they don't like people to talk about their ride to Amman on quill pens. I have a kind of niece, who is a fishwife, and who, as she tells me, supplies three respectable newspapers with the terms of abuse and vituperation they use, and she has herself been out at Amma as an invited guest. But she was carried out thither, for she does not own a quill pen, nor can she ride. She has told me all about it. Half of what she said is not true, but the other half gives us information enough. When she was out there, the festivities began with a song. Each of the guests had written out his own song, and each one sang his own song, for he thought that the best, and it was all one, all the same melody. Then those came marching up in little bands who were only busy with their mouths. There were ringing bells that rang alternately, and then came the little drummers that beat their tattoo in the family circle, and acquaintance was made with those who write without putting their names, which here means as much as using grease instead of patent blacking. And then there was the beetle with his boy, and the boy was worst off, for in general he gets no notice taken of him. Then, too, there was the good street sweeper with his cart, who turns over the dustbin and calls it good, very good, remarkably good. 
and in the midst of the pleasure that was afforded by the mere meeting of these folks, there shot up out of the great dirt heap at a maw, a stem, a tree, an immense flower, a great mushroom, a perfect roof, which formed a sort of warehouse for the worthy company, for in it hung everything they had given to the world during the old year. Out of the tree poured sparks like flames of fire. These were the ideas and thoughts borrowed from others which they had used, and which now got free and rushed away like so many fireworks. They played at the stick burns, and the young poets played at heart burns, and the whittlings played off their jests, and the jests rolled away with a thundering sound, as if empty pots were being shattered against doors. It was very amusing, my niece said. In fact, she said many things that were very malicious, but very amusing, but I won't mention them, for a man must be good-natured and not a carping critic. But you will easily perceive that when a man once knows the rights of the journey to Amma, as I know them, it's quite natural that on the New Year's night one should look out to see the wild chase go by. If in the New Year I miss certain persons who used to be there, I am sure to notice others who are new arrivals. But this year I omitted taking my look at the guests. I bowled away on the boulders, rolled back through millions of years, and saw the stones break loose high up in the north, saw them drifting about on icebergs long before Noah's Ark was constructed, saw them sink down to the bottom of the sea and reappear with a sand bank, with one that peered forth from the flood and said, This shall be Zealand. I saw them become the dwelling place of birds that are unknown to us, and then become the seat of wild chiefs of whom we know nothing, until with their axes they cut their runic signs into a few of these stones, which then came into the calendar of time. But as for me, I had gone quite beyond all lapse of time, and had become a cipher and a nothing. Then three or four beautiful falling stars came down, which cleared the air, and gave my thoughts another direction. You know what a falling star is, do you not? The learned men are not at all clear about it. I have my own ideas about shooting stars, as the common people in many parts call them, and my idea is this. How often are silent thanksgivings offered up for one who has done a good and noble action? The thanks are often speechless, but they are not lost for all that. I think these thanks are caught up, and the sunbeams bring the silent hidden thankfulness over the head of the benefactor. And if it be a whole people that has been expressing its gratitude through a long lapse of time, the thankfulness appears as a nosegay of flowers, and at length falls in the form of a shooting star over the good man's grave. I am always very much pleased when I see a shooting star, especially in the New Year's night, and then find out for whom the gift of gratitude was intended. Lately a gleaming star fell in the southwest, as a tribute of thanksgiving to many, many, for whom was that star intended, thought I. It fell, no doubt, on the hill by the Bay of Flensburg, where the Dannebrog waves over the graves of Schleppegrel, Lejler, and their comrades. One star also fell in the midst of the land, fell upon Sora, a flower on the grave of Holberg. The thanks of the year from a great many, thanks for his charming plays. It is a great and pleasant thought to know that a shooting star falls upon our graves. On mine certainly none will fall. No sunbeam brings thanks to me, for there is nothing worthy of thanks. I shall not get the patent lacquer, said Ola, for my fate on earth is only Greece after all. Second Visit It was New Year's Day, and I went up on the tower. Ola spoke of the toasts that were drunk on the transition from the old year into the new, from one grave into the other, as he said. And he told me a story about the glasses, and this story had a very deep meaning. It was this. When on the New Year's night the clock strikes twelve, the people at the table rise up with full glasses in their hands and drain these glasses and drink success to the new year. They begin the year with the glass in their hands. That is a good beginning for drunkards. They begin the new year by going to bed, and that's a good beginning for drones. Sleep is sure to play a great part in the new year, and the glass likewise. Do you know what dwells in the glass? asked Ola. 
I will tell you. There dwell in the glass first health, and then pleasure, then the most complete sensual delight, and misfortune and the bitterest woe dwell in the glass also. Now, suppose we count the glasses. Of course, I count the different degrees in the glasses for different people. You see, the first glass, that's the glass of health, and in that the herb of health is found growing. Put it up on the beam in the ceiling, and at the end of the year you may be sitting in the arbor of health. If you take the second glass, from this a little bird soars upward, twittering in guileless cheerfulness, so that a man may listen to his song and perhaps join in Fair is life, no downcast looks, take courage and march onward. Out of the third glass rises a little winged urchin, who cannot certainly be called an angel child, for there is goblin blood in his veins, and he has the spirit of a goblin. Not wishing to hurt or harm you, indeed, but very ready to play off tricks upon you. He'll sit at your ear and whisper merry thoughts to you. He'll creep into your heart and warm you, so that you grow very merry, and become a wit, so far as the wits of the others can judge. In the fourth glass is neither herb, bird, nor urchin. In that glass is the pause drawn by reason, and one may never go beyond that sign. Take the fifth glass, and you will weep at yourself. You will feel such a deep emotion, or it will affect you in a different way. Out of the glass there will spring with a bang Prince Carnival, nine times and extravagantly merry. He'll draw you away with him. You'll forget your dignity, if you have any, and you'll forget more than you should or ought to forget. All is dance, song, and sound. The masks will carry you away with them, and the daughters of vanity clad in silk and satin will come with loose hair and alluring charms. But tear yourself away if you can. The sixth glass. Yes, in that glass sits a demon in the form of a little, well-dressed, attractive, and very fascinating man who thoroughly understands you, agrees with you in everything, and becomes quite a second self to you. He has a lantern with him to give you light as he accompanies you home. There is an old legend about a saint who was allowed to choose one of the seven deadly sins and who accordingly chose drunkenness, which appeared to him the least, but which led him to commit all the other six. The man's blood is mingled with that of the demon. It is the sixth glass, and with that the germ of all evil shoots up within us and each one grows up with a strength like that of the grains of mustard seed, and shoots up into a tree and spreads over the whole world. And most people have no choice but to go into the oven to be recast in a new form. That's the history of the glasses, said the tower keeper Ola, and it can be told with lacquer or only with grease, but I give it you with both. Third Visit on this occasion I chose the general moving day for my visit to Ola, for on that day it is anything but agreeable down in the streets in the town, for they are full of sweepings, shreds, and remnants of all sorts, to say nothing of the cast-off rubbish in which one has to wade about. But this time I happened to see two children playing in this wilderness of sweepings. They were playing at going to bed, for the occasion seemed especially favorable for this sport. They crept under the straw and drew an old bit of ragged curtain over themselves by way of coverlet. It was splendid, they said, but it was a little too strong for me, and besides I was obliged to mount up on my visit to Ola. It's moving day today, he said. Streets and houses are like a dustbin, a large dustbin, but I'm content with a cartload. I may get something good out of that, and I really did get something good out of it once. Shortly after Christmas I was going up the street. It was rough weather, wet and dirty, the right kind of weather to catch cold in. The dustman was there with his cart, which was full and looked like a sample of streets on moving day. At the back of the cart stood a fir tree, quite green still, and with tinsel on its twigs. It had been used on Christmas Eve, and now it was thrown out into the street, and the dustman had stood it up at the back of his cart. It was droll to look at, 
Or you may say it was mournful. All depends on what you think of when you see it. And I thought about it, and thought this and that of many things that were in the cart. Or I might have done so, and that comes to the same thing. There was an old lady's glove, too. I wonder what that was thinking of. Shall I tell you? The glove was lying there, pointing with its little finger at the tree. I'm sorry for the tree, it thought. And I was also at the feast, where the chandeliers glittered. My life was, so to speak, a ball night, a pressure of the hand, and I burst. My memory keeps dwelling upon that, and I have really nothing else to live for. This is what the glove thought, or what it might have thought. That's a stupid affair with yonder fir tree, said the pots herds. You see, pots herds think everything is stupid. When one is in the dust cart, they said, one ought not to give oneself airs and wear tinsel. I know that I have been useful in the world, far more useful than such a green stick. This was a view that might be taken, and I don't think it quite a peculiar one. But for all that, the fir tree looked very well. It was like a little poetry in the dust heap, and truly there is dust enough in the streets on moving day. The way is difficult and troublesome then, and I feel obliged to run away out of the confusion. Or if I am on the tower, I stay there and look down, and it is amusing enough. There are the good people below, playing at changing houses. They toil and tug away with their goods and chattels, and the household goblin sits in an old tub and moves with them. All the little griefs of the lodging and the family, and the real cares and sorrows move with them out of the old dwelling into the new, and what gain is there for them or for us in the whole affair? Yes, there was written long ago the good old maxim, Think on the great moving day of death. That is a serious thought. I hope it is not disagreeable to you that I should have touched upon it. Death is the most certain messenger, after all, in spite of his various occupations. Yes, death is the omnibus conductor, and he is the passport writer, and he countersigns our service book, and he is director of the savings bank of life. Do you understand me? All the deeds of our life, the great and the little alike, we put into this savings bank. And when death calls with his omnibus, and we have to step in and drive with him into the land of eternity, then on the frontier he gives us our service book as a pass. As a provision for the journey, he takes this or that good deed we have done and lets it accompany us. And this may be very pleasant or very terrific. Nobody has ever escaped the omnibus journey. There is certainly a talk about one who is not allowed to go. They call him the Wandering Jew. He has to ride behind the omnibus. If he had been allowed to get in, he would have escaped the clutches of the poets. Just cast your mind's eye into that great omnibus. The society is mixed, for king and beggar, genius and idiot sit side by side. They must go without their property and money. They have only the service book and the gift out of the savings bank with them. But which of our deeds is selected and given to us? Perhaps quite a little one, one that we have forgotten, but which has been recorded, small as a pea, but the pea can send out a blooming shoot. The poor bumpkin who sat on a low stool in the corner and was jeered at and flouted will perhaps have his worn-out stool given him as a provision. And the stool may become a litter in the land of eternity, and rise up then as a throne gleaming like gold and blooming as an arbor. He who always lounged about and drank the spiced draught of pleasure, that he might forget the wild things he had done here, will have his barrel given to him on the journey, and will have to drink from it as they go on. And the drink is bright and clear, so that the thoughts remain pure, and all good and noble feelings are awakened, and he sees and feels what in life he could not or would not see. And then he has within him the punishment, the gnawing worm, which will not die through time incalculable. If on the glasses there stood written oblivion, on the barrel remembrance is inscribed. When I read a good book, an historical work, 
I always think at last of the poetry of what I am reading, and of the omnibus of death, and wonder which of the hero's deeds death took out of the savings bank for him, and what provisions he got on the journey into eternity. There was once a French king, I have forgotten his name, for the names of good people are sometimes forgotten even by me, but it will come back some day. There was a king who, during a famine, became the benefactor of his people, and the people raised up to his memory a monument of snow with the inscription, Quicker than this melts didst thou bring help. I fancy that death, looking back upon the monument, gave him a single snowflake as provision, a snowflake that never melts, and this flake floated over his royal head like a white butterfly into the land of eternity. Thus, too, there was Louis the Eleventh. I have remembered his name, for one remembers what is bad. A trait of him often comes into my thoughts, and I wish one could say the story is not true. He had his Lord High Constable executed, and he could execute him right or wrong, but he had the innocent children of the constable, one seven and the other eight years old, placed under the scaffold, so that the warm blood of their father spurted over them, and then he had them sent to the Bastille and shut up in iron cages, where not even a coverlet was given them to protect them from the cold. And King Louis sent the executioner to them every week, and had a tooth pulled out of the head of each, that they might not be too comfortable. And the elder of the boys said, My mother would die of grief if she knew that my younger brother had to suffer so cruelly. Therefore pull out two of my teeth, and spare him. The tears came into the hangman's eyes, but the king's will was stronger than the tears. And every week two little teeth were brought to him on a silver plate. He had demanded them, and he had them. I fancy that death took these two teeth out of the savings bank of life and gave them to Louis XI to carry with him on the great journey into the land of immortality. They fly before him like two flames of fire. They shine and burn, and they bite him, the innocent children's teeth. Yes, that's a serious journey, the omnibus ride on the great moving day. And when is it to be undertaken? That's just the serious part of it. Any day, any hour, any minute the omnibus may draw up. Which of our deeds will death take out of the savings bank and give to us as provision? Let us think of the moving day that is not marked in the calendar. End of Ola the Tower Keeper